Section 1 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 17. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 17. Selected Excerpts by Horace Greeley. Horace Greeley, 1811-1872. By Clarence Clough Buell. Twenty five years after his death, Horace Greeley's name remains at the head of the role of American journalists. Successors in their primacy of current discussion may surpass him, as doubtless some of them already have, in consistency and learning, but hardly in the chief essentials of a journalistic style. Others may exert a more salutary influence, if not so personally diffused. But in the respect of high ideals, courage, intellectual force, and personal magnetism, the qualities which impel a man of letters to be also a man of action, Horace Greeley was of heroic mold. He was no pop-gun journalist firing from a sky sanctum, but a face-to-face -face champion in the arena of public affairs, laying about him with pen and speech like an ancient Bayard with his sword. The battles he fought for humanity and the blows he gave and received have made him for all time the epic figure of the American press. Born in rural New Hampshire of English and Scotch-Irish descent, he epitomized his heritage and his attainment in the dedication of his autobiography. To our American boys who, born in poverty, cradled in obscurity, and early called from school to rugged labor, are seeking to convert obstacle into opportunity and wrest achievement from difficulty. Though physically a weak child, his intellect was strong, and when near his tenth year his father removed to Vermont, the boy took with him the reputation of a mental prodigy. So, with little schooling and much reading, he was thought when fourteen to be a fit apprentice to a printer, setting forth four years later as a journeyman. His parents had moved to western Pennsylvania, and he followed, but after a desultory practice of his art he came to the metropolis on August 17, 1831, with $10 in his pocket, and so rustic in dress and manners as to fall under suspicion of being a runaway apprentice. Later in life, at least, his face and his figure would have lent distinction to the utmost elegance of style but his dress was so careless even after the long period of comparative poverty was passed that the peculiarity became one of his distinguishing features as a public character, and to the last there were friends of little discernment who thought this eccentricity was studied affectation. But manifestly his dress, like his unkempt handwriting, was the unconscious expression of a spirit so concentrated on the intellectual interests of its life as to be oblivious to mere appearances. After eighteen months of dubious success as a journeyman in the city, in his twenty-first year he joined a friend in setting up a modest printing office, which on March 22, 1834, issued the New Yorker, a literary weekly in the general style of Willis's Mirror, under the firm name of H. Greeley & Company. For four years the young printer showed his editorial aptitude to such good effect that in 1838 he was asked to conduct the Jeffersonian, a Whig campaign paper. This was so effective that in 1840 he was encouraged to edit and publish The Log Cabin, a weekly which gained a circulation of 80,000, brought him reputation as a political writer, and active participation in politics with the Whig leaders, Governor Seward and Thurlow Weed. It contributed much to the election of General Harrison, but very little to the purse of the ambitious editor. On April 10th of the following year, 1841, he issued the first number of the New York Tribune as a Whig daily of independent spirit. He was still editing the New Yorker and the Log Cabin, both of which were soon discontinued, the Weekly Tribune in a way taking their place. Though the New Yorker had brought him literary reputation, it had not been profitable because of uncollectible bills, which at the end amounted to $10,000. Thus, in 
Still, at the outset of the Tribune, he was able to account $2,000 to his credit in cash and material. He was then 30 years of age, and for 30 years thereafter, the paper grew steadily in circulation, influence, and profit, until a few weeks after his death, a sale of the majority interest indicated that the goodwill of the Tribune, aside from its material and real estate, was held to be worth about a million dollars. The Greeley interest was then small since he had parted with most of it to sustain his generous methods of giving and lending. He had great capacity for literary work and when absent for travel or business was a copious contributor to his paper. To his rather delicate fiscal habit was perhaps due his distaste for all stimulants, alcoholic or otherwise, and his adherence through life to the vegetarian doctrines of Dr. Graham. Another follower of the latter being his wife, Mary Young Cheney, also a writer, whom he married in 1836. His moderate advocacy of temperance in food and drink, coupled with his then unorthodox denial of eternal punishment, helped to identify him in the public mind with most of the isms of the time, including Fourierism and spiritualism, when in fact his mind and his paper were merely open to free inquiry and were active in exposing vagaries of opinion wherever manifested. Protection to American industry and abolitionism were the only varieties which he accepted without qualification, and while the pro-slavery party detested him as a dangerous agitator, it is possible at this day even from their point of view to admire the moderation the candor, and the general humanity of his treatment of the slavery question. In all issues concerning the practical affairs of life, like marriage and divorce, he was guided by rare common sense, and usually his arguments were scholarly and moderate. But in matters of personal controversy, he was distinctly human, uniting with a taste for the intellectual fray, a command of facts, and a force and pungency of presentation which never seem admirable than an opponent. He was in great demand as a lecturer and as a speaker at agricultural fairs, his addresses always being distinguished by a desire to be helpful to working humanity and by elevated motives. Though not a jester, genial humor and intellectual exchange were characteristic of his social intercourse. His books, with one or two exceptions, were collections of his addresses and newspaper articles. His first book, Hints Toward Reforms, appeared in 1850 and was followed by Glances at Europe, 1851, A History of the Struggle for Slavery Extension or Restriction, 1856, The Overland Journey to California, 1859, An Address on Success in Business, 1867, Recollections of a Busy Life, formed on a series of articles in the New York Ledger, 1869, Essays Designed to Elucidate the Science of Political Economy, 1870, Letters from Texas and the Lower Mississippi, and an Address to the Farmers of Texas, 1871, What I Know of Farming, 1871, and The American Conflict, written as a book, the first volume appearing in 1864 and the second in 1867. This work on the Civil War is remarkable when considered in the light of his purpose to show the inevitable sequence whereby ideas prove the germ of events. But it was hastily prepared and, while strikingly accurate in the large sense, will not bear scrutiny in some of the minor details of war history. Neither his political friends nor his party nor the causes he espoused could hold him to a course of partisan loyalty contrary to his own convictions of right and duty. As a member of the Seward Weed Greeley Triumvirate, he was often a thorn in the flesh of the senior members. His letter of November 11, 1854, dissolving the political firm, being one of the frankest documents in the history of American politics. During the Civil War, he occasionally embarrassed Mr. Lincoln's administration by what seemed then to be untimely cries of on to Richmond, immediate emancipation, and peace. On the whole, his influence for the Union cause was powerful, but when, the war being over, he advocated general amnesty, 
and finally as an object lesson when on the bail bond of Jefferson Davis, he lost the support of a large body of his most ardent anti-slavery admirers. The clamor against him called forth a characteristic defiance in his letter to members of the Union League Club who were seeking to discipline him. Having further alienated the Republican Party by his general attitude in Reconstruction matters, he became the logical candidate for the presidency in 1872 of the Democrats at Baltimore and the Liberal Republicans at Cincinnati in opposition to a second term for General Grant. Though personally he made a brilliant canvas, the influences at work in his favor were inharmonious and disintegrating, and the result was the most humiliating defeat. This he appeared to bear with mental buoyancy despite the affliction of his wife's death, which occurred a week before the election, he having left the stump in September to watch unremittingly at her bedside. On November 6th, the day after his defeat, he resumed the editorship of the Tribune, which six months before he had relinquished to Whitlaw Reed. Thereafter, he contributed to only four issues of the paper, for the strain of his domestic and political misfortunes had aggravated his tendency to insomnia. On the 12th, he was seriously ill, and on the 29th, he succumbed to inflammation of the brain. The last few months of his eventful career supplied most of the elements essential to a Greek tragedy. On December 23rd, the Tribune, having been reorganized with Mr. Reed in permanent control, there first appeared at the head of the editorial page a line, founded by Horace Greeley, as a memorial to the great journalist and reformer. A bronze statue has been erected in the portal of the new Tribune office, and another statue in the angle made by Broadway and 6th Avenue, appropriately named Greeley Square, after the man who was second to no other citizen in establishing the intellectual ascendancy of the metropolis. Clarence Clough Buell The United States Just After the Revolution From The American Conflict, reprinted by permission of O.D. Case & Company, Publishers, Hartford, Connecticut. The difficulties which surrounded the infancy and impeded the growth of the 13 original or Atlantic states were less formidable, but kindred and not less real. Our fathers emerged from their arduous, protracted, desolating, revolutionary struggle, rich indeed in hope, but poor in worldly goods. Their country had for seven years been traversed and wasted by contending armies, almost from end to end. Cities and villages had been laid in ashes. Habitations had been deserted and left to decay. Farms, stripped of their fences and deserted by their owners, had for years produced only weeds. Camp fevers, with the hardships and privations of war, had destroyed many more than the sword, and all alike had been subtracted from the most effective and valuable part of a population always, as yet quite inadequate. Cripples and invalids, melancholy mementos of the yet recent struggle, abounded in every village and township. Habits of industry had been unsettled and destroyed by the anxieties and uncertainties of war. The gold and silver of anti-revolutionary days had crossed the ocean in exchange for arms and munitions. The continental paper, which for a time more than supplied, in volume, its place, had become utterly worthless. In the absence of a tariff, which the Confederate Congress lacked power to impose, our ports, immediately after peace, were glutted with foreign luxuries. Gugas, which our people were eager enough to buy, but for which they soon found themselves utterly unable to pay. They were almost exclusively an agricultural people, and their products, save only tobacco and indigo, were not wandered by the old world, and found but a very restricted and inconsiderable market even in the West Indies, whose trade was closely monopolized by the nations to which they respectively belonged. Indian corn and potatoes, the two principal edibles for which the poor of the old world are largely indebted to America, were consumed to a very limited extent and not at all imported by the people of the Eastern Hemisphere. The wheat-producing capacity of our soil at first unsurpassed, 
was soon exhausted by the unskillful and thriftless cultivation of the 18th century. Though one-third of the labor of the country was probably devoted to the cutting of timber, the axe helve was but a pudding stick, while the plow was a rude structure of wood, clumsily pointed and shielded with iron. A thousand bushels of corn, maize, are now grown in our western prairies at a cost of fewer days' labor than were required for the production of a hundred in New York or New England eighty years ago. And though the settlements of that day were nearly all within a hundred miles of tidewater, the cost of transporting bulky staples, for even that distance, over the extra crabble roads that then existed, was about equal to the present charge for transportation from Illinois to New York. Industry was paralyzed by the absence or uncertainty of markets. Idleness tempted the dissipation of which the tumult and excitement of civil war had long been the school. Unquestionably, the moral condition of our people had sadly deteriorated through the course of the revolution. Intemperance had extended its ravages profanity and licentiousness had overspread the land. A coarse and scoffing infidelity had become fashionable, even in high quarters, and the letters of Washington and his compatriots bear testimony to the widespread prevalence of venality and corruption, even while the great issue of independence or subjugation was still undecided. The return of peace, though it arrested the calamities, the miseries, and the desolations of war, was far from ushering in that halcyon state of universal prosperity and happiness which had been fondly and sanguinely anticipated. Thousands were suddenly deprived by it of their accustomed employment and means of subsistence and were unable at once to replace them. Those accepted, though precarious avenues to fame and fortune in which they had found at least competence were instantly closed and no new one seemed to open before them. In the absence of aught that could with justice be termed a currency, trade and business were even more depressed than industry. Commerce and navigation, unfettered by legislative restriction, ought to have been, or ought soon to have become, more flourishing if the dicta of the world's accepted political economists had been sound. But the facts were deplorably at variance with their inculcations. Trade, emancipated from the vexatious trammels of the custom-house barker and gauger, fell tangled and prostrate in the toils of the usurer and the sheriff. The common people, writhing under the intolerable pressure of debt for which no means of payment existed, were continually prompting their legislators to authorize and direct those baseless issues of irredeemable paper money by which a temporary relief is achieved at the cost of more pervading and less curable disorders. In the year 1786, the legislature of New Hampshire, then sitting at Exeter, was surrounded, evidently by preconcert, by a gathering of angry and desperate men intent on overawing it into an authorization of such an issue. In 1786, the famous Shays Insurrection occurred in western Massachusetts, where in 1,500 men, stung to madness by the snow shower of writs to which they could not respond and executions which they had no means of satisfying, undertook to relieve themselves from intolerable infestation and save their families from being turned into the highways by dispersing the courts and arresting the enforcement of legal process altogether. That the seaboard cities, depending entirely on foreign commerce, neither manufacturing themselves nor having any other than foreign fabrics to dispose of, should participate in the general suffering and earnestly scan the political and social horizon in quest of sources and conditions of comprehensive and enduring relief was inevitable. And thus industrial paralysis, commercial embarrassment, and political disorder combined to overbear inveterate prejudice sectional jealousy and the ambition of local magnets in creating that more perfect union whereof the foundations were laid and pillars erected by Washington, Hamilton, Franklin, Madison, and their compeers in the convention which framed their federal constitution. Yet it would not be just to close this hasty and casual glance at our country under the old federation without noting some features which tend to relieve the darkness of the picture. 
The abundance and excellence of the timber, which still covered at least two-thirds of the area of the then states, enabled the common people to supply themselves with habitations which, however rude and uncomely, were more substantial and comfortable than those possessed by the masses of any other country on earth. The luxuriant and omnipresent forests were likewise the sources of cheap and ample supplies of fuel, whereby the severity of our northern winters was mitigated, and the warm, bright fireside of even the humblest family in the long winter evenings of our latitude rendered centers of cheer and enjoyment. Social intercourse was more general, less formal, more hardy, more valued than at present. Friendships were warmer and deeper. Relationship, by blood or by marriage, was more profoundly regarded. Men were not ashamed to own that they loved their cousins better than their other neighbors, and their neighbors better than the rest of mankind. To spend a month in the dead of winter in a visit to the dear old homestead, and in interchanges of affectionate greetings with brothers and sisters married and settled at distances of twenty to fifty miles apart, was not deemed an absolute waste of time, nor even an experiment in fraternal civility and hospitality. And though cultivation was far less effective than now, it must not be inferred that food was scanty or hunger predominant. The woods were alive with game, and nearly every boy and man between fifteen and sixty years of age was a hunter. The larger and smaller rivers, as yet unobstructed by the dams and wheels of the cotton spinner and power loom weaver, abounded in excellent fish, and at seasons fairly swarmed with them. The potato, usually planted in the vegetable mold left by recently exterminated forests, yielded its edible tubers with a bounteous profusion unknown to the husbandry of our day. Hills, the most granitic and apparently sterile, from which the wood was burned one season, would the next year produce any grain in ample measure and at a moderate cost of labor and care. Almost every farmer's house was a hive, wherein the great wheel and the little wheel the former kept in motion by the hands and feet of all the daughters, ten years old and upward, the latter plied by their not less industrious mother, hummed in word from morning till night. In the back room, or some convenient appendage, the loom responded day by day to the movements of the busy shuttle, whereby the fleeces of the farmer's flock and the flax of his field were slowly but steadily converted into substantial, though homely cloth, sufficient for the annual wear of the family, and often with something over to exchange at the neighboring merchants for his groceries and wares. A few bushels of corn, a few sheep, a fattened steer, with perhaps a few saw logs or loads of hoop poles made up the annual surplus of the husbandman's products, helping to square accounts with the blacksmith, the wheelwright, the minister, and the lawyer, if the farmer was so unfortunate as to have any dealings with the latter personage. His life during peace was passed in a narrower round than ours, and may well seem to us tame, limited, monotonous, but the sun which warmed him was identical with ours, the breezes which refreshed him were like those we gladly welcome, and while his roads to mill and to meeting were longer and rougher than those we daily traverse, he doubtless passed them unvexed by apprehensions of a snorting locomotive, at least as contented as we, and with small suspicion of his ill fortune in having been born in the 18th instead of the 19th century. The illusion that the times that were are better than those that are has probably pervaded all ages, yet a passionately earnest assertion, which many of us have heard from the lips of the old men of thirty to fifty years ago, that the days of their youth were sweeter and happier than those we have known, will doubtless justify us in believing that they were by no means intolerable. It is not too much to assume that the men by whose valor and virtue American independence was achieved, and who lived to enjoy for half a century thereafter the gratitude of their country and the honest pride of their children, saw wealth as fairly distributed and the labor of freemen as adequately rewarded as those of almost any other country or of any previous generation. Political Compromises and Political Log Rolling from the American Conflict, 
reprinted by permission of O.D. Case and Company, Publishers, Hartford, Connecticut. Political compromises, though they have been rendered unsavory by abuse, are a necessary incident of mixed or balanced governments, that is, of all but simple, unchecked despotisms. Wherever liberty exists, their diversities of judgment will be developed, and unless one will dominates over all others, a practical mean between widely differing convictions must sometimes be sought. If, for example, a legislature is composed of two distinct bodies or houses, and they differ, as they occasionally will, with regard to the propriety or the amount of an appropriation required for a certain purpose, and neither is disposed to give way, a partial concession on either hand is often the most feasible mode of practical adjustment. Where the object contemplated is novel or non-essential to the general efficiency of the public service, such as the construction of a new railroad, canal, or other public work, the repugnance of either house should suffice entirely to defeat or at least to postpone it, for neither branch has a right to exact from the other conformity with its views on a disputed point as the price of its own concurrence in measures essential to the existence of the government. The attempt, therefore, of the Senate of February-March, 1849, to dictate to the House, you shall consent to such an organization of the territories as we prescribe, or we will defeat the Civil Appropriation Bill, and thus derange, if not arrest, the most vital machinery of the government, was utterly unjustifiable. Yet this should not blind us to the fact that differences of opinion are at times developed on questions of decided moment, where the rights of each party are equal, and where an ultimate concurrence in one common line of action is essential. Without some deference to adverse convictions, no confederation of the insurgent colonies was attainable. No union of the states could have been effected. And where the executive is, by according him the veto, clothed with a limited power over the making of laws, it is inevitable that some deference to his views, his convictions, should be evinced by those who fashion and mature those laws. Under this aspect, compromise in government is sometimes indispensable and laudable. But what is known in state legislation as log rolling is quite another matter. A has a bill which he is intent on passing, but which has no intrinsic worth that commends it to his fellow members. But B, C, and D, and the residue of the alphabet, have each his little bill, not perhaps specially obnoxious or objectionable, but such as could not be passed on its naked merits. All alike must fail, unless carried by that reciprocity of support suggested by their common need and peril. An understanding is effected between their several backers, so that A votes for the bills of B, C, D, etc., as the indispensable means of securing the passage of his own darling. And thus a whole litter of bills become laws, whereof no single one was demanded by the public interest or could have passed without the aid of others as unworthy as itself. Such is substantially the process whereby our statute books are loaded with acts which subserve no end but to fill the pockets of the few at the expense of the rights or the interests of the many. End of section one, read by Bryce Cries. Section two of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 17. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 17. Selected Excerpts from the History of the English People by John Richard Green, 1837-1883, Part 1. Dean Stanley, on reading one of Green's first literary productions, said, I see you are in danger of becoming picturesque. Beware of it. I have suffered from it. Though Green was then at an age when advice from such a source might well have had some influence, his natural bent was even then too strong to be affected by the warning. 
Born in Oxford in 1837, he entered Jesus College, where he showed the same remarkable power of reconstructing the life of the past that marked his historical writings in after years, and where his preference for historical chronicles over the classics and his lack of verbal memory puzzled his tutor and prevented his winning a special distinction in the studies of his college course. On graduating in 1859, he entered the church, and in 1866 became vicar of Stepney in East London. Here, besides preaching and visiting, he was a leader in the movement for improving the condition of the East Side, and in the organization of an effective system of charitable relief, nearly the whole of his meager income being expended on his parish. He was obliged to make up the deficit by writing articles for the Saturday Review. These were mainly brief historical reviews and essays, but some were of a light character, dealing with social topics, hastily written, but incisive and original. Many of them had permanent value, and they were invented and published in a separate volume under the title of Stray Studies in England and Italy. After his... Short history of the English people had made him famous. His health was fast breaking under the strain of his parish work, and this, combined with the growing spirit of skepticism, induced him to withdraw from active clerical work and accept an appointment as librarian at Lambeth, where he was able to give much of his time to historical study. He had at first planned a treatise on the Angevin kings, but was urged by his friends to undertake something of wider scope and of more general interest. Accordingly, he set to work on a short history of the English people. The task before him was difficult. He wished to make a book that would entertain the general reader and at the same time be suggestive and instructive to the scholar and to compress it all within the limits of an outline, a term usually associated with those bare, crabbed summaries which are sometimes inflicted by teachers upon the young and defenseless, but are avoided by general reader and scholar alike. How far he succeeded appears from the fact that with the exception of Macaulay's work, no treatise on English history has ever met with such prompt and complete success among all classes of readers. The vivid, picturesque style made it exceedingly popular, while the originality of method and of interpretation won for it the praise of men like Freeman and Stubbs. As to its accuracy, there is some difference of opinion. When the book first came out, 1874, sharp reviewers caught the historian in many slips, usually of a kind not to affect his general conclusions, but serious enough to injure his reputation for accuracy. Most of these errors were corrected in later editions and are not to be found in the longer History of the English People Four Volumes, which contains the material of the earlier work in an expanded, but as something, in a less interesting form. His next work was in a field in which none could refuse him credit for original research, The Making of England, dealing with the early part of the Anglo-Saxon period and the conquest of England, which carried the narrative down to 1052, show extraordinary skill in handling the scanty historical materials of those times. He was at work on the conquest at the time of his death, which occurred in 1883. During the last years of his life, his illness had frequently interrupted his work, and but for the aid of his wife in historical research, as well as the mechanical labor of a man uensis, he would not have accomplished what he did. As it is, his friends regard his actual achievements as slight compared to what his talents promised had he lived. Still, these achievements entitle him to a high place among modern historians. In accuracy, he has many superiors, but in brilliancy of style and human sympathy, and above all, in the power to make the past present and real, he has few equals. Fiction, he once said, is history that didn't happen. 
His own books have the interest of novels without departing in essentials from the truth. Besides writing the works above mentioned, he issued a selection of Readings from English History, 1879, and wrote with his wife a short geography of the British Isles, 1881. The Battle of Hastings, from History of the English People. On the 14th of October, William led his men at dawn along the higher ground that leads from Hastings to the battlefield which Harold had chosen. From the mound of Tellum, the Normans saw the host of the English gathered thickly behind a rough trench and a stockade on the height of Selnac. Marshy ground covered their right, on the left, the most exposed part of the position, the Huskarls, or bodyguard, of Harold. Men in full armor and wielding huge axes were grouped round the golden dragon of Wessex and the standard of the king. The rest of the ground was covered by thick masses of half-armed rustics who had flocked at Harold's summons to the fight with the stranger. It was against the center of this formidable position that William arrayed his Norman knighthood, while the mercenary forces he had gathered in France and Brittany were ordered to attack its flanks. A general charge of the Norman foot opened the battle. In front rode the minstrel Telefair. Tossing his sword in the air and catching it again, while he chanted the song of Roland. He was the first of the host who struck a blow, and he was the first to fall. The charge broke vainly on the stout stockade, behind which the English warriors plied axe and javelin with fierce cries of Out! Out! And the repulse of the Norman footman was followed by a repulse of the Norman horse. Again and again the duke rallied and led them to the fatal stockade. All the fury of fight that glowed in the Norseman's blood, all the headlong valor that spurred him over the slopes of Valley Duns, mingled that day with the coolness of head, the dogged perseverance, the inexhaustible faculty of resource, which shone at Mortimer and Faraville. His Breton troops, entangled in the marshy ground on his left, broke in disorder, and as panic spread through the army, a cry arose that the duke was slain. William tore off his helmet. I live, he shouted, and by God's help I will conquer yet. Maddened by a fresh repulse, the duke spurred right at the standard. Unhorsed, his terrible mace struck down Gerth, the king's brother. Again dismounted, a blow from his hand hurled to the ground an unmannerly rider who would not lend him his steed. Amidst the roar and tumult of the battle, he turned the flight he had arrested into the means of victory. Broken as the stockade was by his desperate onset, the shield wall of the warriors behind it still held the Normans at bay, till William, by a feint of flight, drew a part of the English force from their post of vantage. Turning on his disorderly pursuers, the duke cut them to pieces, broke through the abandoned line, and made himself master of the central ground. Meanwhile, the French and Bretons made good their ascent on either flank. At three, the hill seemed won. At six, the fight still raged around the standard, where Harold's huskarls stood stubbornly at bay on a spot marked afterward by the high altar of Battle Abbey. An order from the duke at last brought his archers to the front. The arrow flight told heavily on the dense masses crowded around the king, and as the sun went down, a shaft pierced Harold's right eye. He fell between the royal ensigns, and the battle closed with a desperate melee over his corpse. The Rising of the Baronage Against King John From History of the English People the open resistance of the northern barons nerved the rest of their order to action. The great houses, who had cast away their older, feudal traditions for a more national policy, were drawn by the crisis into close union with the families which had sprung from the ministers and counselors of the two Henrys. To the first group belonged such men as Sayer de Quincy, the Earl of Winchester, Geoffrey of Mandeville, Earl of Essex, the Earl of Clare, Fulk Fitzwarren, William Mallet, 
the House of Fitzalan and Gant. Among the second group were Henry Bowen and Roger de God, the Earls of Hereford and Norfolk, the younger William Marshall and Robert de Vere, Robert Fitzwalter, who took the command of their united force, represented both parties equally, for he was sprung from the Norman house of Brion, while the justice care of Henry the Second, Richard de Lucy, had been his grandfather. Secretly and on the pretext of pilgrimage, these nobles met at St. Edmundsbury, resolute to bear no longer with John's delays. If he refused to restore their liberties, they swore to make war on him, till he confirmed them by charter under the king's seal, and they parted to raise forces with the purpose of presenting their demands at Christmas. John, knowing nothing of the coming storm, pursued his policy of winning over the church by granting it freedom of election, while he embittered still more the strife with his nobles by demanding scutage from the northern nobles who had refused to follow him to Putin. But the barons were now ready to act, and early in January in the memorable year of 1215, they appeared in arms to lay, as they had planned, their demands before the king. John was taken by surprise. He had asked for a truce till Easter tide and spent the interval in fevered efforts to avoid the blow. Again he offered freedom to the church and took vows as a crusader against whom war was a sacrilege while he called for a general oath of allegiance and fealty from the whole body of his subjects. But month after month only showed the king the uselessness of further resistance. Though Paldov was with him, his vassalage had as yet brought little fruit in the way of aid from Rome. The commissioners whom he sent to plead his cause at the shire courts brought back news that no man would help him against the charter that the barons claimed and his efforts to detach the clergy from the league of his opponents utterly failed. The nation was against the king. He was far, indeed, from being utterly deserted. His ministers still clung to him. But cling as such men might to John, they clung to him rather as mediators than adherents. Their sympathies went with the demands of the barons when the delay which had been granted was over and the nobles again gathered in arms at Brackley in Northamptonshire to lay their claims before the king. Nothing marks more strongly the absolutely despotic idea of his sovereignty, which John had formed, than the passionate surprise which breaks out in his reply. Why do they not ask for my kingdom, he cried. I will never grant such liberties as will make me a slave. The imperialist theories of the lawyers of his father's court had done their work. Held at bay by the practical sense of Henry, they had told on the more headstrong nature of his sons. Richard and John both held with Glanville that the will of the prince was the law of the land, and to fetter that will by the customs and franchises which were more embodied in the baron's claim seemed to John a monstrous usurpation of his rights but no imperialist theories had touched the minds of his people. The country rose as one man at his refusal. At the close of May, London threw open the gates to the forces of the barons. Now arrayed under Robert Fitzwalter as Marshal of the Army of God and Holy Church. Exeter and Lincoln followed the example of the capital. Promises of aid came from Scotland and Wales. The northern barons marched hastily under Eustace de Vesky to join their comrades in London. Even the nobles who had as yet clung to the king, but whose hopes of conciliation were blasted by his obstinacy, yielded at last to the summons of the army of God. Pandolf, indeed, and Archbishop Langton still remained with John, but they counseled as Earl Ranoff and William Marshall counseled, his acceptance of the charter. None, in fact, counseled its rejection, save his new justiciar, the Poit de Van Peter de Roche, and other foreigners who knew the barons' purpose driving them from the land. But even the number of these was small. There was a moment when John found himself with but seven knights at his back, and before him a nation in arms. Quick as he was, 
he had been taken utterly by surprise. It was in vain that in the short respite he had gained from Christmas to Easter, he had summoned mercenaries to his aid and appealed to his new suzerain, the Pope. Summons and appeal were alike too late. Nursing wrath in his heart, John bowed to necessity and called the barons to a conference on an island in the Thames, between Windsor and Staines, near a marshy meadow by the riverside, the meadow of Runny Mead. The king encamped on one bank of the river. The barons covered the flat of Runny Mead on the other. Their delegates met on the 15th of July on the island between them. But the negotiations were a mere cloak to cover John's purpose of unconditional submission. The Great Charter was discussed and agreed to in a single day. Copies of it were made and sent for preservation to the cathedrals and churches, and one copy may still be seen in the British Museum, injured by age and fire, but with the royal seal still hanging from the brown shriveled parchment. It is impossible to gaze without reverence on the earliest monument of English freedom, which we can see with our own eyes and touch with our own hands. The Great Charter, to which from age to age men have looked back as the groundwork of English liberty. But in itself the charter was no novelty, nor did it claim to establish any new constitutional principles. The charter of Henry I formed the basis of the whole, and the additions to it, for the most part, formal recognitions of the judicial and administrative changes introduced by Henry II. What was new in it was its origin, in form, like the charter on which it was based, it was nothing but a royal grant. In actual fact, it was a treaty between the whole English people and its king. In it, England found itself for the first time since the conquest, a nation bound together by common national interests, by a common national sympathy. In words which almost close the charter, the community of the whole land is recognized as the great body from which the restraining power of the baronage takes its validity. There is no distinction of blood or class, of Norman or not Norman, of noble or not noble. All are recognized as Englishmen. The rights of all are owned as English rights. Bishops and nobles claimed and secured at Runnymede the rights not of baron and churchman only, but those of freeholder and merchant, of townsman and villain. The provisions against wrong and extortion, which the barons drew up as against the king for themselves, they drew up as against themselves for their tenants. Based, too, as it is professed to be on Henry's charter, it was far from being a mere copy of what had gone before. The vague expressions of the old charter were now exchanged for precise and elaborate provisions. The bonds of unwritten custom, which the older grant did little more than recognize, had proved too weak to hold the Angevins, and the baronage set them aside for the restraints of written and defined law. It is in this way that the Great Charter marks the transition from the age of traditional rights, preserved in the nation's memory and officially declared by the primate, to the age of written legislation, of parliaments and statutes, which was to come. Its opening, indeed, is in general terms. The Church had shown its power of self-defense in the struggle of the interdict, and the clause, which recognized its rights alone, retained the older and general form. But all vagueness ceases when the Charter passes on to deal with the rights of Englishmen at large, their right to justice, to security of person and property, to good government. No freeman ran a memorable article that lies at the base of our whole judicial system shall be seized or imprisoned or dispossessed or outlawed or in any way brought to ruin. We will not go against any man nor send against him, save by legal judgment of his peers or by the law of the land. To no man will we sell, rents another, or deny, or delay, right or justice. The great reforms of the past reigns were now formally recognized. Judges of assize were to hold their circuits four times in the year, 
and the king's court was no longer to follow the king in his wanderings over the realm, but to sit in a fixed place. But the denial of justice under John was a small danger compared with the lawless exactions both of himself and his predecessor. Richard had increased the amount of the scutage, which Henry II had introduced, and applied it to raise funds for his ransom. He had restored the Danegeld, or land tax, so often abolished, under the new name of Curacage, had seized the wool of the Cistercians and the plate of the churches, and raided movables as well as land. John had again raised the rate of scutage, and imposed aids, fines, and ransoms at his pleasure, without counsel of the baronage. The Great Charter met this abuse by a provision on which our constitutional system rests. No scutage or aid, other than the three customary feudal aids, shall be imposed in our realm, save by the common council of the realm. And to this great council it was provided that prelates and the greater barons should be summoned by special writ, and all tenants in chief, through the sheriffs and bailiffs, at least forty days before. The provision defined what had probably been the common usage of the realm, but the definition turned it into a national right, a right so momentous that on it rests our whole parliamentary life. Even the baronage seemed to have been startled when they realized the extent of their claim, and the provision was dropped from the later issue of the charter at the outset of the next reign. But the clause brought home to the nation at large their possession of a right which became dearer as years went by. More and more clearly, the nation discovered that in these simple words lay the secret of political power. It was the right of self-taxation that England fought for under Earl Simon as she fought for it under Hamden. It was the establishment of this right which established English freedom. End of section two. Section 3 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 17. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 17. Selected Excerpts from the History of the English People by John Richard Green. Part 2. England's Growth in Commerce and Comfort Under Elizabeth From History of the English People A middle class of wealthier landowners and merchants was fast rising in importance. The wealth of the meaner sort, wrote one to Cecil, is the very fount of rebellion, the occasion of their indolence, of the contempt of the nobility, and of the hatred they have conceived against them. But Cecil and his mistress could watch the upgrowth of national wealth with cooler eyes. In the country, its effect was to undo much of the evil which the diminution of small holdings had done, whatever social embarrassment it might bring about. The revolution in agriculture which Latimer deplored undoubtedly favored production. Not only was a larger capital brought to bear upon the land, but the mere change in the system of cultivation introduced a taste for new and better modes of farming. The breed of horses and of cattle was improved, and a far greater use made of manure and dressings. One acre under the new system produced, it was said, as much as two under the old. As a more careful and constant cultivation was introduced, a greater number of hands came to be required on every farm and much of the surplus labor which had been flung off the land in the commencement of the new system was thus recalled to it. And yet more efficient agency in absorbing the unemployed was found in the development of manufactures. The linen trade was as yet of small value, and that of silk weaving was only just introduced. But the woolen manufacture was fast becoming an important element in the national wealth. England no longer sent her fleeces to be woven in Flanders and to be dyed at Florence. The spinning of yarn, the weaving, fulling, and dyeing of cloth were spreading rapidly from the towns over the countryside. 
The Worcester trade, of which Norwich was the center, extended over the whole of the eastern counties. Farmers' wives began everywhere to spin their wool from their own sheep's backs into a coarse homespun. The south and west, however, still remained the great seats of industry and of wealth, for they were the homes of mining and manufacturing activity. The iron manufacturers were limited to Kent and Sussex, though their prosperity in this quarter was already threatened by the growing scarcity of the wood which fed their furnaces, and by the exhaustion of the forests of the Weald. Cornwall was then, as now, the sole exporter of tin, and the exportation of its copper was just beginning. The broadcloths of the West claimed the palm among the woolen stuffs of England. The sink ports held almost a monopoly of the commerce of the Channel. Every little harbor from the foreland to the land's end sent out its fleets of fishing boats, manned with bold seamen who were to furnish crews for Drake and the buccaneers. Northern England still lagged far behind the rest of the realm in its industrial activity. But in the reign of Elizabeth, the poverty and inaction to which it had been doomed for so many centuries began at last to be broken. We see the first sign of the revolution which has transferred English manufactures and English wealth to the north of the Mersey and of the Humber. In the mention which now meets us of the friezes of Manchester, the coverlets of York, the cutlery of Sheffield, and the cloth trade of Halifax. Elizabeth lent a ready patronage to the new commerce. She shared in its speculations. She considered its extension and protection as part of public policy, and she sanctioned the formation of the great merchant companies which could alone secure the trader against wrong or injustice in distant countries. The Merchant Adventurers of London, a body which had existed long before and had received a charter of incorporation under Henry the Seventh, furnished a model for the Russia Company and the company which absorbed the new commerce to the Indies. But it was not wholly with satisfaction that either the Queen or her ministers watched the social change which wealth was producing around them. They feared the increased expenditure and comfort which necessarily followed it, as likely to impoverish the land and to eat out the hardihood of the people. England spendeth more on wines in one year, complained Cecil, than it did in ancient times in four years. In the upper classes, the lavishness of a new wealth combined with the lavishness of life, a love of beauty, of color, of display, to revolutionize English dress. Men wore a manor on their backs. The Queen's three thousand robes were rivaled in their bravery by the slashed velvets, the ruffs, the jeweled purpoints of the courtiers around her. But signs of the growing wealth were as evident in the lower class as in the higher. The disuse of salt fish and the greater consumption of meat marked the improvement which had taken place among the country folk. Their rough and wattled farmhouses were being superseded by dwellings of brick and stone. Pewter was replacing the wooden trenchers of the early yeomanry, and there were yeomen who could boast of a fair show of silver plate. It is from this period, indeed, that we can first date the rise of a conception which seems to us now a peculiarly English one, the conception of domestic comfort, the chimney corner, so closely associated with family life, came into existence with the general introduction of chimneys, a feature rare in ordinary houses at the beginning of this reign. Pillows, which had before been despised by the farmer and the trader as fit only for women in childbed, were now in general use. Carpets superseded the filthy flooring of rushes. The loftier houses of the wealthier merchants their parapeted fronts and costly wainscoting, their cumbrous but elaborate beds, their carved staircases, their quaintly figured gables, not only contrasted with the squalor which had till then characterized English towns, but marked the rise of a new middle class which was to play its part in later history. A transformation of an even more striking kind marked the extinction of the feudal character of the noblesse, 
gloomy walls and serried battlements disappeared from the dwellings of the gentry. The strength of the medieval fortress gave way to the pomp and grace of the Elizabethan Hall. Knoll, Longfleet, Burley, and Hatfield, Hardwick, and Audley End are familiar instances of a social as well as an architectural change, which covered England with buildings where the thought of defense was abandoned, but that of domestic comfort and refinement. We still gaze with pleasure on their picturesque line of gables, their fretted fronts, their gilded turrets and fanciful veins, their castellated gateways, the jutting orioles from which the great noble looked down on his new Italian garden, on its stately terraces and broad flights of steps, its vases and fountains, its quaint mazes, its formal walks, its lines of views cut into grotesque shapes in hopeless rivalry at the cypress avenues of the south. Nor was the change less within than without. The life of the Middle Ages concentrated itself in the vast castle hall, where the baron looked from his upper dais on the retainers who gathered at his board. But the great households were fast breaking up, and the whole feudal economy disappeared when the lord of the household withdrew with his family into his parlor, or withdrawing room, and left the hall to his dependents. The Italian refinement of life which told on Pleasance and Garden told on the remodeling of the house within, raised the principal apartments to an upper floor, a change to which we owe the grand staircases of the time, surrounded the quiet courts by long galleries of the presence, crowned in rude hearth with huge chimney pieces adorned with fawns and cupids, with quaintly interlaced monograms and fantastic arabesques hung tapestries on the walls, and crowded each chamber with quaintly carved chairs and costly cabinets. The prodigal use of glass became a marked feature in the domestic architecture of the time, and one whose influence on the general health of the people can hardly be overrated. Long lines of windows stretched over the fronts of the new manor halls. Every merchant's house had its oriel. You shall have sometimes, Lord Bacon grumbled, your house is so full of glass that we cannot tell where to come to be out of the sun or the cold. What Elizabeth contributed to this upgrowth of national prosperity was the peace and social order from which it sprang. While auto de fe were blazing at Rome and Madrid, while the Inquisition was driving the sober traders of the Netherlands to madness, while Scotland was tossing with religious strife, while the policy of Catherine secured for France but a brief respite from the horrors of civil war. England remained untroubled and at peace. Religious order was little disturbed. Recusants were few. There was little cry as yet for freedom of worship. Freedom of conscience was the right of every man. Persecution had ceased. It was only as the tale of a darker past that men recalled how, ten years back, Heretics had been sent to the fire. Civil order was even more profound than religious order. The failure of the Northern Revolt proved the political tranquility of the country. The social troubles from vagrancy and evictions were slowly passing away. Taxation was light. The country was firmly and steadily governed. The popular favor which had met Elizabeth at her accession was growing into a passionate devotion. Of her faults, indeed, England, beyond the circle of her court, knew little or nothing. The shiftings of her diplomacy were never seen outside the royal closet. The nation at large could only judge her foreign policy by its main outlines, by its temperance and good sense, and above all, by its success. But every Englishman was able to judge Elizabeth in her rule at home, in her love of peace, her instinct of order the firmness and moderation of her government, the judicious spirit of conciliation and compromise among warring factions, which gave the country an unexampled tranquility at a time when almost every other country in Europe was torn with civil war. Every sign of the growing prosperity, the sight of London as it became the mart of the world, of stately mansions as they rose on every manor, told and justly told, in the Queen's favor. 
Her statue in the center of the London Exchange was a tribute on the part of the merchant class to the interest with which she watched and shared personally in its enterprises. Her thrift won a general gratitude. The memories of the terror and of the martyrs threw into bright relief the aversion from bloodshed, which was conspicuous in her earlier reign, and never wholly wanting through its fears of glows. Above all, there was a general confidence in her instinctive knowledge of the national temper. Her finger was always on the public pulse. She knew exactly when she could resist the feeling of her people, and when she must give way before the new sentiment of freedom, which her policy unconsciously fostered. But when she retreated, her defeat had all the grace of victory, and the frankness and unreserve of her surrender won back at once the love that her resistance lost. Her attitude at home, in fact, was that of a woman whose pride in the well-being of her subjects and whose longing for their favor was the one warm touch in the coldness of her natural temper. If Elizabeth could be said to love anything, she loved England. Nothing, she said to her first parliament, in words of unwanted fire, nothing, no worldly thing under the sun is so dear to me as the love and goodwill of my subjects, and the love and goodwill which was so dear to her, she fully won. William Pitt, from History of the English People Out of the union of these two strangely contrasted leaders, in fact, rose the greatest, as it was the last, of the purely Whig administrations. But its real power lay from beginning to end in Pitt himself. Poor as he was, for his income was little more than two hundred a year, and springing as he did from a family of no political importance, it was by sheer dint of genius that the young cornet of horse, at whose youth and inexperience Walpole had sneered, seized a power which the Whig houses had ever since the Revolution kept in their grasp. The real significance of his entry into the ministry was that the national opinion entered with him, he had no strength save from his popularity, but this popularity showed that the political torpor of the nation was passing away, and that a new interest in public affairs, and a resolve to have weight in them, was becoming felt in the nation at large. It was by the same instinct of a great people that this interest and resolve gathered themselves round William Pitt. If he was ambitious, his ambition had no petty aim. I want to call England, he said, as he took office, out of that enervate state in which 20,000 men from France can shake her. His call was soon answered. He at once breathed his own lofty spirit into the country he served, as he communicated something of his own grandeur to the men who served him. No man, said a soldier of the time, ever entered Mr. Pitt's closet, who did not feel himself braver when he came out, than when he went in. Ill combined as were his earlier expeditions, and many as were his failures, he roused a temper in the nation at large, which made ultimate defeat impossible. England has been a long time in labor, exclaimed Frederick of Prussia, as he recognized a greatness like his own. But she has at last brought forth a man. It is this personal and solitary grandeur, which strikes us most as we look back to William Pitt. The tone of his speech and action stands out in utter contrast with the tone of his time. In the midst of a society critical, polite, indifferent, simple even to the affectation of simplicity, witty and amusing but absolutely prosaic, cool of heart and of head, skeptical of virtue and enthusiasm, skeptical above all of itself, Pitt stood absolutely alone. The depth of his conviction, his passionate love for all that he deemed lofty and true, his fiery energy, his poetic imaginativeness, his theatrical airs and rhetoric, his haughty self-assumption, his pompousness and extravagance were not more puzzling to his contemporaries than the confidence with which he appealed to the higher sentiments of mankind the scorn with which he turned from a corruption which had till then been the great engine of politics, the undoubting faith which he felt in himself 
in the grandeur of his aims and in his power to carry them out. I know that I can save the country, he said to the Duke of Devonshire, on his entry into the ministry, and I know no other man can. The groundwork of Pitt's character was an intense and passionate pride, but it was a pride which kept him from stooping to the level of the men who had so long held England in their hands. He was the first statesman since the Restoration who set the example of a purely public spirit. Keen as was his love of power, no man ever refused office so often or accepted it with so strict a regard to the principles he professed. I will not go to court, he replied to an offer which was made him, if I may not bring the Constitution with me. For the corruption about him he had nothing but disdain. He left to Newcastle the buying of seats and the purchase of members. At the outset of his career, Pelham appointed him to the most lucrative office in his administration, that of paymaster of the forces. But its profits were of an illicit kind, and poor as he was, Pitt refused to accept one farthing beyond his salary. His pride never appeared in loftier and nobler form than in his attitudes toward the people at large. No leader had ever a wider popularity than the great commoner, as Pitt was styled. But his air was always that of a man who commands popularity, not that of one who seeks it. He never bent to flatter popular prejudice. When mobs were roaring themselves hoarse for Wilkes and liberty, he denounced Wilkes as a worthless profligate. And when all England went mad in its hatred of the Scots, Pitt haughtily declared his esteem for a people whose courage he had been the first to enlist on the side of loyalty. His noble figure, the hawk-like eye, which flashed from the small thin face, his majestic voice, the fire and grandeur of his eloquence, gave him a sway over the House of Commons far greater than any other minister has possessed. He could silence an opponent with a look of scorn, or hush the whole house with a single word. But he never stooped to the arts by which men form a political party, and at the height of his power, his personal following hardly numbered half a dozen members. His real strength, indeed, lay not in Parliament, but in the people at large. His title of the Great Commoner, marks a political revolution. It is the people who have sent me here, Pitt boasted with a haughty pride when the nobles of the cabinet opposed his will. He was the first to see that the long political inactivity of the public mind had ceased and that the progress of commerce and industry had produced a great middle class which no longer found its representatives in the legislature. You have taught me, said George the Second, when Pitt sought to save Bing by appealing to the sentiment of Parliament, to look for the voice of my people in other places than within the House of Commons. It was this unrepresented class which had forced him into power. During his struggle with Newcastle, the greater towns backed him with the gift of their freedom and addresses of confidence. For weeks, laughs Horace Walpole, it rained gold boxes. London stood by him through good report and evil report, and the wealthiest of English merchants, Alderman Beckford, was proud to figure as his political lieutenant. The temper of Pitt indeed harmonized admirably with the temper of the commercial England which rallied round him, with its energy, its self-confidence, its pride, its patriotism, its honesty, its moral earnestness. The merchant and the trader, were drawn by a natural attraction to the one statesman of their time whose aims were unselfish, whose hands were clean, whose life was pure and full of tender affection for wife and child. But there was a far deeper ground for their enthusiastic reverence, and for the reverence with his country has borne Pitt ever since. He loved England with an intense and personal love. He believed in her power, her glory, her public virtue, till England learned to believe in herself. Her triumphs were his triumphs, her defeats his defeats. Her dangers lifted him high above all thought of self or party spirit. Be one people, he cried to the factions who rose to bring about his fall. Forget everything but the public. I set you the example. 
His glowing patriotism was the real spell by which he held England, but even the faults which checkered his character told for him with the middle classes. The Whig statesmen who preceded him had been men whose pride expressed itself in a marked simplicity and absence of pretense. Pitt was essentially an actor, dramatic in the cabinet, in the house, in his very office. He transacted business with his clerks in full dress. His letters to his family, genuine as his love for them was, are stilted and unnatural in tone. It was easy for the wits of his day to jest his affectation, his pompous gait, the dramatic appearance which he made on great debates with his limbs swathed in flannel and his crutch by his side. Early in life, Walpole sneered at him for bringing into the House of Commons the gestures and emotions of the stage. But the classes to whom Pitt appealed were classes not easily offended by faults of taste and saw nothing to laugh at in the statesman who was born into the lobby amidst the torches of the gout or carried into the House of Lords to breathe his last in a protest against national dishonor. Above all, Pitt wielded the strength of resistless eloquence. The power of political speech had been revealed in the stormy debates of the long parliament, but it was cramped in its utterance by the legal and theological pedantry of the time. Pedantry was flung off by the age of the revolution, but in the eloquence of Summers and his rivals we see ability rather than genius. Knowledge, clearness of expression, precision of thought, the lucidity of the pleader or the man of business, rather than the passion of the orator. Of this clearness of statement, Pitt had little or none. He was no ready debater like Walpole. No speaker of set speeches like Chesterfield. His set speeches were always his worst, for in these his want of taste, his love of effect, his trite quotations and extravagant metaphors came at once to the front, that with defects like these he stood far above every orator of his time, was due above all to his profound conviction, to the earnestness and sincerity with which he spoke. I must sit still, he whispered once to a friend, for when once I am up, everything that is in my mind comes out. But the reality of his eloquence was transfigured by a large and poetic imagination, an imagination so strong that, as he said himself, most things returned to him with stronger force the second time than the first, and by a glow of passion, which not only raised him high above the men of his own day, but set him in the front rank among the orators of the world. The cool reasoning, the wit, the common sense of his age, made way for a splendid audacity, a sympathy with popular emotion, a sustained grandeur, a lofty vehemence, a command over the whole range of human feeling. He passed without an effort from the most solemn appeal to the gayest raillery, from the keenest sarcasm to the tenderest pathos. Every word was driven home by the grand self-consciousness of the speaker. He spoke always as one having authority. He was, in fact, the first English orator whose words were a power, a power not over Parliament only, but over the nation at large. Parliamentary reporting was as yet unknown, and it was only in detached phrases and half-remembered outbursts that the voice of Pitt reached beyond the walls of St. Stephen's. But it was especially in these sudden outbursts of inspiration, in these brief passionate appeals, that the might of his eloquence lay. The few broken words we have of him stirred the same thrill in men of our day which they stirred in the men of his own. Attempt on the five members, preparations for war. From History of the English People. The brawls of the two parties who gave each other the nicknames of Roundheads and Cavaliers created fresh alarm in the Parliament but Charles persisted in refusing it a guard. On the honor of a king, he engaged to defend them from violence as completely as his own children. But the answer had hardly been given when his attorney appeared at the bar of the Lords and accused Hampden, Pin, Hollis, Strode, and Hasselrig of high treason in their correspondence with the Scots. A herald at arms appeared at the bar of the Commons, 
and demanded the surrender of the five members. If Charles believed himself to be within legal forms, the Commons saw a mere act of arbitrary violence in a charge which proceeded personally from the King, which set aside the most cherished privileges of Parliament and summoned the accused before a tribunal which had no pretense to a jurisdiction over them. The Commons simply promised to take the demand into consideration and again requested a guard. I will reply tomorrow, said the king. On the morrow, he summoned the gentlemen who clustered round Whitehall to follow him, and embracing the queen, promised her that an hour he would return master of his kingdom. A mob of cavaliers joined him as they left the palace, and remained in Westminster Hall as Charles, accompanied by his nephew, the elector Palatine, entered the House of Commons. Mr. Speaker, he said, I must for a time borrow your chair. He paused with a sudden confusion as his eye fell on the vacant spot where Pym commonly sat. For, at the news of his approach, the House had ordered the five members to withdraw. Gentlemen, he began in a slow, broken sentence, I am sorry for this occasion of coming unto you. Yesterday I sent a sergeant at arms upon a very important occasion to apprehend some that by my command were accused of high treason, whereunto I did expect obedience and not a message. Treason, he went on, had no privilege, and therefore I am come to know if any of these persons that were accused are here. There was a dead silence, only broken by his reiterated, I must have them wheresoever. I find them. He again paused, but the stillness was unbroken. Then he called out, Is Mr. Pym here? There was no answer, and Charles, turning to the speaker, asked him whether the five members were there. Lenthal fell on his knees. I have neither eyes to see, he replied, nor tongue to speak in this place, but as this house is pleased to direct me. Well, well, Charles angrily retorted, "'Tis no matter. I think my eyes are as good as another's." There was another long pause while he looked carefully over the ranks of members. "'I see,' he said at last, "'all the birds are flown. I do expect you will send them to me as soon as they return hither.' If they did not, he added, he would seek them himself, and with the closing protest that he never intended any force, he went out of the house, says an eyewitness, in a more discontented and angry passion than he came in. Nothing but the absence of the five members and the calm dignity of the commons had prevented the king's outrage from ending in bloodshed. Five hundred gentlemen of the best blood in England would hardly have stood tamely by while the bravos of Whitehall laid hands on their leaders in the midst of the parliament. The five members had taken refuge in the city, and it was there that on the next day the king himself demanded their surrender from the aldermen at Guildhall. Cries of privilege rang round him as he returned through the streets. The writs issued for the arrest of the five were disregarded by the sheriffs, and a proclamation issued four days later declaring them traitors passed without notice. Terror drove the cavaliers from Whitehall and Charles stood absolutely alone, for the outrage had severed him for the moment from his new friends in the Parliament and from the ministers, Falkland and Culpepper, whom he had chosen among them. But lonely as he was, Charles had resolved on war. The Earl of Newcastle was dispatched to muster a royal force in the north, and on the 10th of January, news that the five members were about to return in triumph to Westminster drove Charles from Whitehall. He retired to Hampton Court and to Windsor, while the trained bands of London and Southwark on foot and the London watermen on the river all sworn to guard the Parliament, the Kingdom, and the King, escorted Pym and his fellow members along the Thames to the House of Commons. Both sides prepared for the coming struggle. The Queen sailed from Dover with the crown jewels to buy munitions of war. The cavaliers again gathered round the king, and the royalist press flooded the country with state's papers, drawn up by Hyde. On the other hand, the commons resolved by vote to secure the great arsenals of the kingdom, Hull, Portsmouth, and the Tower, 
while mounted processions of freeholders from Buckinghamshire and Kent traversed London on their way to St. Stephen's, vowing to live and die with the Parliament. The great point, however, was to secure armed support from the nation at large, and here both sides were in a difficulty. Previous to the innovations introduced by the Tudors, and which had been already questioned by the Commons in a debate on pressing soldiers, the King and himself had no power of calling on his subjects generally to bear arms, save for purposes of restoring order and meeting foreign invasion. On the other hand, no one contended that such a power had ever been exercised by the two houses without the king, and Charles steadily refused to consent to a militia bill in which the command of the national force was given in every county to men devoted to the parliamentary cause. Both parties, therefore, broke through constitutional precedent. The parliament, in appointing the Lord Lieutenants who commanded the militia by ordinance of the two houses, Charles and levying forces by royal commissions of array. The king's great difficulty lay in procuring arms, and on the 23rd of April he suddenly appeared before Hall, the magazine of the North, and demanded admission. The new governor, Sir John Hotham, fell on his knees but refused to open the gates, and the avowal of his act by the Parliament was followed by the withdrawal of the Royalist Party among its members from their seats at Westminster. The two houses gained in unity and vigor by the withdrawal of the Royalists. The militia was rapidly enrolled. Lord Warwick named to the command of the fleet, and alone opened in the city, to which the women brought even their wedding rings. The tone of the two houses had risen with the threat of force, and their last proposals demanded the powers of appointing and dismissing the royal ministers, naming guardians for the royal children, and of virtually controlling military, civil, and religious affairs. If I granted your demands, replied Charles, I should be no more than the mere phantom of a king. End of section 3《ซ t i o n 4 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 17. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in May 2023. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 17. Section 4. The Scope of the Novelist by Thomas Hill Green Thomas Hill Green, 1836-1882 One of the most interesting phases of thought in the second half of the 19th century is that known as the Neo-Hegelian movement in England. Certain English students of the deeper problems of life, dissatisfied with the prevailing philosophies in their own country, turned to Germany for light, and believed that they found it in the philosophy of Kant, as modified and supplemented by Hegel. Among the leaders of the movement were J. W. Sterling, the brothers John and Edward Caird, and William Wallace, all of whom have helped to make Hegel's doctrine known to English and American students. But the most prominent and influential of the group was the subject of this sketch, Thomas Hill Green. Green was born in Birkin, Yorkshire, on the 7th of April, 1836, and was the youngest of four children. His mother died in his infancy, and the children were left to be cared for and educated by their father. In 1850, when he was 14, Thomas went to Rugby, where he did not shine as a scholar, being uninterested in his studies and lagging behind his class. In 1855, he entered Balliol College, Oxford, and came fortunately under the teaching of Benjamin Jowett, who succeeded in rousing his latent energies. He became interested in history and philosophy, and in 1860 was elected a Fellow of Balliol, beginning his career as a teacher by lecturing on ancient and modern history. Two years later he gained the Chancellor's Prize for an essay on The Value and Influence of Works of Fiction. 
In 1864, he lectured before the Edinburgh Philosophical Institution on The English Commonwealth, a favorite subject which he treated with much ability. The course of his philosophic studies is not known, nor at what time he became acquainted with Hegel's work, which were destined to have so great an influence on his opinions and life. But after lecturing for a short time on history, he began to teach philosophy, which he had come to recognize as the true field of his life work. For a time, indeed, he had hesitated in the choice of a profession. Changes in his religious views prevented him from following his father's example and entering the ministry, and notwithstanding his interest in public affairs, he seems to have had no inclination toward journalism. But in teaching philosophy, he found a congenial occupation, which made him pecuniarily independent. For many years, however, his position at Oxford was that of a tutor only, and it was not until 1878 that his abilities received adequate recognition in his appointment as White's Professor of Moral Philosophy. In 1871 he had married Charlotte Simons, daughter of Dr. Simons of Clifton and sister of John Addington Simons, one of Green's oldest friends. Whether she was interested in his philosophical work or not, she shared his sympathy with the poor and devoted herself largely to their cause. Only seven years of married life, however, were granted to Green, and only four years in his profession, for on March 26, 1882, after a brief illness, he died. His biographer, Mr. Nettleship, gives many interesting reminiscences of this fine thinker. Ordinarily very undemonstrative, he was capable of strong affection, and whenever he broke through his reserve was a delightful companion. He had a true love for social equality and a high sense of the dignity of simple human nature, and he hoped, he said, for a condition of English society in which all honest citizens would recognize themselves and be recognized by each other as gentlemen. We hold fast, he wrote, to the faith that the cultivation of the masses, which has for the present superseded the development of the individual, will in its maturity produce some higher type even of individual manhood than any which the old world has known. With such sentiments he was naturally a radical in politics, and so far as his professional duties permitted, he took an active part in political discussion. He declared his political aim to be the removal of all obstructions which the law can remove to the free development of English citizens. He was a warm friend of the American Union during the Civil War and a sympathizer with liberal movements throughout the world. He was pledged also to the advancement of popular education and labored especially, like Matthew Arnold, for the better education of the middle classes. Taking him all in all, he stands for the most noble and thoughtful type of modern citizens, devoted to the pursuit of truth and to the highest interests of his fellow man. Of Green's writings, only a small portion were published during his lifetime, the most important being perhaps the two introductory essays prepared for the complete edition of Hume, edited by himself and T. H. Gross in 1874. His principal ethical work, the Prolegomena to Ethics, appeared in 1883 under the editorship of his friend A. C. Bradley, and all his writings except the Prolegomena were issued a few years later in three volumes, edited with a memoir by R. L. Nettleship. In literary form, his essays display his most finished work, his philosophical papers being often obscure from overcrowding of the thought. The main outlines of his ideas and the leading principles of his philosophy are, however, unmistakable. Philosophy was to him, says Mr. Nettleship, the medium in which the theoretic impulse, the impulse to see and feel things more clearly and intensely than everyday life allows, found its most congenial satisfaction. The strength, the repose, the mental purgation which come to some men through artistic imagination or religious emotion came to him through thinking. From Kant, Green took his theory of knowledge, according to which substance and cause, 
and all the relations that subsist between things are mental creations, while the material world, which to most men appears so substantial, has no real existence. From Hegel he took the doctrine of pantheism, which formed the metaphysical basis of his ethics and his religion. According to this view, our minds are only manifestations of God, or, as he otherwise expresses it, the divine spirit reproduces itself in the human spirit, while the material world exists only for thought. In ethics also he was indebted to Hegel, holding with him that the ultimate end of moral action is the self-realization or self-perfection of the individual, a theory not easily reconcilable with Green's political views, nor with his ardent interest in social reforms. The best expression of his doctrines is found in the Prolegomena to Ethics, his ablest constructive work, which, though mainly devoted to the discussion of ethical subjects, contains several chapters on the metaphysical questions with which ethics is so closely connected. His ethical instructions are the most valuable, not only in the Prolegomena, but in certain of the essays and in the Lectures on the Principles of Political Obligation. If he impresses the impartial critic as an able and earnest inquirer, whose system of philosophy is incomplete, yet the world has reason to be grateful to so honest and brave a thinker, for Green's writings must long remain suggestive and stimulating in a high degree. The Scope of the Novelist From the essay on the Value and Influence of Works of Fiction the novelist not only works on more various elements, he appeals to more ordinary minds than the poet. This indeed is the strongest practical proof of his essential inferiority as an artist. All who are capable of an interest in incidents of life which do not affect themselves may feel the same interest more keenly in a novel, but to those only who can lift the curtain does a poem speak intelligibly. It is the twofold characteristic of universal intelligibility and indiscriminate adoption of materials that gives the novel its place as the great reformer and leveller of our time. Reforming and levelling are indeed more closely allied than we are commonly disposed to admit. Social abuses are nearly always the result of defective organisation. The demarcations of family, of territory or of class prevent the proper fusion of parts into the whole. The work of the reformer progresses as the social force is brought to bear more and more fully on classes and individuals, merging distinctions of privilege and position in the one social organism. The novel is one of the main agencies through which this force acts. It gathers up manifold experiences, corresponding to manifold situations of life, and, subordinating each to the whole, gives to every particular situation a new character as qualified by all the rest. Every good novel, therefore, does something to check what may be called the despotism of situations, to prevent that ossification into prejudices arising from situation to which all feel a tendency. The general novel literature of any age may be regarded as an assertion by mankind at large in its then development, of its claims as against the influence of class and position, whether that influence appear in the form of positive social injustice, of oppressive custom, or simply of deficient sympathy. To be what he is, the novelist must be a man with large powers of sympathetic observation, he must have an eye for the humanities which underlie the estranging barriers of social demarcation, and in relation to which the influence of those barriers can alone be rightly appreciated. We have already spoken of that acquiescence in the dominion of circumstance to which we are all too ready to give way, and which exclusive novel reading tends to foster. The circumstances, however, whose rule we recognize, are apt to be merely our own or those of our class. We are blind to other idola than those of our own cave. We do not understand that the feelings which betray us into indiscretions may, when differently modified by a different situation, lead others to game-stealing or trade outrages. 
from this narrowness of view the novelist may do much to deliver us the variations of feeling and action with those of circumstance and the essential human identity which these variations cannot touch are his special province he shows us that crime does not always imply sin that a social heresy may be the assertion of a native right that an offence which leads to conventional outlawry may be nearly the rebellion of a generous nature against conventional tyranny thus if he does not do everything he does much though he cannot reveal to us the inner side of life he at least gives a more adequate conception of its surface though he cannot raise us to a point of view from which circumstances appear subordinate to spiritual laws he yet saves us from being blinded if not from being influenced by the circumstances of our own position though we cannot show the prisoners the way of escape from their earthly confinement yet by breaking down the partitions between the cells he enables them to combine their strength for a better arrangement of the prison house the most wounding social wrongs more often arise from ignorance than from malice from acquiescence in the opinion of a class rather than from deliberate selfishness the master cannot enter into the feelings of a servant nor the servant into those of his master the master cannot understand how any good quality can lead one to forget his station to the servant the spirit of management in the master seems mere driving this is only a sample of what is going on all society over the relation between the higher and lower classes becomes irritating and therefore injurious not from any conscious unfairness on either side but simply from the want of a common understanding while at the same time every class suffers within its own limits from the prevalence of habits and ideas under the authority of class convention which could not long maintain themselves if once placed in the light of general opinion against this twofold oppression the novel from its first establishment as a substantive branch of literature has made vigorous war from defoe to kingsley its history boasts of a noble army of social reformers yet the work which these writers have achieved has had little to do with the morals commonly valueless if not false and sentimental which they have severally believed themselves to convey defoe's notion of a moral seems to have been the vulgar one that vice must be palpably punished and virtue rewarded he recommends his small flanders to the reader on the ground that there is not a wicked action in any part of it but is first or last rendered unhappy or unfortunate the moral of fielding's novels if moral it can be called is simply the importance of that prudence which his heroes might have dispensed with but for the wildness of their animal license yet both defoe and fielding had a real lesson to teach mankind the thieves and harlots whom defoe prides himself on punishing but whose adventures he describes with the minuteness of affection are what we ourselves might have been and in their histories we hear if not the music yet the harsh and grating cry of suffering humanity fielding's merit is of the same kind but the sympathies which he excites are more general as his scenes are more varied than those of defoe his coarseness is everywhere redeemed by a genuine feeling for the contumelious buffets to which weakness is exposed he has the practical insight of dickens and thackeray without their infusion of sentiment he does not moralize over the contrast between the rich man's law and the poor man's over the indifference of rural justice over the lying and adultery of fashionable life he simply makes us see the facts which are everywhere under our eyes but too close to us for discernment he shows society where its sores lie appealing from the judgment of the diseased class itself to that public intelligence which in spite of the cynic's sneer on the task of producing an honesty from the combined action of knaves has really power to override private selfishness the same sermon has found many preachers since the unconscious missionaries being perhaps the greatest scott was a tory of the purest water his mind was busy with the revival of a pseudo feudalism no thought of reforming abuses probably ever entered it 
yet his genial human insight made him a reformer against his will he who makes man better known to man takes the first steps towards healing the wounds which man inflicts on man the permanent value of scott's novels lies in his pictures of the scotch peasantry he popularized the work which the lake poets had begun of reopening the primary springs of human passion love he had found in huts where poor men lie and he announced the discovery teaching the world of english gentry what for a century and a half they had seemed to forget that the human soul in its strength no less than in its weakness is independent of the accessories of fortune he left no equals but the combined force of his successors has been constantly growing in practical effect they have probably done more than the journalists to produce that improvement in the organization of modern life which leads to the notion that because social grievances are less obvious they have ceased to exist the novelist catches the cry of suffering before it has obtained the strength or general recognition which are presupposed when the newspaper becomes its mouthpiece the miseries of the marriage market had been told by thackeray which almost wearisome iteration many years before they found utterance in the columns of the times it may indeed be truly said that after all human selfishness is much the same as it ever was that luxury still drowns sympathy that riches and poverty have still their old estranging influence the novel as has been shown cannot give a new birth to the spirit or initiate the effort to transcend the separations of place and circumstance but it is no small thing that it should remove the barriers of ignorance and antipathy which would otherwise render the effort unavailing it at least brings man nearer to his neighbour and enables each class to see itself as others see it and from the fusion of opinions and sympathies thus produced a general sentiment is elicited to which oppression of any kind whether of one class by another or of individuals by the tyranny of sectarian custom seldom appeals in vain the novelist is a leveller also in another sense than that of which we have already spoken he helps to level intellects as well as situations he supplies a kind of literary food which the weakest natures can assimilate as well as the strongest and by the consumption of which the former sort lose much of their weakness and the latter much of their strength while minds of the lower order acquire from novel reading a cultivation which they previously lacked the higher seem proportionally to sink they lose that aspiring pride which arises from the sense of walking in intellect on the necks of a subject crowd they no longer feel the bracing influence of living solely among the highest forms of art they become conformed insensibly to the general opinion which the new literature of the people creates a similar change is going on in every department of man's activity the history of thought in its artistic form is parallel to its history in its other manifestation the spirit descends that it may rise again it penetrates more and more widely into matter that it may make the world more completely its own political life seems no longer attractive now that political ideas and power are disseminated among the mass and the reason is recognized as belonging not to a ruling class merely but to all a statesman in a political society resting on a substratum of slavery and admitting no limits to the province of government was a very different person from the modern servant of a nation of shopkeepers whose best work is to save the pockets of the poor it would seem as if man lost his nobleness when he ceased to govern and as if the equal rule of all was equivalent to that rule of none yet we hold fast to the faith that the cultivation of the masses which has for the present superseded the development of the individual will in its maturity produce some higher type even of individual manhood than any which the old world has known we may rest on the same faith in tracing the history of literature in the novel we must admit that the creative faculty has taken a lower form than it held in the epic and the tragedy but since in this form it acts on more extensive material and reaches more men 
we may well believe that this temporary declension is preparatory to some higher development when the poet shall idealize life without making abstraction of any of its elements and when the secret of existence which he now speaks to the inward ear of a few may be proclaimed on the housetops to the common intelligence of mankind end of section four Section 5 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 17. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 17. Robert Greene, 1560 to 1592. Green was a true Elizabethan Englishman, impulsive, reckless, with a roving instinct that in many a life of that restless age found a safe fen in adventure on the sea. But with his gifts and failings, and the conditions in which his life was cast, the ruin that overwhelmed him was the fate of many poets of great mind and weak will. Yet with all his sin and weakness there were struggles toward a better life and nobler work which should make our judgment lenient, remembering Burns' lines, What's done we partly may compute, but know not what's resisted. Green was born about 1560 in Norwich and belonged to a family of good standing. That his father was a man of some wealth may be inferred from Green's tour to Italy and other countries, a great expense in those days which he made after taking his B.A. degree at Cambridge in 1578. In his repentances, he shows that he was affected by the vices of Italy and became fixed in those dissolute habits which were his ruin. On his return, he was engaged in literary work at Cambridge and took his M.A. degree from both universities. He then went to London and became an author of plays and penner of love pamphlets, so that I soon grew famous in that quality, that who for that trade grown so ordinary about London as Robin Green. In 1585 he married, and apparently lived for a time in Norwich. After the birth of a child, he deserted his wife, because she tried to persuade him from his bad habits. From that time he lived permanently in London, where he seems to have had some influential patrons. Among those to whom his works are dedicated, we find the names of Lord Derby, the Earl of Cumberland, Lady Talbot, and Lord Fitzwater. He tells us that, in short space, I fell into favor with such as were of honorable and good calling. Yet his restless temper made such society irksome to him, and as there was no reputable literary bohemia, such as arose later under Shakespeare and Ben Jonson, he sank to the company of the lowest classes of London. In spite of his dissipated life, he was constantly at work, and his purse, like the sea, sometimes swelled, and on like the same sea fell to a low ebb, yet seldom he wanted, his labors were so well esteemed. Not only did he write for the stage, but it is probable that he appeared at times as an actor. At one time, when a gust of repentance swept over him, he resolved to write no more love pamphlets and to devote himself to more serious writings. He then published a series of tracts exposing the tricks of London swindlers in Trust that those my discourses will do great good and be very beneficial to the commonwealth of England. His repentances were intended to warn young men by the unhappy example of his own life. His career was cut short in 1592 by an illness resulting from too much indulgence in Rhenish wine and pickled herrings. Deserted by his friends, he died in extreme poverty at the house of a poor shoemaker who had befriended him. Just before his death, he wrote to his forsaken wife this touching letter. Sweet wife, as ever there was any good will or friendship between thee and me, see this bearer, my host, satisfied of his death. I owe him ten pound, and but for him I had perished in the streets. Forget and forgive my wrongs done unto thee, and Almighty God have mercy on my soul. Farewell till we meet in heaven, for on earth thou shalt never see me more. This 2 of September, 1592, 
written by thy dying husband, Robert Green. Gabriel Harvey soon after published in his four letters a virulent attack on Green's character. That and Green's confessions, in which, like many another, he no doubt exaggerated his sins, have given rise to a probably too harsh estimate of the poet's failings. Of his numerous dramatic works, but five have survived, all published after his death. Orlando Furioso, Friar Bacon and Friar Bungay, James the Fourth, Alphonsus, King of Aragon, and Georgia Green, the Pinner of Wakefield. A Looking Glass for London and England was a joint work of Thomas Lodge and Green. Green did for the romantic drama what Marlowe accomplished for tragedy, and his works form a noteworthy step in the development of the old English drama. His most popular drama was Fire Bacon and Fire Bungay, in which he pictures old English life at Fussingfield with a touching love story. His Georgia Green has the best constructed plot of any of his plays, and in The Pinner, a popular English hero like Robin Hood, he portrays an ideal English yeoman, faithful, sturdy, and independent. Nash called Green the Homer of women, and it is remarkable that, desolate as he was, he has given the charm of modest womanhood to all his female characters. Besides Green's non-dramatic works, there are four kinds. First, the romantic pamphlets. Second, the semi-patriotic tracts. Third, the coney-catching pamphlets. Fourth, his repentances. In his love pamphlets may be found traces of the beginnings of the English novel. Several of the repentances, the Never Too Late and A Groat's Worth of Wit, are largely autobiographical. Scattered through his romances are the many charming lyrics on which his fame mainly rests. In several respects, Green was exceptionally in advance of his time. In The Pinner, he plainly acknowledges popular rights, and in The Looking Glass, is found a forecast of coming disaster resulting from the disorders of the times and the oppression of the poor. Green's peasants are portrayed with a sympathetic realism most unusual at that time. He gives the wise humor of the low-born clown, as does none but Shakespeare, who was no doubt indebted to Green for the material of several of his plays. The Winter's Tale is founded on Pandosto, in all points but Antigonus, Paulina, Autolysis, and the Young Shepherd. Lear has a strong likeness to the Looking Glass. Orlando points to Lear and Hamlet and the fairy framework of James IV suggests some features of Midsummer Night's Dream. Green and the university men of his set drew from the old chroniclers for their dramas, but Shakespeare took whatever was at hand. His ignoring of their rule and his growing fame were the probable cause of the bitter feeling Green shows in the address to his fellow dramatists in The Groatsworth of Wit, when he refers to Shakespeare as an upstart crow beautified with our feathers that with his tiger's heart wrapped in a player's hide supposes he is as well able to bombast out a blank verse as the best of you and being an absolute Johannes Factotum is in his own conceit the only shake scene in the country. Alexander Dice edited Green's plays and poems in 1831. Dr. Grossert edited the complete works of Robert Green, 1881 to 6, in 15 volumes, and A.W. Ward published Fire Bacon in Old English Drama, 1892. Both earlier editions contain memoirs, and accounts are found in J.A. Simmons. Shakespeare's Predecessors in English Drama, and Jusron's English Novel in the Time of Shakespeare. Green's writings give vivid pictures of life in the Elizabethan age, and at the same time form a most interesting autobiography of that wrecked life. Unlike Herrick, who could say that if his verse were impure, his life was chaste, Green's writings show scarcely any of the uncleanness so prevalent in books of that period. Deceiving World from a Groat's Worth of Wit Deceiving world that with alluring toys hast made my life the subject of thy scorn, and scornest now to lend thy fading joys to outlength my life whom friends have left forlorn. How well are they that die ere they be born, 
and never see thy slights, which few men shun, till unawares they helpless are undone. Oft have I sung of love and of his fire, but now I find that poet was advised, which made full feasts increasers of desire, and proves weak love was with the poor despised. For when the life with food is not sufficed, what thoughts of love, what motion of delight, what pleasance can proceed from such a wight? Witness my want, the murder of my wit, my ravished sense of wanted fury reft, want such conceit as should in poems fit, set down the sorrow wherein I am left, but therefore have high heavens their gifts bereft, because so long they lent them me to use, and I so long their bounty did abuse. O oh, that a year were granted me to live, and for that year my former wits restored, what rules of life, what counsel would I give? How should my sin with sorrow be deplored? But I must die, of every man abhorred. Time loosely spent will not again be won. My time is loosely spent, and I undone. The Shepherd's Wife Song From the Morning Garment Ah, what is love? It is a pretty thing, as sweet unto a shepherd as a king. And sweeter, too, for kings have cares that wait upon a crown, and cares can make the sweetest love to frown. Ah, then, ah, then, if country loves such sweet desires do gain, what lady would not love a shepherd's swain? His flocks are folded, he comes home at night, as merry as a king in his delight, and merrier, too, for kings bethink them what the state require, were shepherds careless, carol by the fire. Ah, then, ah, then, if country loves such sweet desires do gain, what lady would not love a shepherd's swain? He kisseth first, then sits as blithe to eat his cream and curds, as doth the king his meat. And blither too, for kings have often fears when they do sup, where shepherds dread no poison in their cup. Ah, then, ah, then, if country loves such sweet desires do gain, what lady would not love a shepherd's swain? Upon his couch of straw he sleeps as sound as doth the king upon his beds of down. More sounder, too, for cares cause kings full off their sleep to spill, where weary shepherds lie and snort their fill. Ah, then, ah, then, if country loves such sweet desires do gain, what lady would not love a shepherd swain? Thus with his wife he spends the year, as blithe as doth the king at every tide or sith. And blither too, for kings have wars and broils to take in hand, when shepherds laugh and love upon the land. Ah then, ah then, if country loves such sweet desires do gain, what lady would not love a shepherd swain? Down the Valley from never too late. Down the valley gan his track, bag and bottle at his back, in a surcoat all of gray, such were palmers on the way, when with scrip and staff they see Jesus' grave on cavalry. A hat of straw, like a swain, shelter for the sun and rain, with a scallop shell before, sandals on his feet he wore, legs were bare, arms unclad, such attire this palmer had, his face fair like titan's shine, gray and buxom were his eyne, where out dropped pearls of sorrow, such sweet tears love doth borrow. When in outward dews she plains, heart's distress that lover's pains, ruby lips, cherry cheeks, such rare mixture Venus seeks, when to keep her damsels quiet, beauty sets them down their diet. Aden was not thought more fair, curled locks of amber hair, locks where love did sit and twine, nets to snare the gazer's eyne. Such a palmer ne'er was seen, lest love himself had palmer been. Yet for all he was so quaint, sorrow did his visage taint. Midst the riches of his face, grief deciphered high disgrace. Every step strained a tear, sudden sigh showed his fear and yet his fears by his sight ended in a strange delight, that his passions did approve weeds and sorrow were for love. 
Philomela's Ode from Philomela. Sitting by a riverside, where a silent stream did glide, muse I did of many things that the mind in quiet brings. I again think how some men deem gold their god, and some esteem honor is the chief content that to man in life is lent, and some others do contend quiet none like to a friend. Others hold there is no wealth compared to a perfect health. Some men's mind in quiet stands when he is lord of many lands. But I did sigh and said all this was but a shade of perfect bliss. And in my thoughts I did approve not so sweet as is true love. Sweet are the thoughts from farewell to folly. Sweet are the thoughts that savor of content. The quiet mind is richer than a crown. Sweet are the nights in careless slumber spent. The poor estate scorns fortune's angry frown. Such sweet content, such minds, such sleep, such bliss, beggars enjoy when princes oft do miss. The homely house that harbors quiet rest, the cottage that affords no pride nor care, the mean that grieves with country music best, the sweet consort of mirth and music's fair. Obscured life sets down a type of bliss, a mind content both crown and kingdom is. Sephestia's Song to Her Child From Menophon Weep not, my wanton, smile upon my knee. When thou art old, there's grief enough for thee. Mother's wag, pretty boy, father's sorrow, father's joy. When thy father first did see such a boy by him and me, he was glad I was woe. Fortune change made him so. When he left his pretty boy, last his sorrow, first his joy. Weep not, my wanton, smile upon my knee. When thou art old, there's grief enough for thee. Streaming tears that never stint, like pearl drops from a flint, fell by course from his eyes, that one another's place supplies. Thus he grieved in every part, tears of blood fell from his heart. When he left his pretty boy, father's sorrow, father's joy. Weep not, my wanton, smile upon my knee, when thou art old, there's grief enough for thee. The wanton smiled, father wept, mother cried, baby leapt. More he crowed, more we cried, nature could not sorrow hide. He must go, he must kiss, child and mother, baby bless. For he left his pretty boy, father's sorrow, father's joy. Weep not, my wanton, smile upon my knee. When thou art old, there's grief enough for thee. End of section 5 Read by Bryce Cries. Section 6 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 17. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 17. Selected Works by Gerald Griffin. 1803 to 1840. Under the words never acted, and date October 23, 1842, the play Josephus, by the late Gerald Griffin, author of The Collegians, was announced at Drury Lane Theatre, London. McCready made money and fame out of the work, which had lain for years in his reading desk uncared for, while the patient poet scribbled his way along a life of little joy to an unnoted grave in the burying ground of the voluntary poor. The drama was Griffin's first inspiration, and though he died untimely, the drama gives him back the honor he bestowed. Chagrined and humiliated with failure to get a hearing for his play of Aguirre, and sick from hope deferred for Gisippus, he wrote The Collegian, so full of Irish heart and love, that its stage child, the Colleen Bourne, has delighted the souls of millions. Born in Limerick, December 12, 1803, Gerald Griffin, when his parents came to America to settle in northern Pennsylvania, chose to go at 17 years of age 
with only the equipment of a home education, to seek honors and fortune in the paths which led up to the printing house. John Bannum's recent success had blazed out a new trail in the stifling, starving jungle of bookmaking, and the youth of Ireland was on fire to follow him. One of the sweetest memories of Griffin's career is the delicacy and generosity of Bannon's friendship for the pale, shy, delicate boy from the distant Shannon side during all the awful and lonely days of his early London residence. After hovering under Bannon's wing about the green rooms of Covent Garden and Drury Lane until his sensitive nature could bear the torture of well-bred and ill-concealed indifference no longer, Griffin made his way to the office of one of the weekly periodicals with some sketches of Irish peasant life. The publication of these brought him to notice, but did not keep him free from days and nights of enforced fasting. It was not until 1827 that he was able to publish a book, and that year appeared Hall and Tide and The Tales of the Munster Festivals both to be forever treasured heart songs of the Irishman separated worldwide. The Collegians, in 1828, was eagerly and unstintingly accorded the first place in the new order of literature, the sadly joyous romance of contemporary Ireland. Griffin now became well and safely established in London. Easily compare of the best writers of his race, and in all affairs but those of pecuniary fortune, a favored and envied man, a nature filled with the instinct of devotion kept him safe from some of the evils which rode the shoulders of too many of his fellow countrymen. In the midst of a scurrying and scoffing rout, he kept the heart of his boyhood innocent and unsullied. Tired of the shows and shames of the world, in 1838 he asked and obtained admission into the society of the Christian brothers in his native city. A few days before he entered upon this resolution, he was interrupted by his brother and biographer, Dr. Griffin, in the act of destroying all his manuscripts. It had been his intention to make a complete renunciation by leaving nothing to the world but his published works. His brother was able to save but a few fragments of the great quantity of half-destroyed stories, poems, and plays, and these, with the earlier publications, were included in the only collected edition of his works ever made, published in New York in the decade of 1850. Two years after he had assumed the habit and duty of a religious, Gerald Griffin died, after many days of patient illness, in the house of his brothers in religion at Cork, Ireland, June 12, 1840, his family, living at Susquehanna, Pennsylvania, has given several distinguished names to the literature and politics of our country. How Miles Murphy is heard on behalf of his ponies, from the Collegians. Pat Falvey, supposing that he had remained a sufficient time without to prevent the suspicion of any private understanding between him and Mr. Daly, now made his appearance with luncheon. A collared head, cream cheese, honey, a decanter of gooseberry wine, and some garden fruit were speedily arranged on the table, and the visitors, no way loath, were pressed to make a liberal use of the little banquet, for the time had not yet gone by when people imagined that they could not display their regard for a friend more effectually than by cramming him up to the throat with food and strong drink. Colonel Daly was in the act of taking wine with Mrs. Shute, when he observed Falvey stoop to his young mistress's ear and whisper something with a face of much seriousness. "'A boy wanting to speak to me,' said Miss Shute. "'Has he got letters? Let him send up his message.' "'He says he must see yourself, Miss. "'Tis in regard of some ponies of his that were impounded by Mr. Dolly.' but trespassing above here last night. He hasn't the means of releasing him, poor crather, and he's far from home. I'm sure he's an honest boy. He says he'd have a good friend in Mr. Cragen if he knew he was below. Me, said Mr. Cragen. Why, what's the fellow's name? 
Miles Murphy, sir, from Killarney, Westwoods. Oh, Miles Nacopoline. Poor fellow. Is he in tribulation? We must have his ponies out by all means. It requires more courage than I can always command, said Miss Shute, to revoke any command of Dolly's. He is an old man, and whether that he was crossed in love or from a natural peevishness of disposition, he is such a morose creature that I am quite afraid of him. But I will hear this, Miles, at all events. She was moving to the door when her uncle's voice made her turn. Stay, Anne, said Mr. Cragen. Let him come up. Twill be as good as a play to hear him and the steward pro and con. Colonel Daly here, who is intended for the bar, will be our assessor to decide on the points of law. I can tell you, Colonel, that Miles will give you a lesson in the art of pleading that may be of use to you on circuit at one time or another. Anne laughed and looked to Mrs. Chute who, with a smile of tolerating condescension, said, while she cleared with a silken kerchief the glasses of her spectacles, If your uncle desires it, my love, I can see no objection. Those mountaineers are amusing creatures. Anne returned to her seat and the conversation proceeded, while Falvey, with an air of great and perplexed importance, went to summon Miles upstairs. Mountaineers, exclaimed Captain Gibson, you call every upland a mountain here in Ireland, and every one that lives out of sight of the sea a mountaineer. But this fellow is a genuine mountaineer, cried Mr. Cragen, with a cabin two thousand feet above the level of the sea. If you are in the country next week, and will come down and see us at the lakes, along with our friends here, I promise to show you as sturdy a race of mountaineers as any in Europe. Dr. Leake, can give you a history of them up to Noah's flood. Sometime when you're alone together, when the country was first peopled by one parable, or sparable. Paralon, said Dr. Leake, Paralon, or Migdonia, as the Psalter sings. On the fourteenth day, being Tuesday, they brought their bull ships to anchor in the blue fair port with future shore of well-defended inverse gain. In the rest of Munster, where? Yes, well, you'll see them all, as the doctor says, if you come to Killarney, resumed Mr. Cragen, interrupting the latter, to whose discourse a country residence, a national turn of character, and a limited course of reading had given a tinge of pedantry, and who was, moreover, a firm believer in all the ancient Shanachus, from the yellow book of Molding to the black book of Malaga. And if you like to listen to him, he'll explain to you every action that ever befell on land or water, from Ross Castle up to Carrigaline. Curl, who felt both surprise and concern at learning that Miss Shute was leaving home so soon, and without having thought it worth her while to make him aware of her intention, was about to address her on the subject when the clatter of a pair of heavy and well-paved brogues on the small flight of stairs in the lobby produced a sudden hush of expectation amongst the company. They heard Pat Falvey urging some instructions in a low and smothered tone, to which a strong and not unmusical voice replied, in that complaining accent which distinguishes the dialect of the more western descendants of Haber. Ah, Lay me alone, you foolish boy. Do you think did I never speak to equality in my life before? The door opened, and the uncommissioned master of horse made his appearance. His appearance was at once strikingly majestic and prepossessing, and the natural ease and dignity with which he entered the room might almost have become a peer of the realm, coming to solicit the interest of the family for an electioneering candidate. A broad and sunny forehead, light and wavy hair, a blue cheerful eye, a nose that in Persia might have won him a throne, healthful cheeks, a mouth that was full of character, and a well-knit and almost gigantic person, constituted his external claims to attention, of which his lofty and confident, 
although most unassuming carriage showed him to be in some degree conscious. He wore a complete suit of brown frieze, with a grey-coloured cotton handkerchief around his neck, blue worsted stockings, and brogues carefully greased, while he held in his right hand an immaculate felt hat, the purchase of the preceding day's fare. In the left he held a straight-handled whip and a wooden rattle, which he used for the purpose of collecting his ponies when they happened to straggle. An involuntary murmur of admiration ran amongst the guests at his entrance. Dr. Leake was heard to pronounce him a true Galdalian, and Captain Gibson thought he would cut a splendid figure in a helmet and cuirass under one of the arches in the horse guards. Before he had spoken, and while the door yet remained open, Highland Craig roused Pincher with a chirping noise and gave him the well-known countersign of Bathurston. Pincher waddled towards the door, raised himself on his hind legs, closed it fast, and then trotted back to his master's feet, followed by the staring and bewildered gaze of the mountaineer. Well, he exclaimed, that flog's clock-fighting. I never thought I'd live to have a dog teach me manners anyway. Bathurston, says he, and he shuts the door like a Christian. The mountaineer now commenced a series of most profound obeisances to every individual of the company, beginning with the ladies and ending with the officer, after which he remained glancing from one to another with a smile of mingled sadness and courtesy, as if waiting, like an evoked spirit, the spell word of the enchantress who had called him up. "'Tisn't manners to speak first before quality," was the answer he would have been prepared to render, in case anyone had inquired the motive of his conduct. "'Well, Miles, what wind has brought you to this part of the country?' said Mr. Barney Cragen. "'The old wind always then, Mr. Cragen,' said Miles, with another deep obeisance. "'Seeing what I get a fail of the ponies off. "'Long life to you, sir. "'I was proud to hear you were above stairs, "'for it isn't the first time you stood my friend in trouble. "'My father, the heavens be his bed this day, "'was a flusterer of your Uncle Mix, "'and a first and second cousin be the mother's side "'to old Mrs. O'Leary, your honor's aunt, Westwood, "'so tis kind for your honor to have a leaning toward us. A clear case, Miles, but what have you to say to Mrs. Shute about the trespass? What have I to say to her? Why, then, a deal. It's a long while since I see her now, and she wears finely. The Lord bless her. Ah, Miss Anne, oh, you both the murder. Sure, I'd know that face all over the world, your own living image, ma'am, turning to Mrs. Shute. And a little day we touch of the master. Heaven rest his soul about the gin, you'd think. My grandmother and his self were third cousins. Oh, vo, vo. He has made out three relations in the company already, said Aunt Carol. Could any courtier make interest more skillfully? Well, Miles, about the ponies. Poor creatures, true for you, sir. There's Mr. Craig there, long life to him. Knows how well I am on four ponies. You see what trouble I had with them, Mr. Craig, the day you fought the jewel with young McFarland from the north. They were scalping like mad over the hills down to Gleena when they heard the shot. Ah, indeed, Mr. Craig, you called the north country men that morning fairly. My honor is satisfied says he, if Mr. Craig will apologize. I didn't come to the ground to apologize, says Mr. Craig. It's what I never done to any man, says he, and it'll be long for me to do it to you. Well, my honor is satisfied anyway, says the other, when he heard the pistols cocking for a second shot. I thought I'd split laughing. Pooh, pooh, nonsense, man, said Craig endeavoring to hide a smile of gratified vanity. Your unfortunate ponies will starve while you stay inventing wild stories. He has gained another friend since, whispered Miss Shoot. Invent, echoed.
echoed the mountaineer. The Dr. Lee was on the spot, and he knows if I invent. And you did a good job too that time, Doctor. He continued turning to the ladder. Oh, Keys, the piper gives it up to you. Of all the doctors going for curing his eyesight. And he is a great learning to you, moreover. He's such a fine Irishman. Another said Miss Shute apart. Yourself and old Mr. Daly, he continued. I hope the master is well in his health, sir. Turning to Curl with another profound quandary. May the Lord fasten the life in you and him. That's a gentleman that wouldn't see a poor boy in want of his supper or a bed to sleep in, and he far from his own people, nor persecute him in regard of a little trespass that was done unknown. This fellow is irresistible, said Curl, a perfect Ulysses. And have you nothing to say to the captain, Miles? Is he no relation of yours? The captain, Mr. Cragen? Except in so far as we are all servants of the Almighty and children of Adam. I know of none, but I have a feeling for the red coat for all. I have three brothers in the army serving in America. One of them was made a corporal or an admiral or some real or other for behaving well at Quebec. The time of Wolf's death, the English showed themselves a great people that day, surely. Having thus secured to himself what lawyers call the ear of the court, the mountaineer proceeded to plead the cause of his ponies with much force and pathos, dwelling on their distance from home, their wild habits of life, which left them ignorant of the common rules of boundaries, enclosures, and field gates, setting forth with equal emphasis the length of road they had traveled, their hungry condition, and the barrenness of the common on which they had been turned out, and finally urged in mitigation a penalty, the circumstances of this being a first offense and the improbability of its being ever renewed in future. The surly old steward Dean Dolly was accordingly summoned for the purpose of ordering the discharge of the prisoners a commission which he received with a face as black as winter. Miss Anne might folly her liking, he said, but it was the last time he'd ever trouble himself about damage or trespass any more. What affair was it of his if all the horses in the barony were turned loose into the kitchen garden itself? Horses, do you call them? exclaimed Viles, bending on the old man a frown of dark remonstrance. A parcel of little ponies, not the height of that chair. What signify is it, sir, the steward? They'd eat as much and more than a racer. Is it they, the creatures? They'd hardly injure a plate of cerebout if it was put before em. Hey, uh, Hugh. And tisn't what I'd expect from you, Mr. Dolly, to be going again a relation of your own in this manner. A relation of mine, growled Dolly, scarcely deigning to cast a glance back over his shoulder as he hobbled out of the room. Yes, then, are yours. Dolly paused at the door and looked back. Will you deny it of me if you can, continued Miles, fixing his eye on him. That Biddy Nail, your own gossip, and Larry Foley were her second cousins. Deny that of me if you can. Well, what would I deny it? Well, why? And Larry Foley was uncle to my father's first wife. The angel spread her bed this night. And I tell you another thing. The Dollies would cut a poor figure in many a fair westwards if they hadn't the Murphys to back them. So they would. But what hurt? Sure, you can follow your own pleasure. The old steward muttered something which nobody could hear and left the room. Miles of the ponies, after many profound bows to all his relations, and a profusion of thanks to the ladies, followed him, and was observed in a few minutes after, on the avenue, talking with much earnestness and apparent agitation to Lowry Luby. Curl Daly, who remembered the story of the mountaineer's misfortune at Owen's garden, concluded that Lowry was making him aware of the abduction of the beautiful Ely. How Mr. Daly the Metal Man rose up from breakfast from the Collegians. 
The person who opened the door acted as a kind of herdsman or outdoor servant to the family and was a man of a rather singular appearance. The nether parts of his frame were of a size considerably out of proportion with the trunk and head which they supported. His feet were broad and flat like those of a duck, his legs long and clumsy, his knees and ankles like the knobs on one of those grotesque walking sticks which were in fashion among the fine gentlemen of our own day. Sometimes since, his joints hung loosely like those of a pasteboard Mary Andrew. His body was very small, his chest narrow, and his head so diminutive as to be even too little for his herring shoulders. It seemed as if nature, like an extravagant projector, had laid the foundation of a giant, but running short of material as the structure proceeded, had been compelled to terminate her undertaking within the dimensions of a dwarf. So far was this economy pursued that the head, small as it was, was very scantily furnished with hair, and the nose with which the face was garnished might be compared for its flatness to that of a young kid. It looked, as the owner of this mournful piece of journey work himself facetiously observed, as if his head was not thought worth a roof, nor his countenance worth a handle. His hands and arms were likewise of a smallness which was much to be admired, when contrasted with the hugeness of the lower members, and brought to mind the forepaws of a kangaroo or the fins of a seal, the latter similitude prevailing when the body was put in motion, on which occasions they dabbled about in a very extraordinary manner. But there was one feature in which a corresponding prodigality had been manifested, namely the ears, which were as long as those of Ricket with the tuft or of any ass in the barony. The costume which enveloped the singular frame was no less anonymous than was the nature of its own construction. A huge riding coat of grey frieze hung lazily from his shoulders and gave to view in front a waistcoat of calfskin with the hairy side outward, a shirt of a texture almost as coarse as sailcloth made from the refuse of flax, and a pair of corduroy nether garments with two bright new patches upon the knees, grey whisted stockings, with dogskin brogues well paved in the sole and greased until they shone again, completed the personal adornments of this unaspiring personage. On the whole, his appearance might have brought to the recollection of a modern beholder one of those architectural edifices so fashionable in our time, in which the artist, with their admirable ambition, seeks to unite all that is excellent in the Tuscan, Doric, Corinthian, and Ionic orders, and in one Côte The expression of the figure, though it varied with circumstances, was for the most part thoughtful and deliberative, the effect in a great measure of habitual penury and dependence. At the time of Lord Halifax's administration, Lao Rilubi, then a very young man, held a spot of ground in the neighborhood of Limerick, and was well-to-do in the world, but the scarcity which prevailed in England at the time, and which occasioned a sudden rise in the price of beer, butter, and other produce of grazing land in Ireland, threw all the agriculturalists out of their little holdings and occasioned a general destitution, similar to that produced by the anti cotier system in the present day. Lowry was among the sufferers. He was saved, however, from the necessity of adopting one of the three ultimata of Irish misery, begging, enlisting, or emigrating, by the kindness of Mr. Daly, who took him into his service as a kind of runner between his farms, an office for which Lowry, by his long and muscular legs, and the lightness of the body that encumbered them, was qualified in an eminent degree. His excelling honesty, one of the characteristics of his country, which he was known to possess, rendered him a still more valuable acquisition to the family than had been at first anticipated. He had, moreover, the national talent for adroit flattery, a quality which made him more acceptable to his patron than the latter would willingly admit, 
and every emulsion of this kind was applied under the disguise of a simpleness which gave it a wonderful efficacy. Ha, huh, Lowry, said Mr. Daly. Well, have you made your fortune since you have agreed with the postmaster? Lowry put his hands behind his back, looked successively at the four corners of the room, then round the corners, then cast his eyes down at his feet, turned up the soles a little, and finally, straightening his person and gazing on his master, replied, To lose it I did, sir, for a place. To lose what? The place of postman, sir, through the country westwards. Sure, there I was a gentleman for life, if it wasn't my luck. I do not understand you, Lowry. I'll tell you how it was, master. After the last postman died, sir, I took your recommendation to the postmaster and asked him for the place. I'm used to traveling, sir, says I, for Mr. Daly, over and... I, says he, taking me up short, and you have a good long pair of legs, I see. Middlin, sir, says I. He's a very pleasant gentleman. It's equal to me any day, winter or summer, whether I go ten miles or twenty, so as I have the nourishment. "'Twould be hard if you didn't get that anyway,' says he. "'Well, I think I might as well give you the place, "'for I don't know any gentleman that I'd sooner take his recommendation "'than Mr. Daly's, or one that I'd sooner pay him a compliment if I could. "'Well, and what was your agreement?' Ten pounds a year, sir,' answered Lowry, "'opening his eyes as if he announced something of wonderful importance, "'and speaking in a loud voice.' to suit the magnitude of the sum, besides my clothing and shoes throughout the year. "'Twas very handsome, Lowry. "'Handsome, master? "'Twas wages were a prince, sir. "'Sure there I was, a maid gentleman all my days, "'if it wasn't my luck, as I said before. "'Well, and how did you lose it?' "'I'll tell you, sir,' answered Lowry. "'I was going over to the best master yesterday.' to get the thrilling mail from him, and to start off with myself on my first journey. Well, and good, of all the world, who should I meet above upon the road, just at the turn down to the post office, but that red-headed woman that sells the freestone in the streets. So I turned back. Turned back for what? Sure, the world knows, Master, that it isn't luck to meet a red-haired woman. And you going on the journey. And you never went for the mailbags. Fakes, I'm sure I didn't that day. Well, and the next morning? The next morning, that's this morning when I went, I found they had engaged another boy in my place. And you lost the situation. For this turn, sir, anyway, tis luck that does it all. Sure, I thought I was cocksure of it. And I have in the postmaster's word. But indeed, if I meet that freesome crather again, I'll knock a red head against the wall. Well, Lowry, this ought to show you the folly of your superstition. If you had not minded that woman when you met her, you might have had your situation now. Twas she had fault still, begging your pardon, sir, said Lowry. For sure, if I didn't meet her at all, this wouldn't have happened to me. Oh, said Mr. Daly, laughing, I see you are well provided against all argument. I have no more to say, Lowry. The man now walked slowly towards Curl, and bending down with a look of solemn importance as if he had some weighty intelligence to communicate, he said, The horse, sir, is ready this way, at the door abroad. Very well, Lowry. I shall set out this instant. Lowry raised himself erect again, turned slowly round and walked to the door, with his eyes on the ground and his hand raised to his temple, as if endeavoring to recollect something further which he had intended to say. Lowry, said Mr. Daly, as the handle of the door was turned a second time. Lowry looked round. Lowry, tell me, did you see Ely O'Connor? The rope make his daughter at the fair at Gary Owen yesterday. Ah, you're welcome to your game, master. 
Upon my word, then, Ely is a very pretty girl, Lowry, and I'm told the old father can give her something besides her pretty face. Lowry opened his huge mouth. We forgot to mention that it was a huge one and gave vent to a few explosions of laughter, which much more nearly resembled the braying of an ass. "'You're welcome to your game, master,' he repeated. "'Long life to your honor. "'But is it true, Lowry, as I have heard it insinuated, "'that old Mihil O'Connor used, and still does, "'twist ropes for the use of the county jail?' "'Lowry closed his lips hard.' while the blood rushed into his face at this unworthy allegation, treating it, however, as a new piece of the master's game. He laughed and tossed his head. Folly on, sir, folly on. Because if that were the case, Lowry, I should expect to find you a fellow of too much spirit to become connected, even by affinity with such a calling, a rope maker, a manufacturer of rope's last neckcloths, an understrapper to the gallows, a species of collateral hangman. Ah, oh, then, Mrs., did you hear this? And all rising out of a little old fable of a story that happened as good as five years ago, because Moriarty, the crooked hangman, the thief, stepped into Mill's little place of a night, and nobody knowing of him, and bought a couple of penworth up at whipcord for some vagary or other of his own. And there's all the call Mahill O'Connor had ever to gallowses or hangman in his life. That's the whole total of their insinuations. Never mind your master, Lowry, said Mrs. Daly. He is only amusing himself with you. Oh, ha! I'm sure I know it, ma'am. Long life to him, and tis he that's welcome to his joke. But Lowry, ah, heaven bless you now, master. And let me alone. I'll say nothing to you. Nay, nay, I only wanted to ask you what sort of affair it was at Gary Owen yesterday. Midland, sir, like the small Pieties, they tell me, said Lowry, suddenly changing his manner to an appearance of serious occupation. But tis hard to make out what sort of affair it is when one has nothing to sell himself. I met a huckster, and she told me twas a bad fare because she could not sell her piggins. And I met a pig jobber, and he told me t'was a dear fare. Pork ran so high. And I met another little meager creature, a neighbor that has a cabin on the road above. And he said t'was the best fare that ever come out of the sky, because he got a power for his pig. But Mr. Hardress Cragen was there, and if he didn't make it a dear fare to some of them, you may call me an honest man. A very notable undertaking that would be, Lowry. But how was it? Some of them boys, them Gary Owen lads, sir, to get about Danny Man, the Lord, Mr. Hardress's boatman, as he was coming down from the hills with a new rope for some part of the boat, and to begin reflecting on him and regarded the hump on his back. Poor creature. Well, if they did, Master Hardress freed him and he having a stout blackthorn in his hand this way, and he made up to the foremost of them. What's that you're saying, you scoundrel, says he? What would you give to know, says the other, mighty impudent? Master Hardress made no move, only up with the stick, and without saying this or that, or by your leave, or how do you do, he stretched him. Well, such a scuffle as began among them was never seen. They all fell upon Master Hardress, but they, they had only the half of it, for he made his way through the thick of them without as much as a mark. Ah, indeed, it isn't a goose or a duck they had to do with when they came across Mr. Cragen for all. And where were you in all this, Lowry? Above in the hill store, standing and looking about the fair for myself. And Ely? Ah, here to this again now. I'll run away out of the place entirely from you, master. That's what I'll do. And suiting the action to the phrase, exit Lowry Luby. Old times, old times. Old times, old times, the gay old times. When I was young and free, 
and heard the merry Easter chimes under the sally tree. My Sunday palm beside me placed, my cross upon my hand, a heart at rest within my breast, and sunshine on the land. All times, all times. It is not that my fortunes flee, nor that my cheek is pale. I mourn whate'er I think of thee, my darling native veil. A wiser head I have, I know, than when I loitered there. But in my wisdom there is woe, and in my knowledge care. All times, all times. I've lived to know my share of joy, to feel my share of pain, to learn that friendship self can cloy, to love and love in vain, to feel a pang and wear a smile, to tire of other climes, to like my own unhappy isle, and sing the gay old times, old times, old times. And sure, the land is nothing changed, the birds are singing still, the flowers are springing where we ranged, there's sunshine on the hill. The sally, waving o'er my head, still sweetly shades my frame, but ah, those happy days have fled, and I am not the same. All times, all times. Oh, come again, ye merry times, sweet, sunny, fresh, and calm, and let me hear those Easter chimes and wear my Sunday palm. If I could cry away mine eyes, my tears would flow in vain. If I could waste my heart in sighs, they'll never come again. All times, all times. A place in thy memory, dearest. A place in thy memory, dearest, is all that I claim, to pause and look back when thou hearest the sound of my name. Another may woo thee nearer, another may win and wear. I care not though he be dearer, if I am remembered there. Remember me, not as a lover whose hope was crossed, whose bosom can never recover the light it hath lost. As the young bride remembers the mother she loves, though she never may see, as a sister remembers a brother, oh, dearest, remember me. Could I be thy true lover, dearest? Couldst thou smile on me? I would be the fondest and nearest that ever loved thee. But a cloud on my pathway is glooming that never must burst upon thine. And heaven, that made thee all blooming, never made thee to wither on mine. Remember me then, oh, remember my calm, light love. Though bleak as the blast of November, my life may prove that life will, though lonely, be sweet. If its brightest enjoyment should be a smile and kind word when we meet, and a place in thy memory. End of section six. Section seven of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume seventeen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 17. Selected Scenes from Sappho by Franz Grillparzer, 1791-1872. Grillparzer, the most distinguished dramatist that Austria has produced, was born in Vienna on January 15, 1791. His father, an esteemed advocate of the Austrian capital, seems to have been, like Goethe's father, a man of cold austerity. His mother, on the other hand, had a deeply emotional nature, lived in a world of music, and ended her life a suicide. From her, as in the case of so many poets, Grillparza derived his poetic gifts and his musical taste. At the age of 22, he entered the service of the state, in which he remained until, at his own request, he was retired on a pension in 1856. In 1847, he was made a member of the Royal Academy of Sciences. In his quiet and well-ordered life, there is little that is striking to record. Its most picturesque periods were those of his extensive travels in Turkey, Italy, and Greece. Of these travels, 
he has left fragmentary accounts in his volume of autobiographical sketches. In literature, Grillparza took his own independent course. He was filled with the spirit of Greek tragedy, but far from attempting a strict modern adaptation of the classic forms, he gave his plays a frankly romantic and sentimental coloring. He made a close study of the Spanish drama, but was not dominated by it. Shakespeare, too, whose colossal genius had first created and then crushed the German drama, never overmastered Grill Plaza. Among his autobiographical works occurs this remarkable passage. You ask what books I shall take with me? Many and few. Herodotus, Plutarch, and the two Spanish dramatists. And not Shakespeare? Not Shakespeare. Although he is perhaps the greatest thing the modern world has produced, not Shakespeare. He tyrannizes over my mind, and I wish to remain free. I thank God for him, and that it was my very good fortune to read and reread him, and make him mine. But now I strive to forget him. The ancients strengthen me. The Spaniards inspire me to produce. But the giant Shakespeare usurps the place of nature whose most glorious organ of expression he was, and whoever gives himself up to him will, to every question asked of nature, forever receive an answer from Shakespeare only. No more Shakespeare. German literature will be ruined in that very abyss out of which it once arose. But I will be free and independent. Grillparz's public career as a dramatist began in 1817 with the famous tragedy of D. Onfrau, the ancestress, which is typical of the class to which it belongs, the so-called tragedies of fate. Two years later came Sappho, in Byron's journal. Under date of January 12, 1821, we find this entry. Read the Italian translation by Guido Sorelli of the German Grillfarzer. A devil of a name, to be sure, for posterity, but they must learn to pronounce it. The tragedy of Sappho is superb and sublime. There is no denying it. The man has done a great thing in writing that play. And who is he? I know him not, but ages will. Tis a high intellect. Grillparzer is grand, antique, not so simple as the ancients, but very simple for a modern. To Madame de Stelish now and then, but altogether a great and goodly writer. This critical estimate is singularly just. What Grillparza lacks in simplicity is offset by his lyric tenderness and portrayal of complex emotions. In 1834 was performed Demir's Under Lieber Wellen, The Waves of the Sea and of Love. Grillparza was conscious that the title was affected. The theme is the tale of Hero and Leander. It was my purpose, he wrote, to indicate at the outset that although of an antique coloring, my treatment of the material was intended to be romantic. In short, it was an attempt to combine the true dramatic styles. This confirms Byron's judgment. There was something of timidity in Grillparz's nature. The first acts are often grand and imposing but the catastrophe frequently passes away in an elegiac mode, like fading music. But he has produced plays in his own peculiar manner, which are full of genuine humanity and vigorous dramatic action, and their place is still secure in the repertory of the German stage. Grillparz's collected works fill 16 volumes. His most extensive undertaking was the trilogy a dust golden dies, the golden fleece, of which Medea is still a favorite. The most important of his works is King Ottokar, which occupies a place in the national life of Austria, comparable to that held by Shakespeare's historical plays in English literature, and the excellent tragedy, Ein Freie Dina Seins Ern, a faithful servant of his master, is likewise the product of Austrian national life. The direct influence of Calderon is manifest in the fairy tale character of the charming drama, Der Traum 
Ein Leben, Dream is a Life, in which the title of the famous Spanish play is reversed. Grillparz's comedy, Vedem de Lut, Woe to Him Who Lies, was not at first a success, and for a long time thereafter, the poet refused in disgust to submit his dramas to the stage. The play subsequently became popular, but this disregard of all pecuniary considerations in relation to his plays was characteristic of Grill Parser. At Beethoven's request, he wrote the opera text of Melusine, and the poet has told us in his recollections of Beethoven how insistent the composer was that a contract be drawn dividing the proceeds. But Grill Parser refused to allow this, he was satisfied to know that Beethoven liked his poem and was willing to devote his genius to giving it a musical setting. The great composer died before the music had taken definite form, and it was Grillparz's office to deliver the funeral oration. I loved Beethoven, he says simply in one of his touching paragraphs. Grillparz outlived his productivity, but his fame increased. At the celebration of his 80th birthday, honors were showered thick upon him. He was named by the side of Goethe and Schiller, and the highest aristocracy of that most aristocratic land joined with the common people to do him homage. In the following year, January 21, 1872, Grillparzer died. His place in the front rank of German dramatists is as assured today as when, at the culmination of a long life, all Germany brought tributes to the genius of the greatest of Austrian poets. Sappho and Phaon From Sappho Phaon lies slumbering on the grassy bank. Sappho, entering from Grotto. Tis all in vain, rebellious to my will. Thought wanders and returns, void of all sense. Whilst ever and anon, whatever I do, before me stands that horrid, hated sight I fain would flee from. E'en beyond this earth, how he upheld her, how she clasped his arm, till, gently yielding to its soft embrace, she on his lips, away, away the thought, for in that thought are deaths innumerable. But why torment myself? and thus complain of what perhaps is after all a dream. Who knows what transient feeling soon forgot, what momentary impulse led him on, which quickly passed, e'en as it quickly came, unheeded, undeserving of reproach. Who bade me seek the measure of his love within my own impassioned aching breast? Ye who have studied life with earnest care, by man's affection judge not woman's heart. A restless thing is his impetuous soul, the slave of change, and changing with each change. Boldly man enters on the path of life, illumined by the morning ray of hope. Begirt with sword and shield, courage and faith, impatient to commence a glorious strife. Too narrow seems to him domestic joy, his wild ambition overleaps repose, and hurries madly on through endless space. And if upon his wayward path he meets the humble, beauteous flower called love, and should he stoop to raise it from the earth, he coldly places it upon his helm. He knoweth not what holy, ardent flame it doth awaken in a woman's heart, how all her being, every thought, each wish, revolves forever on this single point. Like to the young bird, round its mother's nest, while fluttering, Doth her anxious boding care watch o'er her love, her cradle and her grave, her whole of life, a jewel of rich price, she hangs upon the bosom of her faith. Man loves, tis true, but his capacious heart finds room for other feelings than his love, and much that woman's purity condemns, he deems amusement or an idle jest, a kiss from other lips he takes at will. Alas, that is so. Yet so it is. Turns and sees Phaon sleeping. Ah, see, beneath the shadow of yon rose, the faithless dear one slumbers. Ay, he sleeps, and quiet rest hath settled on his brow. Thus only slumbers gentle innocence. Alone thus gently breathes 
the unburdened breast. Yes, dearest, I will trust thy peaceful sleep. What e'er thy waking painful may disclose? Forgive me, then, if I have injured thee by unjust doubt, or if I dared to think that falsehood could approach a shrine so pure. A smile plays o'er his mouth, his lips divide, a name is hovering in his burning breath. Awake and call thy Sappho, she is near, her arms are clasped about thee. She kisses his brow, Phaon awakes, and with half-opened eyes exclaims, Melita, Sappho starting back, Ha! Phaon, who hath disturbed me? What envious hand hath driven from my soul the happy dream? Recollecting himself, Thou, Sappho, welcome. Well, I knew indeed that something beauteous must be near my side to lend such glowing colors to my dream. But why so sad? I am quite happy now. The anxious care that lay upon my breast hath disappeared, and I am glad again, like to some wretch who hath been headlong plunged into some deep abyss where all was dark when lifted upward by a friendly arm, so that once more he breathes the air of heaven, and in the golden sunlight bathes again, he heareth happy voices sounding near. Thus in the wild excitement of my heart, I feel it overflow with happiness, and wish half sinking neath the weight of joy, the keener senses or for less of bliss. Sappho, lost in thought. Melita. Phaon. Be gay and happy, dear one. All round us here is beautiful and fair. On weary wings the summer evening sinks, in placid rest upon the quiet earth. The sea heaves timidly her billowy breast, the bride expectant of the lord of day, whose fiery steeds have almost reached the west. The gentle breeze sighs through the poplar boughs, and far and near all nature whispers love. Is there no echo in our hearts? We love. Sappho, aside, Oh, I could trust again this faithless one, but no, too deeply have I read his heart. Phaon, the feverish spell that pressed upon my brain hath vanished quite, and ah, believe me, dear Sappho, I ne'er have loved thee till this hour. Let us be happy, but tell me, loved one, what faith hast thou in dreams? Sappho, they always lie and I hate liars. Phaon, for as I slept just now, I had a heavenly dream. I thought myself again, again, upon Olympia's height, as when I saw thee first the queen of song, amid the voices of the noisy crowd, the clang of chariot wheels and warrior shouts. A strain of music stole upon mine ear. T'was thou, again thou sweetly sangst of love and deep within my soul I felt its power. I rushed impetuous toward thee when, behold, it seemed at once as though I knew thee not. And yet the Tyrian mantle clasped thy form, the lyre still lay upon thy snow-white arm. Thy face alone was changed, like as a cloud obscures the brightness of a summer sky. The laurel wreath had vanished from thy brow. Upon thy lips, from which your mortal sounds had scarcely died away, sat naught but smiles, and in the profile of proud Phallus's face I traced the features of a lovely child. It was thyself, and yet t'was not. It was Sappho, almost shrieking, Malita! Phaon starting, thou hadst well nigh frightened me. Who said that it was she? I knew it not. O oh, Sappho, I have grieved thee. Sappho motions him to leave. Ah, what now? Thou wish me to be gone? Let me first say. She again motions him to leave. Must I indeed then go? Then fare thee well. Exit Fion. Sappho, after a pause. The bow hath sprung. Pressing her hands to her breast. The arrow wankles here. T'were vain to doubt. It is, it must be so. Tis she that dwells within his perjured heart. 
her image ever floats before his eyes. His very dreams enshrine that one loved form. The Death of Sappho From Sappho Sappho enters, richly dressed, the Tyrian mantle on her shoulders, the laurel crown upon her head, and the golden lyre in her hand. Surrounded by her people, she slowly and solemnly descends the steps. A long pause. Melita, O oh, Sappho, O oh, my mistress. Sappho, calmly and gravely, what wouldst thou? Melita, now is the darkness fallen from my eyes. Oh, let me be to thee again a slave, again what once I was, and oh, forgive. Sappho, in the same tone, thinkst thou that Sappho hath become so poor as to have need of gifts from one like thee? That which is mine I shall ere long possess. Phaon, hear me but once, O Sappho. Sappho, touch me not. I am henceforth devoted to the gods. Phaon, if e'er with loving eyes thou didst behold. Sappho, thou speakst of things forever past and gone. I sought for thee, and I have found myself. Thou couldst not understand my heart. Farewell on firmer ground than thee my hopes must rest. Phaon, and dost thou hate me now? Sappho, to love, to hate, is there no other feeling? Thou wert dear, and art so still, and so shalt ever be, like to some pleasant fellow traveller, whom accident had brought a little way in the same bark until the goal be reached. When parting, each pursues a different road, yet often in some strange and distant land. Remembrance will recall that traveller still. Her voice falters. Phaon moved. Sappho. Sappho, be still, and let us part in peace. To her people, ye who have seen your Sappho weak, forgive. For Sappho's weakness well will I atone. Alone when bent, the bow's full power is shown. Pointing to the altar in the background, kindle the flames at Aphrodite's shrine till up to heaven they mount like morning beams. They obey her. And now retire and leave me here alone. I would seek counsel only from the gods. Ramnus, to the people, it is her wish, let us obey. Come all. They retire. Sappho, advancing. Gracious, immortal gods, list to my prayer. Ye have adorned my life with blessings rich. Within my hand ye have placed the bow of song, the quiver of the poet gave to me, a heart to feel, a mind to quickly think, a power to reveal my inmost thoughts. Yes, ye have crowned my life with blessings rich, but this all thanks. Upon this lowly head ye placed a wreath, and sowed in distant lands the poet's peaceful fame, immortal seed. My songs are sung in strange and foreign climes. My name shall perish only with the earth. For this all thanks. Yet it hath been your will that I should drink not deep of life's sweet cup, but only taste the overflowing draught. Behold, obedient to your high behest, I set it down untouched. For this all thanks. All that ye have decreed I have obeyed. Therefore deny me not a last reward. They who belong to heaven no weakness show. The coils of sickness cannot round them twine in their full strength, and all their beings bloom. Ye take them to yourselves. Such be my lot. Forbid that ere your priestess should become the scorn of those who dare despise your power, the sport of fools in their own folly wise. Ye broke the blossom. Now then, Break the bow. Let my life close, e'en as it once began. From this soul's struggle quickly set me free. I am too weak to bear a further strife. Give me the triumph, but the conflict spare. As if inspired. The flames are kindled, and the sun ascends. I feel that I am heard. I thank thee, gods. Phaon, Melita, hither come to me. 
she kisses the brow of Phaon. A friend from other worlds doth greet thee thus. She embraces Melita. Tis thy dead mother sends this kiss to thee, upon yon altar consecrate to love, be love's mysterious destiny fulfilled. She hurries to the altar. Ramnus, what is her purpose? Glorified her form. The radiance of the gods doth round her shine. Sappho, ascending a high rock and stretching her hands over Phaon and Melita. Give love to mortals, reverence to the gods, and joy what blooms for ye, and think of me. Thus still I pay the last great debt of life. Bless them, ye gods, and bear me hence to heaven. Throws herself from the rock into the sea. End of section 7「Section 8 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 17. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 17. Herman Grimm. 1828 to 1901. In the sense in which the English-speaking people use the phrase, Hermann Grimm was for years the leading man of letters in Germany, and chief representative of German culture. His style is the perfection of simplicity, purity, and beauty. His interests and sympathies are wide as humanity. His treatment of a subject is never pedantic, and his scholarship is always human. He is spiritually the descendant of Goethe, from whom he inherits his serenity of judgment and his sympathetic insight into the new, strange, and steadily changing life of his contemporaries. His essays and briefer articles form a running commentary upon the great currents of thought that influence our time and without dwelling upon the surface except for purposes of illustration they present the structure of our intellectual life and exhibit its essential features herman grimm was born at cassel on january sixth eighteen twenty eight his father was wilhelm grimm he was accustomed to call his uncle jacob a papa with the greek alpha privative not papa it was in the stimulating circle that gathered about the brothers Grimm that he grew up. The Arnims, Brentanos, and the group of eminent scholars that gave luster to the universities of Göttingen and Berlin. In the social intercourse of the Prussian capital, it was to the house of Bettina von Arnim that Grimm was chiefly drawn. He subsequently married Gisela, Bettina's youngest daughter. Grimm's earliest literary efforts were in dramatic form. His novellen, a series of short stories distinguished by great beauty of form and tenderness of feeling, were published in 1856, and have proved their vitality after forty years by a new edition in 1896. He was about thirty years of age when the first volume of his essays appeared. Up to this point, his life had been the irresponsible one of a highly gifted man of artistic temperament, who has not yet found his special aptitude, nor set himself a definite goal. The late Professor Brun has told how, when he and Grimm were young men, together in Rome, the latter finally came to see the necessity of winning a firm foothold in some special field, and of accomplishing some well-defined task. It was in pursuance of this thought, and under the stimulating influence of his young wife's genius, that Grimm wrote the famous Life of Michelangelo, and placed himself at one stroke in the front rank of German letters. This work is now universally recognized as one of the finest specimens of biographical writing that modern literature has produced, it also marked an epoch in the study of the Italian Renaissance. In 1867, his ambitious novel, Unuber Windlich Macht, 
insuperable powers appeared and was received with an enthusiasm which it has not been able to maintain in eighteen seventy three he was made professor of art history a chair which was created for him at the university of berlin the freshness of his ideas and the free grace of his delivery attracted thousands to his auditorium and many americans were always among his enthusiastic hearers grimm was bound to america by many ties first among these was his love for emerson he found a volume of emerson's essays upon the table at bancroft's house he thought that his command of english was good but this book presented difficulties he took it home and soon discovered that these difficulties grew out of the fact that the writer had original ideas and his own way of expressing them he translated the essays on goethe and shakespeare into german his own two essays on emerson are finely appreciative both of the character of american life and of emerson as its interpreter and exponent he was thus with julian schmidt the first to make the american philosopher known to the german public his life of raphael which first appeared in eighteen seventy two was the cause of much unrefreshing strife in which however the author never deigned to take part bitter opposition to his views generally took the form of contemptuous silence on the part of specialists and the press meanwhile the raphael reached its fifth edition and was translated into english most popular among his works after the michelangelo is the volume of lectures on goethe this fascinating work was the outgrowth of a series of public lectures delivered in eighteen seventy six at the university of berlin they do not attempt a systematic life of goethe but in them is presented the poet as he lived and wrought and as in michelangelo the splendid life in rome and florence is restored so the golden age of german letters lives again in these lectures the english translation by miss sarah h adams is dedicated to emerson in eighteen eighty nine he lost his wife it was characteristic of the man that in these days of overwhelming bereavement he should seek consolation in the poetry of homer the result of these loving studies is now before the world in two stately volumes entitled homer's iliad the iliad is treated as if it had never before been read and regard is paid only to its poetic contents its marvellous composition its delineation of character its essential modernness this book was a labor of love and is an inspiring introduction to an unprejudiced and appreciative study of homer grimm continues to exert a wide and fine influence upon the intellectual life of his countrymen in the forefront of every important movement he was among the first to advocate the admission of women into the university himself a thorough classical scholar he nevertheless held liberal views on the great question of educational reform and although rooted in the romanticism of the early part of the century he displays the keenest understanding of the tumultuous life of the modern empire in his five volumes of essays may be found a precipitate of all that is best in german culture during the last forty years to the ties which already bound him to this country there was added in eighteen ninety six another he was elected to membership in the american academy of arts and sciences to succeed the late sir john r seeley his death occurred june seventeenth nineteen o one selection florence from the life of michelangelo by herman grimm translation of fanny elizabeth bunnett little brown and company publishers boston there are names which carry with them something of a charm we utter them and like the prince in the arabian nights who mounted the marvellous horse and spoke the magic words 
we feel ourselves lifted from the earth into the clouds. We have but to say Athens, and all the great deeds of antiquity break upon our hearts like a sudden gleam of sunshine. We perceive nothing definite, we see no separate figures, but a cloudy train of glorious men passes over the heavens, and a breath touches us, which, like the first warm wind in the year, seems to give promise of the spring in the midst of snow and rain. Florence, and the magnificence and passionate agitation of Italy's prime, sends forth its fragrance toward us like blossom-laden boughs, from whose dusky shadow we catch whispers of the beautiful tongue. We will now, however, step nearer and examine more clearly the things which, taken collectively at a glance, we call the history of Athens and Florence. The glowing images now grow cold and become dull and empty. Here, as everywhere, we see the strife of common passions, the martyrdom and ruin of the best citizens, the demon-like opposition of the multitude to all that is pure and elevated and the disinterestedness of the noblest patriots suspiciously misunderstood and arrogantly rejected vexation sadness and sorrow steal over us instead of the admiration which at first moved us and yet what is it all turning away we cast back one glance from afar and the old glory lies again on the picture and a light in the distance seems to reveal to us the paradise which attracts us afresh as if we set foot on it for the first time athens was the first city of greece rich powerful with a policy which extended almost over the entire world of that age we can conceive that from her emanated all the great things that were done Florence, however, in her fairest days, was never the first city of Italy, and in no respect possessed extraordinary advantages. She lies not on the sea, not even on a river at any time navigable, for the Arno, on both sides of which the city rises, often affords in summer scarcely water sufficient to cover the soil of its broad bed at that point of its course where it emerges from narrow valleys into the plain situated between the diverging arms of the mountain range the situation of naples is more beautiful that of genoa more royal than florence rome is richer in treasures of art venice possessed a political power in comparison with which the influence of the florentines appears small lastly these cities and others such as pisa and milan have gone through an external history compared with which that of florence contains nothing extraordinary and yet notwithstanding all else that happened in italy between twelve fifty and fifteen thirty is colourless when placed side by side with the history of this one city her internal life surpasses in splendor the efforts of the others at home and abroad the events through the intricacies of which she worked her way with vigorous determination and the men whom she produced raised her fame above that of the whole of italy besides and place florence as a younger sister by the side of athens the earlier history of the city before the days of her highest splendor stands in the same relation to the subsequent events as the contests of the homeric heroes to that which happened in the historic ages in greece the incessant strife between the hostile nobles which lasted for centuries and ended with the annihilation of all presents to us on the whole as well as in detail the course of an epic poem these contests in which the whole body of the citizens became involved began with the strife of two families brought about by a woman with murder and revenge in its train and it is ever the passion of the leaders which fans the dying flames into new life from their ashes at length arose the true florence she had now no longer a warlike aristocracy like venice no popes nor nobles like rome 
no fleet, no soldiers, scarcely a territory. Within her walls was a fickle, avaricious, ungrateful people of parvenus, artisans, and merchants, who had been subdued, now here and now there, by the energy or the intrigues of foreign and native tyranny, until at length exhausted they had actually given up their liberty. And it is the history of these very times which is surrounded with such glory, and the remembrance of which awakens such enthusiasm among her own people at the present day, at the remembrance of their past. Whatever attracts us in nature and in art, that higher nature which man has created, may be felt also of the deeds of individuals and of nations. A melody, incomprehensible and enticing, is breathed forth from the events, filling them with importance and animation. Thus we should like to live and to act, to have joined in obtaining this, to have assisted in the contest there. It becomes evident to us that this is true existence. Events follow each other like a work of art. A marvelous thread unites them. There are no disjointed, convulsive shocks which startle us as at the fall of a rock, making the ground tremble, which for centuries had lain tranquil, and again, perhaps for centuries, sinks back into its old repose, for it is not repose, order, and a lawful progress on the smooth path of peace which we desire, nor the fearful breaking up of long-established habits, and the chaos that succeeds. But we are struck by deeds and characters whose outset promises results, and allows us to augur an end where the powers of men and nations strive after perfection and our feelings aspire toward a harmonious aim, which we hope for or dread, and which we see reached at length. Our pleasure in these events in no degree resembles the satisfaction with which, perchance, a modern officer of police would express himself respecting the excellent condition of a country. There are so-called quiet times, within which, nevertheless, the best actions appear hollow and inspire a secret mistrust. When peace, order, and impartial administration of justice are words with no real meaning, and piety sounds even like blasphemy, while in other epochs open depravity, errors, injustice, crime, and vice form only the shadows of a great and elevating picture, to which they impart the just truth. The blacker the dark places, the brighter the light ones. An indestructible power seems to necessitate both. We are at once convinced that we are not deceived it is all so clear, so plain, so intelligible. We are struck with the strife of inevitable dark necessity, with the will whose freedom nothing can conquer. On both sides we see great powers rising, shaping events, and perishing in their course, or maintaining themselves above them. We see blood flowing, the rage of parties flashes before us like the sheet lightning of storms that have long ceased. We stand here and there and fight once more in the old battles. But we want truth, no concealing of aims or the means with which they desired to obtain them. Thus we see the people in a state of agitation, just as the lava in the crater of a volcanic mountain rises in itself and from the fermenting mass there sounds forth the magic melody which we call to mind when the names Athens or Florence are pronounced. Yet how poor seem the treasures of the Italian city compared with the riches of the Greek! A succession of great Athenians appear where only single Florentines could be pointed out. Athens surpassed Florence as far as the Greeks surpassed the Romans, but Florence touches us the more closely. We tread less certain ground in the history of Athens, and the city herself has been swept away from her old rocky soil, leaving only insignificant ruins behind. Florence still lives. 
if at the present day we look down from the height of old fiesole on the mountain side north of the city the cathedral of florence santa maria del fiore or santa liparata as it is called with its cupola and slender bell tower and the churches palaces and houses and the walls that enclose them still lie in the depth below as they did in years gone by all is standing upright and undecayed the city is like a flower which when fully blown instead of withering on its stalk turned as it were into stone thus she stands at the present day and to him who forgets the former ages life and fragrance seem not to be lacking many a time we could fancy it is still as once it was just as when traversing the canals of venice under the soft beams of the moon we are delusively carried back to the times of her ancient splendour but freedom has vanished and that succession of great men has long ceased which year by year of old sprung up afresh yet the remembrance of these men and of the old freedom still lives their remains are preserved with religious care to live with consciousness in florence is to a cultivated man nothing else than the study of the beauty of a free people in its very purest instincts the city possesses something that penetrates and sways the mind we lose ourselves in her riches while we feel that everything drew its life from that one freedom the past obtains an influence even in its most insignificant relations which almost blinds us to the rest of italy we become fanatical florentines in the old sense the most beautiful pictures of titian begin to be indifferent to us as we follow the progress of florentine art in its almost hourly advance from the most clumsy beginnings up to perfection the historians carry us into the intricacies of their age as if we were initiated into the secrets of living persons we walk along the streets where they walked we step over the thresholds which they trod we look down from the windows at which they have stood florence has never been taken by assault nor destroyed nor changed by some all-devastating fire the buildings of which they tell us stand there almost as if they had grown up stone by stone to charm and gratify our eyes if i a stranger am attracted with such magnetic power how strong must have been the feeling with which the free old citizens clung to their native city which was the world to them it seemed to them impossible to live and die elsewhere hence the tragic and often frantic attempts of the exiled to return to their home unhappy was he who at eventide might not meet his friends in her squares who was not baptized in the church of san giovanni and could not have his children baptized there it is the oldest church in the town and bears in its interior the proud inscription that it will not be thrown down until the day of judgment a belief as strong as that of the romans to whom eternity was to be the duration of their capital horace sang that his songs would last as long as the priestess ascended the steps there athens and florence owed their greatness to their freedom we are free when our longing to do all that we do for the good of our country is satisfied but it must be independently and voluntarily we must perceive ourselves to be a part of a whole and that while we advance we promote the advance of the whole at the same time this feeling must be paramount to any other with the florentines it rose above the bloodiest hostility of parties and families passions stooped before it the city and her freedom lay nearest to every heart and formed the end and aim of every dispute no power without was to oppress them none within the city herself was to have greater authority than another every citizen desired to cooperate for the general good 
no third party was to come between to help forward their interests so long as this jealousy of a personal right in the state ruled in the minds of the citizens florence was a free city with the extinguishing of this passion freedom perished and in vain was every energy exerted to maintain it that which however exhibits athens and florence as raised above other states which likewise flourished through their freedom is a second gift of nature by which freedom was either circumscribed or extended for both may be said of it namely the capability in their citizens for an equal development of all human power one-sided energy may do much whether men or nations possess it egyptians romans englishmen are grand examples of this the one-sidedness of their character however discovers itself again in their undertakings and sometimes robs that which they achieve of the praise of beauty in athens and florence no passion for any time gained such ascendancy over the individuality of the people as to preponderate over others if it happened at times for a short period a speedy subversion of things brought back the equilibrium the florentine constitution depended on the resolutions of the moment made by an assembly of citizens entitled to vote any power could be legally annulled and with equal legality another could be raised up in its stead nothing was wanting but a decree of the great parliament of citizens a counter vote was all that was necessary so long as the great bell sounded which called all the citizens together to the square in front of the palace of the government any revenge borne by one towards another might be decided by open force in the public street parliament was the lawfully appointed scene of revolution in case the will of the people no longer accorded with that of the government the citizens in that case invested a committee with dictatorial authority the offices were newly filled all offices were accessible to all citizens any man was qualified and called upon for any position what sort of men must these citizens have been who formed a stable and flourishing state with institutions so variable sordid merchants and manufacturers yet how they fought for their freedom selfish policy and commerce their sole interest yet were they the poets and historians of their country avaricious shopkeepers and money changers but dwelling in princely palaces and these palaces built by their own masters and adorned with paintings and sculptures which had been likewise produced within the city everything put forth blossom every blossom bore fruit the fate of the country is like a ball which in its eternal motion still rests ever on the right point every florentine work of art carries the whole of florence within it dante's poems are the result of the wars the negotiations the religion the philosophy the gossip the faults the vice the hatred the love and the revenge of the florentines all unconsciously assisted nothing might be lacking from such a soil alone could such a work spring forth from the athenian mind alone could the tragedies of sophocles and aeschylus proceed the history of the city has as much share in them as the genius of the men in whose minds imagination and passion sought expression in words it makes a difference whether an artist is the self-conscious citizen of a free land or the richly rewarded subject of a ruler in whose ears liberty sounds like sedition and treason a people is free not because it obeys no prince but because of its own accord it loves and supports the highest authority whether this be a prince or an aristocracy who hold the government in their hands a prince there always is in the freest republics one man gives after all the casting vote but he must be there because he is the first and because all need him 
it is only where each single man feels himself a part of the common basis upon which the commonwealth rests that we can speak of freedom and art what have the statues in the villa of hadrian to do with rome and the desires of rome what the mighty columns of the baths of caracalla with the ideal of the people in whose capital they arose in athens and florence however we could say that no stone was laid on another no picture no poem came forth but the entire population was its sponsor whether santa maria del fiore was rebuilt whether the church of san giovanni gained a couple of golden gates whether pisa was besieged peace concluded or a mad carnival procession celebrated every one was concerned in it the same general interest was evinced in it the beautiful simonetta the most beautiful young maiden in the city is buried the whole of florence follow her with tears in their eyes and lorenzo medici the first man in the state writes an elegiac sonnet on her loss which is on the lips of all a newly painted chapel is opened no one may be missing a foot-race through the streets is arranged carpets hang out from every window contemplated from afar the two cities stand before us like beautiful human figures like women with dark sad glances and yet laughing lips we step nearer it seems one great united family we pass into the midst of them it is like a beehive of human beings athens and her destiny is a symbol of the whole life of greece Florence is a symbol of the prime of Roman Italy. Both, so long as their liberty lasted, are a reflection of the golden age of their land and people. After liberty was lost, they are an image of the decline of both until their final ruin. End of section 8「Section 9 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 17. » This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. « Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 17. » Selected Tales by the Grimm Brothers the Grimm Brothers by Benjamin W. Wells Grimm, Grimm, Jacob Ludwig Harl, 1785-1863, and Wilhelm Karl, 1786-1859, whose names are inseparably connected in the history of German antiquities, philology and literature, were the oldest sons of a petty official then stationed at Hanau in Hesse Castle. Their father died in 1796, but though poor, they were able to study for the law at the University of Marburg, where Professor Savigny gave them their first inspiration and directed their minds to early German literature and institutions. After their graduation, Jacob occupied for a time subordinate civil and diplomatic positions, and after 1816, both were connected with a library at Kassel, which they exchanged in 1828 for the University Library at Göttingen, where Jacob also lectured, though without popular success, until they were ejected from office for a manly protest in 1837 against the broken pledges of the King of Hanover. With no desire of applause or fear of blame when he had acted as he must, Words that show his whole character, Jacob withdrew with his brother to Kassel and thence in 1840 to Berlin, where they had been appointed professors and members of the Academy. Here they passed a life of tireless investigation, interrupted only by Jacob's brief and not very happy share in the National Assembly at Frankfurt in 1848. Here they died, and here they were buried, as they had lived, together. The brothers had passed their whole lives in common labor, of which the elder thus spoke in a memorial oration. Quote, 
In the slow gliding school years, one bed and one study held us. There we sat working at the same table, and afterward, in our student years, two beds and two tables stood in the same room. In later life, still two tables in the same room. And at last, to the very end, two rooms beside one another, always under one roof, in undisturbed and untroubled community of our money and books, except for a few that each must have immediately at hand, and which were therefore bought in duplicate. And so also our last beds will be laid, it seems, close by one another. Let one consider then whether in speaking of him I can avoid speaking of myself. End of quote. The work may be treated as a unit, though Jacobs was the most dominant spirit. He had an iron industry, a clear vision, an unfailing cheerfulness in labor. His style has a peculiar rugged earnestness. It is not unpolished, but picturesque and full of a woodland savor, while Wilhelm had a frailer constitution and a gentler nature that showed itself in the graceful naivete of those legends and tales to which he gave literary form. The genius of their common studies was a noble patriotism. One could say of both what Jacob said of himself, that nearly all their labors were directed to the investigation of early German language, laws and poetry. Labors which might seem useless to some, but were to them inseparably connected with the fatherland and calculated to foster the love of it. Again, he says, I strove to penetrate into the wild forest of our ancestors, listening to their noble language, watching their pure customs, recognizing their ancient freedom and their rational and hearty faith. These labors took the form of studies in early law, Rechtsalter Tümer, or legal antiquities, in 1828, mythology, Deutsche Mythologie, in 1835, Sagen, or legends, 1816, revised 1868, essays on old German poetry, Altdeutscher Meistergesang, 1811, and numerous editions of old German, Danish, Norse, and English texts. Most important to the scientific world, however, were the Deutsche Grammatik, 1819 and 1822 to 1840, and the still unfinished dictionary, perhaps the most vast undertaking of modern philologists. But monumental as these works are, they belong only indirectly to literature nor is there much of general interest in the eight volumes of Jacob Grimm's Minor Writings, 1864-1890. On the other hand, all the world knows the brothers for their household tales, 1812-1815, and often for these alone. They were meant for a contribution to folklore, as may be seen from the volume of notes that accompany them, of which the extracts that follow contain two specimens. But in a single generation, they became one of the most popular books of the world. They were translated into every civilized tongue and may be found today tattered and worn in a million nurseries, but never outworn in the hearts of nature's children. Artists like Walter Crane have illustrated them, Critics like Andrew Lang have introduced them to English readers, not where the German scholars and critics, Scherer, Curtius, Bernd, have bestowed on them the tribute of learning. But perhaps no one has spoken better of them than Birland Grimm in his preface, a part of which is translated below, and none has paid a nobler tribute to the fraternal love of their authors than Jacob Grimm in the first volume of his minor writings. A word to the reader from the preface to the household tales. We sometimes find, when a whole cornfield has been beaten down by a storm, that a little place has sheltered itself by the low hedges or bushes, and a few years remain upright. Then, if the sun shines kindly again, they grow alone and unnoticed. No early sickle casts them for the great granaries. But late in summer, when they are ripe and full, 
can poor hands that glean them and carry them home, laid year to year, bound carefully, and more highly treasured than whole sheaves, and their food all winter long, perhaps also the only seed for the future. So it seemed to us, when we saw how nothing was left of so much that had bloomed in old times, how even the memory of it was almost lost, except among the people in songs, a few books, legends, and these innocent household tales. The fireside, the hearth, the attic stairs, ancient holidays, mountain paths and forests in their silence, but above all an untroubled fantasy, have been the hedges that have guarded them and transmitted them from one age to another. It was high time to seize these tales, for their guardians grow even rarer. To be sure, those who know them usually know many, for it is men who are dead to them, not they to men. That which has given such manifold and repeated joy and emotion and instruction bears in it its own excuse for being, and has surely come from that eternal spring that bedews all life. And though it were only a single drop that has caught on a little crumpled leaf, yet it sparkles in the first blush of dawn. Hence it is that all these fancies are pervaded with that purity by which children seem to us so wonderful and blessed. They have the same blue-white immaculate bright eyes. And so, by our collection, we thought to serve not only the study of poetry and mythology, but also to let the poetry itself that palpitates in it touch and delight whomsoever it can delight, so that it may serve also as a book of education. For this, we seek not such purity as is obtained by an anxious exclusion of all that bears on certain conditions and relations, such as occur daily and cannot possibly be hidden, which also produces the deception that what is possible in a book can be practiced in real life. We seek purity in the truth of a straightforward narration. Nothing defends us better than nature herself, who has let these plants grow in just this color and form. He whose special needs they may not suit has no right to ask that they should be differently cut and colored, or again, rain and dew fall to benefit all that grows. If anyone does not dare to put his plants under the rain and dew because they are too delicate and might be hurt, if he prefers to give them lukewarm water in the house, yet he must not demand that there shall be no rain and dew. All that is natural may be helpful, and it is at this that we ought to aim. We have been collecting these stories from oral tradition for about thirteen years. If one is accustomed to heed such things, one has more chances than one would suppose. But it was a piece of special good fortune that we made the acquaintance of a peasant woman of Niedersven, a village near Castle, who told us most of the tales in the second volume and the most beautiful of these. Frau Fiemenin was still active and not much over fifty years old. Her features were firm, sensible and agreeable, and she cast clear keen glances from her great eyes. She remembered the old stories exactly, and said herself that this gift was not granted to all, and that many a one could keep nothing in its proper connection. She told her stories deliberately, confidently, with much life and self-satisfaction, first quite naturally, then, if you wished, slowly, so that with a little practice you could take them down. A good deal has been preserved verbally in this way, and will be unmistakable in its truth to nature. One who believes in the easy alteration of tradition, in negligence in guarding it, and hence as a rule in the impossibility of its long continuance, should have heard how exact she always was in her story, and how eager for its accuracy. In repeating, she never changed anything in the substance, and corrected an oversight as soon as she observed it, while she was speaking. As for the way in which we have collected, our first care was for faithfulness and truth. So we have added nothing of our own, have embellished no circumstance or trait in the story, but have rendered its contents just as we received it. 
that the style and development of detail are largely ours is a matter of course, but we have tried to preserve every peculiarity that we noticed, so as to leave in our collection, in this regard also, the endless variety of nature. In this sense, there is, so far as we know, no collection of legends in Germany. Either a few, preserved by chance, have been printed, or they are looked at as raw material from which to form longer stories. Against such treatment, we declare ourselves absolutely. The practiced hand in such reconstructions is like that unhappily gifted hand that turned all it touched, even meat and drink, to gold, and cannot, for all its wealth, still our hunger or quench our thirst. For when mythology, with all its pictures, is to be conjured out of mere imagination, how bare, how empty, how formless does all seem, in spite of the best and strongest words. However, this is said only of such so-called reconstructions as pretend to beautify and poetize the legends, not toward a free appropriation of them for modern and individual purposes. For who would seek to set limits to poetry? We commit these tales to gracious hands, and think the well of the kindly power that lies in them, and wish that our book may be forever hidden from those who grudge these crumbs of poetry to the poor and simple. Castle, July the 3rd, 1819 Little Briar Rose, from Household Tales Long ago there was a king and a queen, they said every day, oh, if we only had a child, and still they never got one. Then it happened, when once the queen was bathing, that a frog crept ashore out of the water and said to her, your wish shall be fulfilled. Before a year passes, you shall bring a daughter into the world. What the frog said happened, and the queen had a little girl that was so beautiful that the king could not contain himself for joy and made a great feast. He invited not only his relatives, friends and acquaintances, but also the wise women that they might be gracious and kind to the child. Now there were thirteen of them in his kingdom, but because he had only twelve gold plates for them to eat from, one of them had to stay at home. The feast was splendidly celebrated, and when it was over, the wise women gave the child their wonderful gifts. One gave her virtue, another beauty, another wealth, and so with everything that people want in the world. But when Eleven had spoken, suddenly the thirteenth came in. She wished to avenge herself because she had not been asked and without greeting or looking at anyone, she cried out, In her fifteenth year the king's daughter shall wound herself on a spindle and fall down dead. And without saying another word, she turned around and left the hall. All were frightened. When the twelfth came up, who had her wish still to give, since she could not remove the sentence but only soften it, she said, Yet it shall not be a real death, but only a hundred years deep sleep into which the king's daughter shall fall. The king, who wanted to save his dear child from harm, sent out an order that all the spindles in the kingdom should be burned. But in the girl, the gifts of the wise women were all fulfilled, for she was so beautiful, good, kind and sensible, that nobody who saw her could help loving her. It happened that just on the day when she was fifteen years old, the king and queen were not at home, and the little girl was left quite alone in the castle. Then she went wherever she pleased, looked in the rooms and chambers, and at last she got to an old tower. She went up the narrow winding stairs and came to a little door. In the keyhole was a rusty key, and when she turned it, the door sprang open, and there in a little room sat an old woman with a spindle and span busily her flax. Good day, auntie, said the king's daughter. What are you doing there? I am spinning, said the old woman and nodded. What sort of a thing is that that jumps about so gaily? said the girl. She took the spindle and wanted to spin too, 
But she had hardly touched the spindle before the spell was fulfilled, and she pricked her finger with it. At the instant she felt the prick, she fell down on the bed that stood there and lay in a deep sleep. And this sleep spread over all the castle. The king and queen, who had just come home and entered the hall, began to go to sleep, and all the courtiers with them. The horses went to sleep in the stalls, the dogs in the yard, the doves on the roof, the flies on the wall. Yes, the fire that was flickering on the hearth grew still and went to sleep, and the roast meat stopped sputtering, and the cook, who was going to take the cook boy by the hair because he had forgotten something, let him go and slept. And the wind was still, and no leaf stirred in the trees by the castle. But all around the castle a hedge of briars grew, that got higher every year, and at last surrounded the whole castle and grew up over it, so that nothing more could be seen of it, not even the flag on the roof. But the story went about in the country of the beautiful sleeping briar rose, for so the king's daughter was called, so that from time to time king's sons came and tried to get through the hedge into the castle. But they could not, for the briars, as though they had hands, clung fast together, and the young man, stuck fast in them, could not get out again and died a wretched death. After long, long years, there came again a king's son to that country, and heard how an old man told about the briar hedge, that there was a castle behind it, in which a wonderfully beautiful king's daughter called Briar Rose had been sleeping for a hundred years, and that the king and the queen and all the court were sleeping with her. He knew too from his grandfather that many king's sons had already come and tried to get through the briar hedge, but had all been caught in it and died a sad death. Then the young man said, I am not afraid, I will go and see the beautiful briar rose. The good old man might warn him as much as he pleased. He did not listen to his words. But now the hundred years were just past, and the day was come when briar rose was to wake again. So when the king's son went up to the briars, they were just great beautiful flowers that opened of their own accord and let him through unheard and behind him they closed together as a hedge again. In the yard he saw the horses and the model towns flying and sleeping. On the roof perched the doves, their heads stuck under their wings. And when he came into the house, the flies were sleeping on the wall. In the kitchen the cook still held up his hand as though to grab the boy, and the maid was sitting before the black hen that was to be plucked. Then he went further, and in the hall he saw all the courtiers lying and sleeping, and upon the throne lay the king and the queen. Then he went further, and all was so still that you could hear yourself breathe, and at last he came to the tower and opened the door of the little room where Briar Rose was sleeping. There she lay, and she was so beautiful that he could not take his eyes off her, and he bent down and gave her a kiss. But just as he touched her with a kiss, Briar Rose opened her eyes, awoke, and looked at him very kindly. Then they went downstairs together, and the king awoke, and the queen, and all the courtiers, and made great eyes at one another, and the horses in the yard got up and shook themselves, the hounds sprang about and wagged their tails, the doves on the roof pulled out their heads from under the wings, looked around and flew into the field. The flies on the wall went on crawling. The fire in the kitchen started up and blazed and cooked the dinner. The roast began to sputter again, and the cook gave the boy such a box on the ear that he screamed, and the maid finished plucking the hen. Then the wedding of the king's son with Briar Rose was splendidly celebrated, and they lived happy till their lives end. Note by the Grimms from Hesse 
The maid who sleeps in the castle, surrounded by a hedge until the right prince releases her, before whom the flowers part, is a sleeping Brunhild, according to the old Norse saga, whom a wall of flame surrounds which Sigurd alone can penetrate to wake her. The spindle on which she pricks herself, and from which she falls asleep, is the slumber thorn with which Odin pricks Brunhild. In the Pentameron it is a flax root, in Perrault, la belle bois dormant. Similar is the sleep of Schneewittchen. The Italian and French stories both have the conclusion that is wanting in the German, but occurs in our fragment of the wicked stepmother. It is noteworthy that in the important deviations of Perrault from Basile, who alone preserves the pretty trait that the nursling sucks the bit of flax from the finger of the sleeping mother, both agree so far as to the names of the children that the twins in the Pentameron are called Sun and Moon, in Perrault, Day and Dawn. These names recall the compounds of Day, Sun and Moon in the genealogy of the Edda. The Three Spinners from the Household Tales There was a lazy girl who would not spin, and her mother might say what she would, she could not make her do it. At last anger and impatience overcame the mother, so that she struck the girl, and at that she began to cry aloud. Now the queen was just driving by, and when she heard the crying, she had the courage to stop, went into the house, and asked the mother why she bet her daughter so that one could hear the crying out on the street. Then the woman was ashamed to confess the laziness of her daughter, and said, I cannot keep her from spinning. She wants to spin all the time, and I am poor, and can't get the flax. Then the queen answered, There is nothing I like to hear so much as spinning, and I am never happier than when the wheels hum. Let me take your daughter to the castle. I have flax enough. There she shall spin as much as she will. The mother was well pleased at it, and the queen took the girl with her. When they came to the castle, she took her up to three rooms, which lay from top to bottom full of the finest flax. Now spin me this flax, she said, and if you finish it, you shall have my eldest son for husband. Though you are poor, I don't mind that. Your cheerful diligence is dowry enough. The girl was secretly frightened, for she could not have spun the flax if she had lived three hundred years, and had sat at it every day from morning till evening. When she was alone she began to cry, and sat so three days without lifting a hand. On the third day the queen came, and when she saw that nothing was spun yet she was surprised. But the girl excused herself by saying that she had not been able to begin on account of her great sorrow at leaving her mother's house. The queen was satisfied with that, but she said as she went away, Tomorrow you must begin to work. When the girl was alone again, she did not know what to think or to do, and in her trouble she went up to the window, and there she saw three women coming along. The first had a broad paddle foot, the second had such a big underlip that it hung down over her chin, and the third had a broad thumb. They stopped before the window, looked up, and asked the girl what was the matter. She told them her trouble. Then they offered her their help and said, If you will invite us to your wedding, not be ashamed of us, and call us your cousins, and seat us at your table too, then we will spin your flax up and that quickly. Gladly, said she, come in and set to work immediately. So she let the three queer women in and cleared a little space in the first room where they could sit down and begin their spinning. One of them drew the thread and trod the wheel, the second wet the thread, the third twisted it and struck with her finger on the table, and as often as she struck, a skein of yarn fell to the floor, and it was of the finest. She hid the three spinners from the queen, and showed her as often as she came the pile of spun yarn, so that the queen could not praise her enough. When the first room was empty, they began on the second, and then on the third, and that was soon cleared up too. Now the three women took their leave and said to the girl, 
Do not forget what you promised us. It will be your good fortune. When the girl showed the queen the empty rooms and the great heap of yarn, she prepared for the wedding, and the bridegroom was delighted to get such a clever and industrious wife and praised her very much. I have three cousins, said the girl, and since they have been very kind to me, I should not like to forget them in my happiness. Permit me to invite them to the wedding and to have them sit with me at the table. The queen and the bridegroom said, why should not we permit it? Now, when the feast began, the three women came in queer dress, and the bride said, Welcome, dear cousins. Oh, said the bridegroom, how did you get such ill-favored friends? Then he went to the one with the broad paddle foot and asked, Where did you get such a broad foot? From the treadle, she answered, from the treadle. Then the bridegroom went to the second and said, Where did you get that hanging lip? From wetting yarn, she said, from wetting yarn. Then he asked the third, Where did you get the broad thumb? From twisting thread, she answered, from twisting thread. Then the king's son was frightened and said, Then my fair bride shall never, never touch a spinning wheel again. And so she was rid of the horror spinning. Note by the Grimms From a tale from the Duchy of Corvey, but that there are three women, each with a peculiar fault due to spinning, is taken from a Hessian story. In the former, there are two very old women who have grown so broad by sitting that they can hardly get into the room. From wetting the thread, they have thick lips, and from pulling and drawing it, ugly fingers and broad thumbs. The Hessian story begins differently, too, namely that a king liked nothing better than spinning, and so, at his farewell before a journey, left his daughters a great chest of flax that was to be spun on his return. To relieve them, the queen invited the three deformed women and put them before the king's eyes on his return. Praetorius, in his Gluckstoff, tells the story thus. A mother cannot make her daughter spin and so often beats her. A man who happens to see it asks what it means. The mother answers, I cannot keep her from spinning. She spins more flax than I can buy. The man answers, then give her to me for wife. I shall be satisfied with her cheerful diligence, though she brings no dowry. The mother is delighted and the bridegroom brings the bride immediately a great provision of flax. She is secretly frightened, but accepts it, puts it in her room, and considers what she shall do. Then three women come to the window, one so broad from sitting that she cannot get in at the door, the second with an immense nose, the third with a broad thumb. They offer their services and promise to spin the task, if the bride on her wedding day will not be ashamed of them, will proclaim them her cousins, and set them at her table. She consents. They spin up the flax, and the lover praises his betrothed. When now the wedding day comes, the three orrid women present themselves. The bride does them honor and calls them cousins. The bridegroom is surprised and asks how she comes by such ill-favored friends. Oh, said the bride, it's by spinning that they have become so deformed. One has such a broad back from sitting, the second has licked her mouth quite off, the forehead nose stands out so, and the third has twisted thread so much with her thumb. Then the bridegroom was troubled and said to the bride she should never spin another thread as long as she lived, that she might not become such a monstrosity. A third tale from the Oberlandsitz by T. Peschek is in Büsching's weekly news. It agrees in general with Pretorius. One of the three old women has sore eyes because the impurities of the flax have got into them, the second has a mouth from ear to ear on account of wetting thread, the third is fat and clumsy by much sitting at the spinning wheel. A part of the story is in Norwegian in Asbjörnsen and in Swedish in Cavallius. 
Mademoiselle l'héritière Rigdin Rigdon agrees in the introduction and the set de colonelle of the pentameron is also connected with this tale. The author to the reader, from the preface to the Deutsche Grammatik. It has cost me no long hesitation to bring back to the stock the first shoots of my granaries. A second growth, firmer and finer, has quickly followed. Perhaps one may hope for flowers and ripening fruit. With joy I give to the public this work, now become more worthy of its attention, that I have carefully tended and brought to this end amid cares and privations, in which labour was sometimes a drudgery, and sometimes, and by God's goodness oftener, my comfort. The fruitfulness of the field is of such a nature that it never fails, and no leaf from the sources can be re-examined that does not arouse by a more distant prospect or make one repent of past errors. If now a rich booty should win me less praise than a many-sided, careful, economical administration of a smaller treasure, the blame may fall on me that I have not known how to draw from all the principles I have discovered the uses of which they were capable and even that important observations sometimes stand in obscure places. Not all my assertions will stand, but by the discoveries of their weakness, other paths will be opened, through which will break at last the truth, the only goal of honest labour, and the only thing that lasts when men have ceased to care for the names of like aspirants. What was hardest for us may be chance played posterity, hardly worth speaking of. Then truth will yield herself to new solutions of which we had yet to hint, and will struggle with obstacles where we thought all made plain. End of section 9, read by Claudia Caldi. Section 10 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 17. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 17. Selected Excerpts from the History of Greece by George Grote. 1794 to 1871. It is a coincidence so striking as almost to put the English university system itself on the defensive, that neither Grote nor Gibbon owed anything to academic training. Gibbon indeed spent fourteen months at Oxford, the most idle and unprofitable of my whole life. George Grote, the son of a London banker, ended his school days at sixteen, when he left the charter house. He had been grounded in Latin by a devoted mother at five years, however, and he took with him to the bank little or no mathematics, an enthusiastic love for metaphysics, classical literature, and history, which proved to be lifelong. From 1810 to 1820, under his father's roof, he devoted his early mornings and evenings to study. His most important older friends were the political economist James Mill, Ricardo, and Bentham, but they did not divert him from historical interests. Even during his long engagement, he guided by letter the education and reading of his future wife, with a constant view to his own far-reaching plans for study and creative work. With Grote's marriage to the brilliant and devoted Harriet Lewin in 1820, began a happier epoch. He had now his own home and a moderate income. Mrs. Grote drew him somewhat into society, travel, and a widened circle of friendship on the continent as well as in London. These digressions only aided what would, else, have been too bookish and secluded a development. Mrs. Grote, however, was mistaken in her recollection that she herself first, in the autumn of 1823, suggested the subject of his chief life work. At least a year previous, the plan for the great history of Greece had been formed. In 1830, his father's death left Mr. Grote abundant wealth. Nevertheless, 
the decade, 1831-41, to 41, which was spent in active political work as the leader in Parliament of the group known as Philosophic Radicals, did indeed reduce his systematic and untiring studies to mere desultory reading, and seemingly endangered his literary career. Yet even this experience, as he himself declares, was of indispensable use to him in comprehending the fierce and democratic politics of ancient Athens. Returning early in 1842 from a brief stay in Italy, now severing altogether his relations with the bank the next year, he now first, in his fiftieth year, devoted his whole strength to his appointed task. His powerful review of Mitford's Greece in 1843 prepared the way for the enthusiastic welcome accorded in 1845 to the first two volumes of his History of Greece. The twelfth and closing volume did not appear until 1856. Some adequate outlines of his life and character are essential to any fair appreciation of Mr. Grote's chief work. Indefatigable as a student, a fearless lover of the truth, widely familiar with men and affairs, a wise philanthropist and far-sighted reformer. Mr. Grote's noble personality gives weight to his every sentence, as an athlete's whole frame and training goes into each blow he strikes. It seems a trifling criticism upon such a man to say he was not a literary artist. This is true indeed, as to his choice of idiom and phrase. He has not that curious felicity which makes us linger lovingly over the very words in which a Plato, a Montaigne, a Burke casts his thoughts. Even in the delineation of a great scene, like the defeat at Syracuse or the downfall of Athens, he is really picturesque. He does not appeal indeed to the youthful imagination, but to the mature judgment. We can well imagine that this calm, even-toned, Judicious voice made itself heard effectively in the debates of the English commons. Of course, no one man can ever write an ideal history of that unique, creative, many-sided Hellenic race. But the work of Mr. Grote is still, a half-century after its creation, indispensable as an account of political institutions among the Greeks. Even here, the thousands of newly discovered inscriptions the fortunate reappearance of Aristotle's treatise on the Athenian constitution and the ceaseless march of special investigation make desirable some fresh annotation upon almost every page. The familiarity with Greek lands and folk, which gives a charm to Professor Curtis's work, is missing from Mr. Groats. Still more do we miss any warm enthusiasm for the Hellenic art which was so indispensable an element in their life. Even their literature is to him less a beautiful organism quivering with life than a source for more or less accurate information. In this and in many other respects, he is curiously like the Athenian student of history and of truth, Thucydides, who could write in the day of Phidias and Sophocles as if he had never heard of a myth or a statue. It is true also that Grote is always an English liberal, finding in every page of history fresh reason for hope and trust in modern democracy. This, indeed, we do not regard as adverse criticism at all. If a man be not actually blinded to truth by narrow prejudices, the more cordially his own convictions color his writings, the greater will be their value and vitality. Posterity will bring more and more human experience to the interpretation of the remote past. They may yet understand Periclean Athens out of their own similar life, infinitely better than our century could do. Like Chapman's or Pope's Homer, Grote's Greece may yet have a value of its own, quite apart from the question of its truthfulness to Hellenic antiquity, as a monument of Victorian England. To us, however, it is still the largest, truest, most adequate general picture yet drawn of Hellas, from the days of Homer to the time of Alexander. Hardly less intense was Mr. Grote's interest in the Greek philosophy. The chapters on Socrates and on the Sophist are perhaps the ablest and the most original in the history, 
Moreover, as soon as that great work was completed, he began the series of treatises on the philosophic schools, which was an indispensable portion of his task. The three volumes on Plato and his companions, however, did not appear until 1865, and of the great projected work on Aristotle, only a small segment took shape before death overtook the noble, generous old scholar. His wife long survived him, and her personal life of George Grote, despite numerous minor lapses of memory, is one of the most valuable books in its class. The important article of Mr. Grote in the Dictionary of National Biography by Professor Robertson is based in part on intimate personal acquaintance. Mr. Grote's minor works are all mentioned there. Least known of all to the general public is a small volume of poems. These were printed privately by his widow in 1872 and were chiefly written during his courtship, which was unduly prolonged and embittered by parental opposition. We intentionally reserve for a final detail this especially appealing human experience of the statesman, metaphysician, and historian. The death, character, and work of Alexander the Great from A History of Greece The intense sorrow felt by Alexander for the death of Hephaestion, not merely an attached friend, but of the same age and exuberant vigor as himself, laid his mind open to gloomy forebodings from numerous omens, as well as to jealous mistrust even of his oldest officers. Antipater, especially, no longer protected against the calumnies of Olympias by the support of Hephaestion, fell more and more into discredit, whilst his son Cassander, who had recently come into Asia with the Macedonian reinforcement, underwent from Alexander during irascible moments much insulting violence. In spite of the dissuasive warming of the Chaldean priests, Alexander had been persuaded to distrust their sincerity, and had entered Babylon, though not without hesitation and uneasiness. However, when after having entered the town, he went out of it again safely on his expedition for the survey of the lower Euphrates, he conceived himself to have exposed them as deceitful alarmists, and returned to the city with increased confidence for the obsequies of his deceased friend. The sacrifices connected with these obsequies were on the most prodigious scale. Victims enough were offered to furnish a feast for the army, who also received ample distributions of wine. Alexander presided in person at the feast and abandoned himself to conviviality like the rest. Already full of wine, he was persuaded by his friend Medius to sup with him and to pass the whole night in yet further drinking with the boisterous indulgence called by the Greeks comus or revelry. Having slept off his intoxication during the next day, he in the evening again supped with Medius, and spent the second night in the like unmeasured indulgence. It appears that he already had the seeds of a fever upon him, which was so fatally aggravated by his intemperance that he was too ill to return to his palace. He took the bath and slept in the house of Medius. On the next morning he was unable to rise, after having been carried out on a couch to celebrate sacrifice, which was his daily habit. He was obliged to lie in bed all day. Nevertheless, he summoned the generals to his presence, prescribing all the details of the impending expedition, and ordering that the land force should begin its march on the fourth day following, while the fleet, with himself aboard, would sail on the fifth day. In the evening, he was carried on a couch across the Euphrates into a garden on the other side, where he bathed and rested for the night. The fever still continued, so that in the morning, after bathing and being carried out to perform the sacrifices, he remained on his couch all day, talking and playing at dice with Medius. In the evening, he bathed, sacrificed again, and ate a light supper, but endured a bad night with increased fever. The next two days passed in the same manner, the fever becoming worse and worse. Nevertheless, Alexander still summoned Nearchus to his bedside, discussed with him many points about his maritime projects, and repeated his order that the fleet should be ready by the third day. On the ensuing morning, the fever was violent, 
Alexander reposed all day in a bathing house in the garden, yet still calling in the generals to direct the filling up of vacancies among the officers and ordering that the armament should be ready to move. Throughout the next two days, his malady became hourly more aggravated. On the second of the two, Alexander could with difficulty support the being lifted out of bed to perform the sacrifice. Even then, however, he continued to give orders to the generals about the expedition. On the morrow, though desperately ill, he still made the effort requisite for performing the sacrifice. He was then carried across from the garden house to the palace, giving orders that the generals and officers should remain in permanent attendance in and near the hall. He caused some of them to be called to his bedside, but though he knew them perfectly, he had by this time become incapable of utterance. One of his last words spoken is said to have been on being asked to whom he bequeathed his kingdom. To the strongest, one of his last acts was to take the signet ring from his finger and hand it to Perdiccas. For two nights and a day he continued in this state, without either amendment or repose. Meanwhile, the news of his malady had spread through the army, filling them with grief and consternation. Many of the soldiers, eager to see him once more, forced their way into the palace and were admitted unarmed. They passed along by the bedside with all the demonstrations of affliction and sympathy. Alexander knew them and made show of friendly recognition as well as he could, but was unable to say a word. Several of the generals slept in the temple of Serapis, hoping to be informed by the god in a dream whether they ought to bring Alexander into it as a suppliant to experience the divine healing power. The god informed them in their dream that Alexander not to be brought into the temple, that it would be better for him to be left where he was. In the afternoon, he expired, June 323 B.C., after a life of 32 years and 8 months, and a reign of 12 years and 8 months. The death of Alexander, thus suddenly cut off by a fever in the plenitude of health, vigor, and aspirations, was an event impressive as well as important in the highest possible degree, to his contemporaries far and near. When the first report of it was brought to Athens, the orator Demides exclaimed, It cannot be true. If Alexander were dead, the whole habitable world would have smelt of his carcass. This coarse but emphatic comparison illustrates the immediate, powerful, and wide-reaching impression produced by the sudden extinction of the great conqueror. It was felt by each of the many remote envoys who had so recently come to propitiate this far-shooting Apollo. By every man among the nations who had sent these envoys, throughout Europe, Asia, and Africa, as then known, to affect either his actual condition or his probable future. The first growth and development of Macedonia during the 22 years preceding the Battle of Geronia, from an embarrassed secondary state into the first of all known powers, had excited the astonishment of contemporaries and admiration for Philip's organizing genius. But the achievements of Alexander during his twelve years of reign, throwing Philip into the shade, had been on a scale so much grander and vaster, and so completely without serious reverse or even interruption, as to transcend the measure not only of human expectation, but almost of human belief. The great king, as the king of Persia was called by excellence, was, and had long been, the type of worldly power and felicity, even down to the time when Alexander crossed the Hellespont. Within four years and three months from this event, by one stupendous defeat after another, Darius had lost all his western empire and had become a fugitive eastward of the Caspian gates, escaping activity at the hands of Alexander, only to perish by those of the satrap Bessus. All antecedent historical parallels the ruin and captivity of the Lydian Croesus, the expulsion and mean life of the Syracusan Dionysius, both of them impressive examples of the mutability of human condition, sank into trifles compared with the overthrow of this towering Persian colossus. The orator Eschines 
expressed the genuine sentiment of a Grecian spectator when he exclaimed, in a speech delivered at Athens shortly before the death of Darius, What is there among the list of strange and unexpected events that has not occurred in our time? Our lives have transcended the limits of humanity. We are born to serve as a thing for incredible tales to posterity. Is not the Persian king, who dug through Athos and bridged the Hellespont, who demanded earth and water from the Greeks, who dared to proclaim himself in public epistles master of all mankind from the rising to the setting sun? Is not he now struggling to the last, not for dominion over others, but for the safety of his own person? Such were the sentiments excited by Alexander's career. Even in the middle of 330 B.C., more than seven years before his death, during the following seven years, his additional achievements had carried astonishment yet farther. He had mastered, in defiance of fatigue, hardship, and combat, not merely all the eastern half of the Persian Empire, but unknown Indian regions beyond its easternmost limits. Besides Macedonia, Greece, and Thrace, he possessed all that immense treasure and military force which had once rendered the great king so formidable. But no contemporary man had any such power ever been known or conceived. With the turn of imagination then prevalent, many were doubtless disposed to take him for a god on earth, as Grecian spectators had once supposed with regard to Xerxes, when they beheld the innumerable Persian host crossing the Hellespont. Exalted to this prodigious grandeur, Alexander was at the time of his death little more than thirty-two years old, the age which a citizen of Athens was growing into important commands, ten years less than the age for a consul at Rome, two years younger than the age at which Timur first acquired the crown and began his foreign conquests. His extraordinary bodily powers were unabated. He had acquired a large stock of military experience, and what was still more important, his appetite for further conquest was as voracious, and his readiness to purchase it at the largest cost of toil or danger as complete as it had been when he first crossed the Hellespont. Great as his past career had been, his future achievements— with such increased means and experience, were likely to be yet greater. His ambition would have been satisfied with nothing less than the conquest of the whole habitable world as then known. And if his life had been prolonged, he would probably have accomplished it. Nowhere, so far as our knowledge reaches, did there reside any military power capable of making head against him. Nor were his soldiers, when he commanded them, daunted or baffled by any extremity of cold, heat, or fatigue. The patriarch feelings of Livy disposed him to maintain that Alexander, had he invaded Italy and assailed Romans or Samnites, would have failed and perished like his relative Alexander of Epirus. But this conclusion cannot be accepted. If we grant the courage and discipline of the Roman infantry to have been equal to the best infantry of Alexander's army, the same cannot be said of the Roman cavalry, as compared with the Macedonian companions. Still less is it likely that a Roman consul, annually changed, would have been found a match for Alexander in military genius and combinations, nor, even if personally equal, would he have possessed the same variety of troops and arms, each effective in its separate way and all conspiring to one common purpose nor the same unbounded influence over their minds in stimulating them to full effort. I do not think that even the Romans could have successfully resisted Alexander the Great, though it is certain that he never threw out all his long marches and counted such enemies as they, nor even such as Samnites and Lucanians, combining courage, patriotism, discipline with effective arms both for defense and for close combat. Among all the qualities which go to constitute the highest military excellence, either as a general or as a soldier, none was wanting in the character of Alexander. Together with his own chivalrous courage, sometimes indeed both excessive and unseasonable, so as to form the only military defect which can be fairly imputed to him, 
We trace in all his operations the most careful dispositions taken beforehand, vigilant precaution in guarding against possible reverse, an abundant resource in adapting himself to new contingencies. Amidst constant success, these precautionary combinations were never discontinued. His achievements are the earliest recorded evidence of scientific military organization on a large scale and of its overwhelming effects. Alexander overawes the imagination more than any other personage of antiquity. By the matchless development of all that constitutes effective force, as an individual warrior and as organizer and leader of armed masses, not merely the blind impetuosity ascribed by Homer to Ares, but also the intelligent methodized and all-subduing compression which he personifies in Athena. But all his great qualities were fit for use only against enemies, in which category indeed were numbered all mankind, known and unknown, except those who chose to submit to him. In his Indian campaigns, amidst tribes of utter strangers, we perceive not only those who stand on their defense, but also those who abandon their property and flee to the mountains, are alike pursued and slaughtered. Apart from the transcendent merits of Alexander as a soldier and a general, some authors give him credit for grand and beneficent views on the subject of imperial government and for intentions highly favorable to the improvement of mankind. I see no ground for adopting this opinion, as far as we can venture to anticipate what would have been Alexander's future, we see nothing in prospect except years of ever-repeated aggression and conquest, not to be concluded until he had traversed and subjugated all the inhabited globe. The acquisition of universal dominion, conceived not metaphorically but literally, and conceived with greater facility in consequence of the imperfect geographical knowledge of the time was the master passion of his soul. At the moment of his death, he was commencing fresh aggression in the south against the Arabians, to an indefinite extent, while his vast projects against the western tribes in Africa and Europe, as far as the pillars of Heracles, were consigned in the orders and memoranda confidentially communicated to Craterus. Italy, Gaul, and Spain would have been successfully attacked and conquered, the enterprises proposed to him when in Bactria by the Coromassian prince Faramanes, but postponed then until a more convenient season would have been next taken up, and he would have marched from the Danube northward round the Euxin and Pallas Meotis against the Scythians and the tribes of Caucasus. They remained moreover the Asiatic regions east of the Hyphysis which his soldiers had refused to enter upon, but which he certainly would have invaded at a future opportunity, were it only to efface the poignant humiliation of having been compelled to relinquish his proclaimed purpose. Though this sounds like romance and hyperbole, it was nothing more than the real insatiate aspiration of Alexander, who looked upon every new acquisition mainly as a capital for acquiring more. You are a man like all of us, Alexander, said the naked Indian to him, except that you abandon your home like a meddlesome destroyer, to invade the most distant regions, enduring hardship yourself and inflicting hardship upon others. Now, how an empire thus boundless and heterogeneous, such as no prince has ever yet realized, could have been administered with any superior advantages to subjects, it would be difficult to show. The mere task of acquiring and maintaining, of keeping satraps and tribute gatherers in authority, as well as subordination, of suppressing resistances ever liable to recur, in regions distant by months of march, would occupy the whole life of a world conqueror, without leaving any leisure for the improvements suited to peace and stability, if we give him credit for such purposes in theory. But even this last is more than can be granted. Alexander's acts indicate that he desired nothing better than to take up the traditions of the Persian Empire, a tribute-levying and army-levying system, under Macedonians in large proportion as his instruments, 
yet partly also unto the very same Persians who had administered before, provided they submitted to him. It has indeed been extolled among his merits that he was thus willing to reappoint Persian grandees, putting their armed force, however, under the command of a Macedonian officer, and to continue native princes in their dominions, if they did willing homage to him as tributary subordinates. But all this had been done before him by the Persian kings, whose system it was to leave the conquered princes undisturbed, subject only to the payment of tribute, and to the obligation of furnishing a military contingent one required. In like manner, Alexander's Asiatic empire would thus have been composed of an aggregate of satrapies and dependent principalities, furnishing money and soldiers, in other respects left to the discretion of local rule, with occasional extreme inflictions of punishment, but no systematic examination or control. Upon this, the condition of Asiatic empire in all ages, Alexander would have crafted one special improvement, the military organization of the empire, feeble under the escimated princes, would have been greatly strengthened by his genius and by the able officers formed in his school, both for foreign aggression and for home control. In respect of intelligence and combining genius, Alexander was Hellenic to the full. In respect of disposition and purpose, no one could be less Hellenic. The acts attesting his oriental violence of impulse unmeasured self-will, an exaction of reverence above the limits of humanity, have been already recounted. To describe him as a son of Hellas, imbued with the political maxims of Aristotle and bent on the systematic diffusion of Hellenic culture for the improvement of mankind, is in my judgment an estimate of his character contrary to the evidence. Alexander is indeed said to have invited suggestions from Aristotle, as to the best mode of colonizing, but his temper altered so much after a few years of Asiatic conquest that he came not only to lose all deference for Aristotle's advice, but even to hate him bitterly. Moreover, though the philosopher's full suggestions have not been preserved, yet we are told generally that he recommended Alexander to behave to the Greeks as a leader or president or limited chief and to the barbarians non-Hellenes, as a master, a distinction substantially coinciding with that pointed out by Burke in his speeches at the beginning of the American War, between the principles of government proper to be followed by England in the American colonies and in British India. No Greek thinker believed the Asiatics to be capable of that free civil polity upon which the march of every Grecian community was based. Aristotle did not wish to degrade the Asiatics below the level to which they had been accustomed, but rather to preserve the Greeks from being degraded to the same level. Now Alexander recognized no such distinction as that drawn by his preceptor. He treated Greeks and Asiatics alike, not by elevating the latter, but by degrading the former. Though he employed all indiscriminately as instruments, yet he presently found the free speech of Greeks and even of Macedonians so distasteful and offensive that his preferences turned more and more in favor of the servile Asiatic sentiment and customs. Instead of Hellenizing Asia, he was tending to Asiatize Macedonia and Hellas. His temper and character, as modified by a few years of conquest, rendered him quite unfit to follow the course recommended by Aristotle towards the Greeks, quite as unfit as any of the Persian kings, or as the French emperor Napoleon, to endure that partial frustration, compromise, and smart from free criticism, which is inseparable from the position of a limited chief. Among a multitude of subjects more diverse colored than even the army of Xerxes, it is quite possible that he might have turned his power towards the improvement of the rudest portions. We are told, though the fact is difficult to credit from his want of time, that he abolished various barbarisms of the Hyrcanians, Aracosians, and Sardinians. But Macedonians as well as Greeks would have been pure losers by being absorbed into an immense Asiatic aggregate. 
this process of Hellenizing Asia, insofar as Asia was ever Hellenized, which has often been ascribed to Alexander, was in reality the work of the Diadolki, who came after him, though his conquest doubtless opened the door and established the military ascendancy, which rendered such a work practicable. The position, the aspirations, and the interests of these Diadolki, Antigenes, Ptolemy, Seleucus, Lysimachus, etc., were materially different from those of Alexander. They had neither appetite nor means, but new and remote conquest. Their great rivalry was with each other. Each sought to strengthen himself near home against the rest. It became a matter of fashion and pride with them, not less than of interest, to found new cities immortalizing their family names. These foundations were chiefly made in the regions of Asia near and known to Greeks, where Alexander had planted none. Thus the great and numerous foundations of Seleucus Nicator and his successors covered Syria, Mesopotamia, and parts of Asia Minor. All these regions were known to Greeks and more or less tempting to new Grecian immigrants, not out of reach or hearing of the Olympic and other festivals, as the Gisardes and the Indus were. In this way, a considerable influx of new Hellenic blood was poured into Asia during the century succeeding Alexander, probably in great measure from Italy and Sicily, where the condition of the Greek cities became more and more calamitous. Besides the numerous Greeks who took service as individuals under these Asiatic kings, Greeks and Macedonian speaking Greek became predominant, if not in numbers, at least in importance, throughout most of the cities in Western Asia. In particular, the Macedonian military organization, discipline, and administration were maintained systematically among these Asiatic kings. In the account of the Battle of Magnesia, fought by the Seleucid king Antiochus the Great against the Romans in 190 BC, the Macedonian phalanx, constituted the main force of his Asiatic army, appears in all its completeness, just as it stood under Philip and Perseus in Macedonia itself. Moreover, besides this, there was the still more important fact of the many new cities founded in Asia by the Seleucidae and the other contemporary kings. Each of these cities had a considerable infusion of Greek and Macedonian citizens among the native Orientals located here, often brought by compulsion from neighboring villages. In what numerical ratio these two elements of the civic population stood to each other, we cannot say. But the Greeks and Macedonians were the leading and active portion, who exercised the greatest assimilating force, gave imposing, in fact, to the public manifestations of religion, had wider views and sympathies, dealt with the central government, and carried on that contracted measure of municipal autonomy which the city was permitted to retain. In these cities, the Greek inhabitants, though debarred from political freedom, enjoyed a range of social activities suited to their tastes. In each, Greek was the language of public business and dealing. Each formed a center of attraction and commerce for an extensive neighborhood. Altogether, they were the main Hellenic or quasi-Hellenic element in Asia under the Greco-Asiatic kings, as contrasted with the rustic villages, where native manners and probably native speech still continued with little modification. But the Greeks of Antioch, or Alexandria, or Seleucia, were not like citizens of Athens or Thebes, nor even like men of Tarentum or Ephesus. While they communicated their language to Orientals, they became themselves substantially Orientalized. Their feelings, judgments, and habits of action ceased to be Hellenic. Polybius, when he visited Alexandria, looked with surprise and aversion on the Greeks there resident, though they were superior to the non-Hellenic population, whom he considered worthless. Greek social habits, festivals, and legends passed with the Hellenic settlers into Asia all becoming amalgamated and transformed so as to suit a new Asiatic abode. 
Important social and political consequences turned upon the diffusion of the language and upon the establishment of such a common medium of communication throughout Western Asia. But after all, the Hellenized Asiatic was not so much a Greek as a foreigner with Grecian speech, exterior varnish, and superficial manifestations, distinguished fundamentally from those Greek citizens with whom the present history has been concerned. So he would have been considered by Sophocles, by Thucydides, by Socrates. We read that Alexander felt so much interest in the extension of science that he gave to Aristotle the immense sum of 800 talents in money, placing under his directions several thousand men for the purpose of prosecuting zoological researches. These exaggerations are probably the work of those enemies of the philosopher who decried him as a pensioner of the Macedonian court. But it is probable enough that Philip and Alexander in the early part of his reign may have helped Aristotle in the difficult process of getting together facts and specimens for observation, from esteem towards him personally rather than from interest in his discoveries. The intellectual turn of Alexander was towards literature, poetry, and history. He was fond of the Iliad especially, as well as of the Attic tragedians, so that Harpalus, being directed to send some books to him in Upper Asia, selected as the most acceptable packet various tragedies of Aeschylus, Sophocles, and Euripides, with the dithyramic poems of Testes and the histories of Philistus. The Rise of Cleon from the History of Greece Upon the great increase of trade and population in Athens and Piraeus during the last forty years, a new class of politicians seems to have grown up. Men engaged in various descriptions of trade and manufacture who began to rival more or less in importance the ancient families of Attic proprietors. This change was substantially analogous to that which took place in the cities of medieval Europe, when the merchants and traders of the various guilds gradually came to compete with, and ultimately supplanted, the patrician families in whom the supremacy had originally resided. In Athens, persons of ancient family and station enjoyed at this time no political privilege, and since the reforms of Ephelitus and Pericles, the political constitution had become thoroughly democratical. But they still continued to form the two highest classes in the Salonian census founded on property. The Pentacom Simeo de Mini and the Hepis or Knights, an individual Athenian of this class, though without any legal title to preference, yet when he stood forward as candidate for political influence, continued to be decidedly preferred and welcomed by the social sentiment of Athens, which preserved in its spontaneous sympathies distinctions effaced from the political code. Besides this place, ready prepared for him in the public sympathy, especially advantageous at the outset of political life, he found himself further borne up by the family connections, associations of political clubs, etc., which exercised very great influence both on the politics and the judicature of Athens, and of which he became a member as a matter of course. Such advantages were doubtless only auxiliary, carrying a man up to a certain point of influence, but leaving him to achieve the rest by his own personal qualities and capacity. But their effect was nevertheless very real, and those who, without possessing them, met and buffeted him in the public assembly, contended against great disadvantages. A person of such low or middling station obtained no favorable presumptions or indulgence on the part of the public to meet him halfway, nor had he established connections to encourage first successes or help him out of early scrapes. He found others already in possession of ascendancy and well disposed to keep down new competitors so that he had to win his own way unaided. From the first step to the last, by qualities personal to himself, by assiduity of attendance, by acquaintance with business, by powers of striking speech, and withal by unflinching audacity, indispensable to enable him to bear up against that opposition and enmity, which he would incur from the high-born politicians and organized party clubs, 
as soon as he appeared to be rising up into ascendancy. The free march of political and judicial affairs raised up several such men during the years beginning and immediately preceding the Peloponnesian War. Even during the lifetime of Pericles, they appear to have arisen in greater or less numbers, but the personal ascendancy of that great man, who combined an aristocratical position with a strong and genuine democratical sentiment and an enlarged intellect, rarely found attached to either, impressed a peculiar character on Athenian politics. The Athenian world was divided into his partisans and his opponents, among each of whom there were individuals high-born and low-born, though the aristocratical party properly so-called the majority of wealthy and high-born Athenians either opposed or disliked him. It is about two years after his death that we begin to hear of a new class of politicians. Among them all, the most distinguished was Cleon, son of Cleonidas. Cleon acquired his first importance among the speakers against Pericles, so that he would thus obtain for himself, during his early political career, the countenance of the numerous and aristocratical anti-Pericleans. He is described by Thucydides, in general terms, as a person of the most violent temper and character in Athens, as being dishonest in his calumnies and virulent in his invective and accusation. Aristophanes, in his comedy of the Knights, reproduces these features, with others new and distinct, as well as with exaggerated details, comic, satirical, and contemptuous. His comedy depicts Cleon in the point of view in which he would appear to the knights of Athens, a leather dresser, smelling of the tan yard, a low-born brawler, terrifying opponents by the violence of his criminations, the loudness of his voice, the impudence of his gestures. Moreover, as venal in his politics, threatening men with accusations and then receiving money to withdraw them, a robber of the public treasury, persecuting merit as well as rank, and courting the favor of the assembly by the basest and most guilty cajolery. The general attributes set forth by Thucydides, apart from Aristophanes, who does not profess to write history, we may well respect the powerful and violent invective of Cleon, often dishonest, together with his self-confidence and audacity in the public assembly. Men of the middling class, like Cleon and Hyperbolus, who persevered in addressing the public assembly and trying to take a leading part in it against persons of greater family pretension than themselves, were pretty sure to be men of more than usual audacity. Had they not possessed this quality, they would never have surmounted the opposition made to them. We may well believe that they had it to a displeasing excess, and even if they had not, the same measure of self-assumption which in Achabides would be tolerated from his rank and station would in them pass for insupportable impudence. Unhappily, we have no specimens to enable us to appreciate the invective of Cleon. We cannot determine whether it was more virulent than that of Demosthenes and Eschines, seventy years afterwards. Each of those eminent orators, imputing to the other the grossest impudence, calumny, perjury, corruption, loud voice, and revolting audacity of manner, in language which Cleon can hardly have surpassed in intensity of vituperation, though he doubtless fell immeasurably short of it in classical finish. Nor can we even tell in what degree Cleon's denunciations of the veteran Pericles were fiercer than those memorable invectives against the old age of Sir Robert Walpole with which Lord Chatham's political career opened. His personal hold on the public assembly had grown into a sort of ascendancy, which Thucydides describes by saying that Cleon was, at that time, by far the most persuasive speaker in the eyes of the people. The fact of Cleon's great power of speech and his capacity of handling public business is a popular manner, is better attested than anything else respecting him because it depends upon two witnesses both hostile to him, Thucydides and Aristophanes. The assembly and the dicastery were Cleon's theater and holding ground, for the Athenian people taken collectively in their place of meeting, 
and the Athenian people taken individually were not always the same person and had not the same mode of judgment. Demos sitting in the fix was a different man from Demos at home. The lofty combination of qualities possessed by Pericles exercised ascendancy over both one and the other. But the qualities of Cleon swayed considerably the former without standing high in the esteem of the latter. End of section 10. Section 11 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 17. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 17. Selected excerpts by Eugenie. 1805 to 1848, and Maurice, 1810 to 1839, de Guerin. This remarkable brother and sister might have been written the words, they were lovely and pleasant in their lives, and in their death they were not divided. We were, says Eugenie, two eyes looking out of one head. Their history as well as their literary work is left in the form of journals and letters, not written for publication. These are most intimate records of their characters and spirits. Eugenie and George Maurice de Guerin were born in the old chateau of Cayley, Languedoc, of a noble but impoverished family. Eugenie, the oldest of four children in 1805, and Maurice, the youngest, August 5, 1810. On the death of their mother, Eugenie assumed care of the delicate brother to whom her life was thenceforth devoted, to a desolate home where sorrow and an austere religion held sway. The morbid note of Maurice's impressionable nature must be attributed. He went to school in Toulouse, spent five years in college, joined in 1832 the famous Lamennais in his monastic retreat at La Chanelle and finally went to Paris to seek fame by literary work. Here he taught, wrote, and married, dying at the early age of 29, on July 19, 1839. In 1840, Madame George Sand wrote out in the Revue des Deux Mondes his principal composition, Le Centaur. Maurice was a dreamer from his infancy, possessed of a melancholy spirit and a wonderful insight into nature's physical and mystical beauties. He has a truly interpretive faculty, says Matthew Arnold, the most profound and delicate sense of the life of nature, and the most exquisite felicity in finding expressions to render that sense. We may divide his life into two periods, the first under the influence of Lemonet at Le Chenet, where so much of his journal was written, and the second in Paris, where he soon became, St. Bert tells us, a man of the world, elegant, even fashionable, a conversationalist who could hold his own against the most brilliant talkers of Paris. To the first period belongs the greater part of his journal, upon which, with the centaur, his fame rests, for his verses possessed little value. Of the suggestions of landscapes in the journal, St. Bert says, they are delicate, they are felt and painted at the same time. They are painted from nearby on the spot, according to nature, but without crudeness. There is no trace of the palette. The colors have their original freshness and truth, and also a certain tenderness. They have passed into the mirror of the inner man and are seen by reflection. One finds in them, above all, expression, and they breathe the very soul of things. Maurice de Guerin describes his own life as made up of serious projects ever-changing and of permanent but idle dreams, of long intoxications of the fancy and of almost absurd contests between my will and my soul, which is independent and as light in flight as a wild creature, while in the most sensitive and hidden depths of my being there is always acute suffering or dull discomfort according as the disorder increases or diminishes. 
Here then, he gives us the keynote to his life and writings. Morbid introspection combined with a rare poetic fancy, and it is largely owing to this combination that the journal is an interesting psychological study. The centaur was suggested by a visit to the Musée des Antiques with his friend Tributian, and is masterly in its conception of that strange imaginative borderland between animal and human life. This being, but taking equally of both these lives, is supposed to stand in his melancholy old age on the summit of a mountain while he relates to an inquisitive mortal the history of his youth. Saint Beuve considers Eugenie de Guerin of equal rank with her brother, but Matthew Arnold, in his Essays in Criticism, says that Eugenie's words are but intellectual signs, not symbols of nature like Maurice's. They bring the notion of the thing described to the mind. They do not bring the feeling of it to the imagination. The literary interest in Eugenie centers also in her journal. Her life was passed at Lake Hela, in the simple routine of household duties and neighborhood charities. Once only she went to Paris on the occasion of her brother's marriage. She was intensely religious and spent much time in prayer, meditation, and preparation for death. Despite her pleasure in the beauty of nature and in the trivial incidents of her daily life, she was subject to the moods of morbid depression noted in Maurice. She condemns this, calling it languor, ennui, or weariness. Of course, the Roman Catholic Eugenie de Guerin is ignorant of Puritan dogma. But allowing for her poetic temperament and tenderness, her rigid asceticism is strangely identical with Puritanism. Everything that gives her pleasure seems to her self-indulgent, even writing. She says, I have renounced poetry because I have seen that God did not ask it of me. But the sacrifice has been so much the more painful as in abandoning poetry. Poetry has not abandoned me. Again, she writes, Shall I tell you why I gave up the journal? Because I find the time lost that I spend in writing. We owe an account of our minutes to God. And is it not making a bad use of them to employ them in tracing the days that are departing? Would to God that my thoughts, my spirit, had never taken their flight beyond the narrow ground in which it is my lot to live. In spite of all that, People say to the contrary, I feel that I cannot go beyond my needlework and my spinning without going too far. I feel it. I believe it. Well, then, I will keep in my proper sphere. However much I am tempted, my spirit shall not be allowed to occupy itself with great matters until it occupies itself with them in heaven. And Maurice writes, So long as the wind wafts me from time to time, whiffs of wild fragrance, and my ear catches distant accents of the melodies of nature, what shall I have to regret? Does the spider, which at eventide, hang suspended on its thread between two leaves, concern itself with the flight of the eagle and the pinions of the birds? And does the imagination of the bird, as it broods over its nestlings, while sheltered beneath some bush, regret the caprices of its liberty and the soft undulations of its flight through the airy heights. Never have I had the freedom of the bird, nor has my thought ever been as happy as its wings. Then let us sleep in resignation, as does the bird in its nest. Maurice was the one thought of Eugenie's life in all her journal is addressed to him. Two days after his death she writes, no, my dear, death shall not part us, shall not remove you from my thoughts. Death only separates our bodies. The soul, instead of being there, is in heaven, and the change of abodes takes nothing away from its affections. Far from it, I trust one loves better in heaven, where all becomes divine. Determined that the world should know Maurice, she wrote to his friends and prepared a memoir for his works. Yet she died on May 31st, 1848, before their publication. St. Beuve made her the subject of a glossary de Lundy, and Trebuchian,
published her Relique at Cain, 1855. In 1862, this tribute appeared of public circulation, was crowned by the French Academy, and passed through 16 editions in eight months. From the Journal of Eugenie de Guerin Christmas has come, the beautiful festival, the one I love most, that gives me the same joy that it gave the shepherds of Bethlehem. In real truth, one's whole soul sings with joy this beautiful coming of God upon earth, a coming which here is announced on all sides of us by music and by our charming Natalette. Footnote, chimes, and a footnote. Nothing at Paris can give you a notion of what Christmas is with us. You have not even the midnight mass. We all of us went to it, Papa at our head, on the most perfect night possible. Never was there a finer sky than ours, was that midnight, so fine that Papa kept perpetually throwing back the hood of his cloak that he might look up at the sky. The ground was white with hoarfrost, but we were not cold. Besides, the air, as we met it, was worn by the bundles of blazing torchwood which our servants carried in front of us to light us on our way. It was delightful, I do assure you, and I should like you to have seen us there on our road to church, in those lanes with the bushes along their banks as white as if they were in flower. The hoarfrost makes the most lovely flowers. We saw a long spray, so beautiful that we wanted to take it with us as a garland for the communion table. But it melted in our hands. All flowers fade so soon. I was very sorry about my garland. It was mournful to see it drip away and get smaller and smaller every minute. Oh, how pleasant it is when the rain is dropping from the sky with a soft sound to sit by one's fire holding the tongs and making sparks. That was my pastime just now. I am fond of it. The sparks are so pretty. They are the flowers of the hearth. Verily, charming things take place in the embers, and when I am not busy, I am amused with the phantasmagoria of the fireplace. There are a thousand little forms in the ashes that come and go, grow bigger, change, and vanish. Sometimes angels, horned demons, Children, old women, butterflies, dogs, sparrows, everything may be seen under the logs. I remember a figure with an air of heavenly suffering that seemed to me what a soul might be in purgatory. I was struck and wished an artist had been near me. Never was vision more perfect. Watch the embers and you will agree that there are beautiful things there and that unless one was blind, one need never be weary by the fire. Be sure you listen to the little whistling that comes out of the embers, like a voice of song. Nothing can be sweeter or purer. It is like the singing of some tiny spirit of the fire. These, my dear, are my evenings and their delights, and sleep, which is not the slightest. You will like to hear that I have just passed a nice quarter of an hour on the terrace steps, sitting by a poor old woman who was singing me a lamentable ballad on an incident that once happened at Cahuzac. It was apropos of a gold cross that was stolen off the Holy Virgin's neck. The old woman recollects her grandmother's telling her she had heard that there had been a still more sacrilegious robbery in the same church, namely of the host itself. One day, when it was left alone in the chancel, it was a girl who, while everybody was at harvest, went to the altar and, climbing upon it, put the monstrance into her apron and placed it under a wild rose in the wood. The shepherds who found it accused her, and nine priests came in procession to adore the holy sacrament of the rose bush and carry it back to the wood. But the poor shepherdess was taken, tried, and condemned to be burned. Just before her death, she asked to confess and owned her theft to the priest, saying that she was not a thief, but she wanted to have the holy sacrament in the forest. I thought that Le Bon Dieu would be as well pleased under a rosebush as on an altar. At these words, an angel descended from heaven to announce her pardon and console the guilty saint, 
who nevertheless was burned on a pile of which the wild rose formed the first faggot. There is the story of the beggar, to whom I listened as to a nightingale. I thanked her heartily and offered her something as a recompense for her ditty. But she would only take flowers. Give me a bow with that beautiful lilac. I gave her four, as large as plumes, and the poor creature went off, her stick in one hand and her nosegay in the other, and left me her ballad. Never have I seen a more beautiful effect of light on the paper. But does not God make beauty for all the world? All our birds were singing this morning whilst I was praying. The accompaniment delights, though it distracts me. I stop to listen. Then I resume with the thought that the birds and I are caroling our hymns to God. And these little creatures sing, perhaps, better than I. But the charm of prayer the charm of communion with God, they cannot taste. We must have a soul to feel that. I have this happiness above theirs. Today, and now for a long time, I am tranquil, peace in head and heart, a state of grace for which I bless God. My window is open. How calm it is. All the little noises outside come to me. I love that of the stream. Now I hear a church clock and the little pendulum which answers it. This sound of hours in the distance and in the room has in the night something mysterious. I think of the Trappists who wake to pray, of the sick who count all the hours of their suffering, of the afflicted who weep, of the dead who sleep still and frozen in their beds. From the journal of Maurice de Guerin. It has been raining. Nature is fresh and radiant. The earth seems to taste with rapture the water which brings it life. One would say that the throats of the birds had also been refreshed by the rain. Their song is purer, more vivacious, more brilliant, and vibrates wonderfully in the air, which has become more sonorous and resounding. The nightingales, the bullfinches, the blackbirds, the thrushes, the golden orioles, the finches, the wrens, all these sing and rejoice. A goose, shrieking like a trumpet, adds by contrast to the charm. The motionless trees seem to listen to all these sounds. Innumerable apple trees in full bloom look like balls of snow in the distance. The cherry trees, all white as well, rise like pyramids and spread out like fans of flowers. The birds seem at times to aim at those orchestral effects when all the instruments are blended in a mass of harmony. Would that we could identify ourselves with spring, that we could go so far as to believe that in ourselves breathe all the life and all the love that ferment in nature, that we could feel ourselves to be at the same time verdure, bird, song, freshness, elasticity, rapture, serenity. But what then should I become? There are moments when by dint of concentrating ourselves upon this idea and gazing fixedly on nature, we fancy that we experience something like this. Nothing can more faithfully represent this state of the soul than the shades of evening, falling at this very moment. Gray clouds just edged with silver cover the whole face of the sky. The sun, which set but a few moments ago, has left behind light enough to temper for a while the black shadows and to soften in a measure the fall of night. The winds are hushed, and the peaceful ocean, as I come to listen on the threshold of the door, sends me only a melodious murmur, which softly spreads over the soul like a beautiful wave over the beach. The birds, the first to feel the influence of the night, fly toward the woods, and their wings rustle in the clouds. The coppice, which covers the entire slope of the hill of Laval, and resounds all day long with the chirps of the wren, the gay whistle of the woodpecker, and the various notes of a multitude of birds has no more a sound along its path than within its thickets, unless it be the shrill call of the blackbirds as they play together and chase one another, after the other birds have hidden their heads under their wings. The noise of men, always the last to become silent, gradually dies away over the face of the fields. The general uproar ceases, and not a sound is heard except from the towns and hamlets, where, far into the night, the children cry and the dogs bark. Silence enwraps me. 
All things yearn for rest except my pen, which disturbs perchance the slumber of some living atom asleep in the folds of my notebook, for it makes its little sound as it writes these idle thoughts. Then let it cease, for what I write have written, and shall write will never be worth the sleep of a single atom. The Thoughts of Macarius from The Centaur by Maurice de Guerin I had my birth in the caves of these mountains, like the stream of this valley, whose first drops trickle from some weeping rock in a deep cavern. The first moment of my life fell in the darkness of a remote abode, and without breaking the silence. When our mothers draw near to the time of their delivery, they withdraw to the caverns, and in the depth of the loneliest of them, in the thickest of its gloom, bring forth, without uttering a plaint, offspring silent as themselves. Their puissant milk makes us surmount without weakness or dubious struggle the first difficulties of life, and yet we leave our caverns later than you, your cradles. The reason is that we have a doctrine that the early days of existence should be kept apart and enshrouded, as days filled with the presence of the gods. Nearly the whole term of my growth was passed in the darkness where I was born. The recesses of my dwelling ran so far under the mountain that I should not have known on which side was the exit, had not the winds, when they sometimes made their way through the opening, sent fresh airs in, and a sudden trouble. Sometimes, too, my mother came back to me, having about her the odors of the valleys, or streaming from the waters which were her haunt. Her returning thus without a word said of the valleys or the rivers, but with the emanations from them hanging about her, troubled my spirit, and I moved up and down restlessly in my darkness. What is it, I cried, this outside world whither my mother is born, and what reigns there in it so potent as to attract her so often? At these moments my own force began to make me unquiet. I felt in it a power which could not remain idle and betaking myself either to toss my arms or to gallop backward and forward in the spacious darkness of the cavern. I tried to make out, from the blows which I dealt in the empty space or from the transport of my course through it, in what direction my arms were meant to reach or my feet to bear me. Since that day, I have wound my arms round the busts of centaurs and round the bodies of heroes and round the trunks of oaks. My hands have assayed the rocks, the waters, plants without number, and the subtlest impressions of the air, for I uplift them in the dark and still nights to catch the breaths of wind and to draw signs whereby I may augur my road. My feet, look, O oh Melampus, how worn they are, and yet I'll be numbed as I am in this extremity of age. There are days when in broad sunlight on the mountain tops. I renew these gallopings of my youth in the cavern, and with the same object, brandishing my arms and employing all the fleetness which yet is left to me. O Melampus, thou who wouldst know the life of the centaurs, wherefore have the gods willed that thy steps should lead thee to me, the oldest and most forlorn of them all? It is long since I have ceased to practice any part of their life, I quit no more this mountain summit, to which age has confined me. The point of my arrows now serves me only to uproot some tough-fibred plant. The tranquil lakes know me still, but the rivers have forgotten me. I will tell thee a little of my youth, but these recollections, issuing from a worn memory, come like the drops of a nakedly libation poured from a damaged urn. The course of my youth was rapid and full of agitation. Movement was my life, and my steps knew no bound. One day when I was following the course of a valley seldom entered by the centaurs, I discovered a man making his way up the stream side on the opposite bank. He was the first whom my eyes had lighted on. I despised him. Behold, I cried, at the utmost but the half of what I am. How short are his steps, and his movement how full of labor. Doubtless he is a centaur overthrown by the gods, and reduced by them to drag himself along thus. Wandering along at my own will like the rivers, feeling wherever I went the presence of Cybele, 
whether in the bed of the valleys or on the height of the mountains. I bounded whither I would, like a blind and chainless life. But when night, filled with the charm of the gods, overtook me on the slopes of the mountain, she guided me to the mouth of the caverns, and there tranquilized me, as she tranquilizes the billows of the sea. Stretched across the threshold of my retreat, my flanks hidden within the cave, and my head under the open sky, I watched the spectacle of the dark. The sea gods, it is said, quit during the hours of darkness their palaces under the deep. They seat themselves on the promontories, and their eyes wander over the expanse of the waves. Even so I kept watch, having at my feet an expanse of life like the hushed sea. My regards had free range, and traveled to the most distant points, like sea beaches, which never lose their wetness. The line of mountains to the west retained the imprint of gleams, not perfectly wiped out by the shadows. In that quarter still survived in pale clearness, mountain summits bare and pure. There I beheld at one time the god Pan descend, ever solitary, at another the choir of mystic divinities, or I saw pass a mountain nymph charm-struck by the night. Sometimes the eagles of Mount Olympus traverse the upper sky, and were lost to view among the far-off constellations, or in the shade of the dreaming forests. Thou pursuest after wisdom, O Melampus, which is the science of the will of the gods, and thou roamest from people to people like a mortal driven by the destinies. In the times when I kept my night watches before the caverns, I have sometimes believed that I was about to surprise the thoughts of the sleeping Cybele, and that the mother of the gods, betrayed by her dreams, would let fall some of her secrets, but I have never made out more than sounds which faded away in the murmur of night, or words inarticulate as the bubbling of the rivers. O Macarius, one day said to me the great Chiron, whose old age I tended, we are both of us centaurs of the mountain, but how different are our lives. Of my days, all the study is, thou seest it, the search for plants. Thou, thou art like those mortals who have picked up on the waters or in the woods, and carry to their lips some pieces of the reed pipe thrown away by the god Pan. From that hour these mortals, having caught from their relics of the god a passion for wild life, or perhaps smitten with some secret madness, enter into the wildness, plunge among the forest, follow the course of the streams, bury themselves in the heart of the mountains, restless and haunted by an unknown purpose. The mayors beloved of the wind and the farthest Scythia are not wilder than thou, nor more cast down at nightfall, when the north wind has departed. Seekest thou to know the gods, O Macarius, and from what source men, animals, and elements of the universal fire have their origin. But the aged ocean, the father of all things, keeps locked within his own breast these secrets, and the nymphs who stand around sing as they weave their eternal dance before him, to cover any sound which might escape from his lips, half opened by slumber. The mortals dear to the gods for their virtue have received from their hands lyres to give delight to man, or the seeds of new plants to make him rich, but from their inexorable lips nothing. Such were the lessons which old Chiron gave me. Wane to the very extremity of life, the centaur yet nourished in his spirit the most lofty decoys. For me, O Melampus, I decline into my last days, calm as the setting of the constellations. I still retain enterprise, enough to climb to the top of the rocks, and there I linger late either gazing on the wild and restless clouds, or to see come up from the horizon the rainy Hyades, the Pleiades, or the great Orion. But I feel myself perishing and passing quickly away, like a snow wreath floating on the stream, and soon shall I be mingled with the waters which flow in the vast bosom of earth. Translation of Matthew Arnold End of section 11
Section 12 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 17. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 17. Selected excerpts by Francois Giesel, 1787 to 1874, by Charles Gross. Francois Pierre Guillaume Guizot was born at Nimes, October 4th, 1787. His career was eventful. He was a prolific writer, a successful professor, a great historian, and an influential statesman. Though we are mainly concerned with his literary activity, Giselle the author cannot be isolated from Giselle the patriot, the Calvinist statesman, the political champion of the bourgeoisie, and of constitutional monarchy. He is one of the few great historians who have helped to make history. The polities and statecraft of the past should be less mysterious to the experienced and judicious statesman than to the secluded scholar. On the other hand, Guizot's training in historical research may have reacted on his political life, widening his mental horizon and helping to develop in him the liberal spirit of Catholicity and impartiality which he evinced in his public life. His father, a lawyer, was a victim of the Revolution in 1794. In 1812, Guizot was appointed professor of history at the Sorbonne. In 1814, he began his political career as Secretary General of the Interior, and in 1817, he became a Counselor of State. In 1822, his lectures at the Sorbonne were suppressed on account of his liberal ideas. In 1828, he recovered his chair at the Sorbonne, and during the next two years lectured on the history of civilization in Europe and France. Under Louis-Philippe, he was Minister of Instruction and did much to improve the French system of education. From 1840 to 1848, he was at the head of the French cabinet as Minister of Foreign Affairs. With the dethronement of Louis-Philippe in 1848, his political activity came to an end. Throughout his life, he was a liberal, though he advocated the political preponderance of the middle classes and the maintenance of a constitutional government. He firmly combated revolutionary and ultra-democratic theories. He tried to reconcile the enjoyment of liberty with the preservation of social order. He died September 12, 1874. Of his numerous writings, the most important are The History of Civilization in Europe and the history of civilization in France, the history of the English Revolution, Shakespeare in his times, his memoirs, and the history of France related for my grandchildren. As a historian, he is noted for his philosophic grasp of important historical questions, his clear discernment of the broad lines of historical development, and his insight into the relations of cause and effect paying little heed to amusing and dramatic details of personal exploits. He tries to determine the dominant ideas or principles of each period of history. All his works are marked by a seriousness of purpose, which often assumes the form of ardent patriotism or earnest religious conviction. He believed that the study of the past has an ethical value, that an accurate knowledge of the past helps us to comprehend the present, and to provide for the future. He also believed in the progressive development of mankind through the various ages. The fundamental idea contained in the word civilization, he says, is progress or development, the carrying to higher perfection the relations between man and man. Such a philosophic treatment of history, though stimulating to thoughtful students, may easily degenerate into vague and misleading generalizations. The philosophic historian is tempted to weave his subjective ideas into the tissue which he fabricates, allowing the imagination to dominate over reason. The successful application of the philosophic method presupposes not merely a high order of mental capacity, 
but also an accurate knowledge of facts, which was less attainable in Guizot's time than it is at present. When he wrote his Civilization in Europe and Civilization in France, 1828-30, to 30, the modern method of historical research was still in its infancy. Rank had just begun his epic-making career. It must be admitted, however, that Guizot's books are still suggestive and instructive, despite the fact that critical investigation during the past 50 years has revolutionized our knowledge of events and institutions. Many of the broad lines of development that he laid down still remain unchanged. It should also be said that Guizot did much for the advancement of historical research by aiding to establish the Society for the History of France and by creating the Historical Commission, both of which have actively promoted this branch of study in France since 1835. Each of the 14 brief lectures in his History of Civilization in Europe is the delineation of a cardinal event or principle, and these principles are linked into one chain of development. At first he considers the influence of the three main sources of modern civilization, the Christian Church, the Romans, and the Germans. In the light of recent research, we may safely say that he underrates the influence of the Germanic element and overestimates that of Rome. Next, he examines four later cardinal factors in historical development, namely feudalism, the church, the communes, and royalty, and traces their interaction down through the period of monarchical centralization and of the Reformation to the French Revolution. He regards France as the center or focus of European civilization, he admits that at various epochs, Italy has outstripped France in the arts, and that England has had the lead in developing political institutions. But even those leading ideas or institutions, whose birth must be referred to other countries, had to be clarified in France before they were diffused throughout Europe. Therefore, France is eminently qualified to march at the head of European civilization, though France does not hold this leadership at present. What Guizot says is certainly applicable in large measure to the past. For centuries, the influence of French civilization radiated in all directions, and no other country forms a better nucleus for the study of general European history. The prominence or dominance of French ideas in European history is also emphasized in Guizot's History of Civilization in France. Though this series of lectures extends only to the 14th century, it is a more elaborate work than the history of civilization in Europe. The author gives a detailed account of the leading factors which entered into the development of France and shows how, from the relations between feudalism, the communes, and royalty, national and political unity was gradually evolved. His portrayal of feudalism is particularly detailed and attractive, though his account of the origin of that institution is now antiquated. He believes the two great lessons may be learned from the study of French history. One, that the rivalry of the nobility and the commons prevented their union against despotism. And two, that Frenchmen have a tendency to follow an idea or principle to its logical conclusion, regardless of consequences. These lessons help us to understand certain great divergences in the constitutional development of France and England. Guizot's account of what he calls the English Revolution comprises three separate works. The History of Charles I, 1826-27, The History of Oliver Cromwell, 1854, and The History of Richard Cromwell, 1856. Like the German historian Neist, he studied English history in order to determine what France could learn from the annals of her neighbor. Passionately preoccupied with the future of his country, he wished to ascertain just how a great people succeeded in securing and conceiving a free government. In dealing with the history of England during the 17th century, Guizot exhibits an admirable spirit of impartiality and a firm grasp of the dominant political ideas of the whole period. He also presents much new documentary evidence 
derived from the French archives. These volumes are still instructive, though Gardner and other recent writers have overthrown some of Guizot's conclusions. In the memoirs of my own time, 1858-67, to 67, Guizot comments upon contemporary political events, many of which he had helped to shape. This work is particularly important for the study of Louis Philippe's reign, and especially for the period of Guizot's ministry, from 1840 to 48. In his extreme old age, he wrote The History of France, related for my grandchildren, 1870 to 75. In this work, the octogenarian tries to impress upon the rising generation of Frenchmen the need of a lofty spirit of patriotism and a strong faith in their vanquished country, a faith which the past history of France should nourish and strengthen. He tries to awaken the interest of his readers by dwelling upon great persons and great events, and he succeeds in giving an admirable account of the general history of France. Many of Guizot's books have been translated into English, but most of the translations are marred by serious defects. His style, which has been assailed by some critics and admired by others, shows an improvement in his later works. Though he was not a great historical artist, his style is usually clear. All his writings are marked by a Calvinistic soberness of tone, which, though it may repel those in quest of picturesque historical details, attracts and stimulates thoughtful students. Civilization, from the general history of civilization in Europe. The situation in which we are placed as Frenchmen affords us a great advantage for entering upon the study of European civilization, for without intending to flatter the country to which I am bound by so many ties, I cannot but regard France as the center, as the focus of the civilization of Europe. It would be going too far to say that she has always been, upon every occasion, in advance of other nations. Italy at various epochs has outstripped her in the arts, England, as regards political institutions, is by far before her, and perhaps at certain moments we may find other nations of Europe superior to her in various particulars. But it must still be allowed that whenever France is set forward in the career of civilization, she has sprung forth with new vigor and has come up with or passed by all her rivals. Not only is this the case, but those ideas those institutions which promote civilization, but whose birth must be referred to other countries, have, before they could become general or produce fruit, before they could be transplanted to other lands or benefit the common stock of European civilization, been obliged to undergo in France a new preparation. It is from France, as from a secondary country more rich and fertile, that they have started forth to make the conquest of Europe. There is not a single great idea, not a single great principle of civilization, which in order to become universally spread has not first passed through France. There is indeed in the genius of the French something of a sociableness, of a sympathy, something which spreads itself with more facility and energy than in the genius of any other people. It may be in the language or the particular turn of mind of the French nation. It may be in their manners, or that their ideas, being more popular, present themselves more clearly to the masses, penetrate among themselves with greater ease. But in a word, clearness, sociability, sympathy, are the particular characteristics of France, of its civilization, and these qualities render it eminently qualified to march at the head of European civilization. In studying, then, the history of this great fact, it is neither an arbitrary choice nor a convention that leads us to make France the central point from which we shall study it, but it is because we feel that in doing so, we are in a manner place ourselves in the very heart of civilization itself, in the heart of the very fact which we desire to investigate. Civilization is just one of this kind of facts. It is so general in its nature that it can scarcely be seized, so complicated it can scarcely be unraveled, so hidden as to be scarcely discernible. 
the difficulty of describing it, of recounting its history, is apparent and acknowledged. But its existence, its worthiness to be described and to be recounted, are not less certain and manifest. Then, respecting civilization, what a number of problems remain to be solved. It may be asked, it is even now disputed, whether civilization be a good or an evil. One party decries it as teeming with mischief to man, while another lauds it as the means by which he will attain his highest dignity and excellence. Again, it is asked whether this fact is universal, whether there is a general civilization of the whole human race, a course for humanity to run, a destiny for it to accomplish, where the nations have not transmitted from age to age something to their successes which is never lost, but which grows and continues as a common stock, and will thus be carried on to the end of all things. For my part, I feel assured that human nature has such a destiny, that a general civilization pervades the human race, that at every epoch it augments, and that consequently there is a universal history of civilization yet to be written. Nor have I any hesitation in asserting that this history is the most noble, the most interesting of any, and that it comprehends every other. Is it not indeed clear that civilization is the great fact in which all others merge? in which they all end, in which they are all condensed, in which all others find their importance. Take all the facts of which the history of a nation is composed, all the facts which are accustomed to consider as the elements of its existence. Take its institutions, its commerce, its industry, its wars, the various details of its government, and if you would form some idea of them as a whole, if you would see their various bearings on each other, if you would appreciate their value, if you would pass a judgment upon them, what is it you desire to know? Why, what they have done to forward the progress of civilization, what part they have acted in this great drama, what influence they have exercised in aiding its advance. It is not only by this that we form a general opinion of these facts, but it is by this standard that we try them, that we estimate their true value. These are, as it were, the rivers of which we ask how much water they have carried to the ocean. Civilization is, as it were, the grand emporium of a people, in which all its wealth, all the elements of its life, all the powers of its existence are stored up. It is so true that we judge of minor facts, accordingly as they affect this greater one, that even some which are naturally detested and hated, which prove a heavy calamity to the nation upon which they fall, save for instant despotism, anarchy, and so forth, even these are partly forgiven. The evil nature is partly overlooked, if they have aided in any considerable degree the march of civilization. Wherever the progress of this principle is visible, together with the facts which have urged it forward, we attempted to forget the price it has cost. We overlook the dearness of the purchase. Again, there are certain facts which, properly speaking, cannot be called social. Individual facts which rather concern the human intellect than public life. Such are religious doctrines, philosophical opinions, literature, the sciences and arts. All these seem to offer themselves to individual man for his improvement, instruction, or amusement, and to be directed rather to his intellectual amelioration and pleasure than to his social condition. Yet still, how often do these facts come before us? How often are we compelled to consider them as influencing civilization? In all times, in all countries, it has been the boast of religion that it has civilized the people upon whom it has dwelt. Literature, the arts and sciences, have put in their claim for a share of this glory, and mankind has been ready to laud and honor them whenever it has felt that this praise was fairly their due. In the same manner, facts the most important, facts of themselves, and independently of their exterior consequences, the most sublime in their nature, 
have increased in importance, have reached a higher degree of sublimity by their connection with civilization. Such is the worth of this great principle that it gives a value to all it touches. Not only so, but there are even cases in which the facts of which we have spoken, in which philosophy, literature, the sciences, and the arts are especially judged and condemned or applauded according to their influence upon civilization. The example of Shakespeare, from Shakespeare and his times. Voltaire was the first person in France who spoke of Shakespeare's genius, and although he spoke of him merely as a barbarian genius, the French public were of opinion that Voltaire had said too much in his favor. Indeed, they thought it nothing less than profanation to apply the words genius and glory to dramas which they considered as crude as they were coarse. At the present day, all controversy regarding Shakespeare's genius and glory has come to an end. No one ventures any longer to dispute them, but a greater question has arisen, namely, whether Shakespeare's dramatic system is not far superior to that of Voltaire. This question I do not presume to decide. I merely say that it is now open for discussion. We have been led to it by the onward progress of ideas. I shall endeavor to point out the causes which have brought it about, but at present I insist merely upon the fact itself and deduce from it one simple consequence, that literary criticism has changed its ground and can no longer remain restricted to the limits within which it was formerly confined. Literature does not escape from the revolutions of the human mind. It is compelled to follow in its course to transport itself beneath the horizon under which it is conveyed, to gain elevation and extension with the ideas which occupy its notice, and to consider the questions which it discusses under the new aspects and novel circumstances in which they are placed by the new state of thought and of society. When we embrace human destiny in all its aspects and human nature in all the conditions of man upon earth, we enter into possession of an exhaustless treasure. It is the peculiar advantage of such a system that it escapes, by its extent, from the dominion of any particular genius. We may discover its principles in Shakespeare's works, but he was not fully acquainted with them, nor did he always respect them. He should serve as an example, not as a model. Some men, even of superior talent, have attempted to write plays according to Shakespeare's taste, without perceiving that they were deficient in one important qualification for the task, and that was to write as he did, to write them for our age, just as Shakespeare's plays were written for the age in which he lived. This is an enterprise, the difficulties of which have hitherto, perhaps, been maturely considered by no one. We have seen how much art and effort were employed by Shakespeare to surmount those which are inherent in his system. They are still greater in our times, and would unveil themselves much more completely to the spirit of criticism, which now accompanies the boldest essays of genius. It is not only with spectators of more fastidious taste and of more idle and inattentive imagination that the poet would have to do who should venture to follow in Shakespeare's footsteps. He would be called upon to give movement to personages embarrassed in much more complicated interests, preoccupied with much more various feelings, and subject to less simple habits of mind and to less decided tendencies. Neither science nor reflection, nor the scruples of conscience, nor the uncertainties of thought frequently encumber Shakespeare's heroes. Doubt is of little use among them, and the violence of their passion speedily transfers their belief to the side of their desires, or sets their actions above their belief. Hamlet alone presents the confused spectacle of a mind formed by the enlightenment of society, in conflict with the position contrary to its laws, and he needs a supernatural apparition to determine him to act, and a fortuitous event to accomplish his project. If incessantly placed in an analogous position, 
the personages of a tragedy conceived at the present day, according to the romantic system, would offer us the same picture of indecision. Ideas now crowd and intersect each other in the mind of man. Duties multiply in his conscience and obstacles and bonds around his life. Instead of those electric brains, prompt to communicate the spark which they have received, instead of those ardent and simple-minded men, whose projects like Macbeth's will to hand, the world now presents to the poet minds like Hamlet's, deep in the observation of those inward conflicts which our classical system has derived from a state of society more advanced than that at the time in which Shakespeare lived. So many feelings, interests, and ideas, the necessary consequences of modern civilization, might become even in their simplest form of expression a troublesome burden, which it would be difficult to carry through the rapid evolutions and bold advances of the romantic system. We must, however, satisfy every demand. Success itself requires it. The reason must be contented at the same time that the imagination is occupied. The progress of taste, of enlightenment, of society, and of mankind must serve not to diminish or disturb our enjoyment, but to render them worthy of ourselves and capable of supplying the new wants which we have contracted. Advance without rule and art in the romantic system, and you will produce melodramas, calculated to excite a passing emotion in the multitude, but in the multitude alone, and for a few days, just as by dragging along without originality in the classical system, you will satisfy only that cold literary class who are acquainted with nothing in nature, which is more important than the interests of versification, or more imposing than the three unities. This is not the work of the poet, who is called to power and destined for glory. He acts upon a grander scale and can address the superior intellects as well as the general and simple faculties of all men. It is doubtless necessary that the crowd should throng to behold those dramatic works of which you desire to make a national spectacle. But do not hope to become national if you do not unite in your festivities all those classes of persons and minds whose well-arranged hierarchy raises a nation to its loftiest dignity. Genius is bound to follow human nature in all its developments. Its strength consists in finding within itself the means for constantly satisfying the whole of the public. The same task is now imposed upon government and upon poetry. Both should exist for all and suffice at once for the wants of the masses and for the requirements of the most exalted minds. Doubtless stopped in its course by these conditions, the full severity of which will only be revealed to the talent that can comply with them. Dramatic art, even in England, where under the protection of Shakespeare it would have liberty to attempt anything, scarcely ventures at the present day even to try timidly to follow him. Meanwhile, England, France, and the whole of Europe demand of the drama pleasures and emotions that can no longer be supplied by the inanimate representation of a world that has ceased to exist. The classical system has its origin in the life of its time. That time has passed. Its image subsists in brilliant colors in its works, but can no more be reproduced. Near the monuments of past ages, the monuments of another age are now beginning to arise. What will be their form? I cannot tell, but the ground upon which their foundations may rest is already perceptible. This ground is not the ground of Corneille and Racine, nor is it that of Shakespeare. It is our own, but Shakespeare's system, as it appears to me, may furnish the plans according to which genius ought now to work. This system alone includes all those social conditions and all those general and diverse feelings, the simultaneous conjunction and activity of which constitute for us at the present day the spectacle of human things. Witnesses during thirty years of the greatest revolutions of society, we shall no longer willingly confine the movement of our mind within the narrow space of some family event or the agitations of a purely individual passion. 
the nature and destiny of man have appeared to us under their most striking and their simplest aspect, in all their extent and all their variableness. We require pictures in which this spectacle is reproduced, in which man is displayed in his completeness and excites our entire sympathy. End of section 12. Section 13 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 17. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Abai in May 2023. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 17. Selected excerpts from A Visit to Ceylon by Ernst Haeckel. Ernst Haeckel, born 1834. Ernst Haeckel, the German naturalist, is a scholar who unites to eminence in scientific research and discovery the gift of attractive literary presentation. In his own country, his position is that of one who has made valuable original contributions to the study of morphology and been the ablest exponent of the Darwinian theory. His more untechnical writings have a charm, a literary value, rarely to be found in the work of a specialist in science. Born in Potsdam, Germany, February 16, 1834, Haeckel studied the natural sciences at Berlin, Würzburg and Vienna, taking his medical degree in 1858 and practicing that profession a short time in the former city. During 1859 and 1860, he made a journey through Italy and Sicily in the interest of science, his work on The Radiator, 1862, being a result. Later portions were added in 1887 and 1888. In 1861 he settled in Jena for the study of comparative anatomy, but soon turned to the specific investigation of zoology. After holding subordinate positions, he was appointed in 1865 full professor at Jena, and his lectures embraced, besides zoology, the subjects of comparative anatomy, evolution, histology, and paleontology. His researches had to do especially with the lower ranks of marine animals and, above all, with deep-sea life in its simplest forms. The material for such study was gathered from many and extended experiences in the North Sea, the Mediterranean, the Canary Isles and the Indian Ocean. These travels and researches were the basis of works like that On the History of the Development of the Siphonophora, 1869, and his Biological Studies, 1870. Books of this nature, too, were introductory to greater representative works on natural philosophy and the development theory, such as Calcareous Sponges, 1872, Natural History of Creation, 1868, which has received the honor of translation into twelve languages, and the masterwork General Morphology of Organisms, 1866. More popular writings, making him known to a public much wider than the biologist ever addresses, are those On the Division of Labor in Nature and Human Life, 1869, On the Origin and Genealogy of the Human Race, 1870, Life in the Great Marine Animals, 1870, The Arabian Corals, 1873, based on studies in the Red Sea, the System of the Medusa, 1880, and A Visit to Ceylon, the latter a work which in English translation has won many admiring readers. For the last dozen years or more, Professor Haeckel has given much of his time to the deep-sea explorations of the HMS Challenger expedition, and his voluminous reports written in the English tongue with accompanying illustrations contain descriptions of no less than 4,000 new kinds of marine animals. His Plankton Studies, 1890, state his general biologic conclusions upon the life and growth of sea organisms, and his very interesting Monism as the link between religion and science 
constitutes a great naturalist's confession of faith. A man of many travels and much culture, of immense energy, learning and power of original research, Professor Haeckel holds a dominant position in his own land among the savants of science. His great work in morphology brought into a systematic philosophy the brilliant hypothesis of Darwin, whom he was the first German to defend and expound, at a time when the development theory was looked at askance. And in writings like that from which the selections are made, he adds aesthetic and human interest to subjects more often treated after the manner of the arid and technical specialist. The Ceylon sketches have picturesqueness, color, enthusiasm. They impart a sense not only of the order, but of the wonder and beauty of science. At Peradenia, from A Visit to Ceylon in the central province of Ceylon, and at a height of 1,500 feet above the sea, stands the capital, formerly the residence of the kings of the island, the famous town of Kandy, and only a few miles away from it is a small town which was also for a short time a royal residence five centuries ago. At this place the English government made a botanical garden in 1819, and Dr. Gardner was the first director. His successor, the late Dr. Thwaites, the very meritorious compiler of the first Flora Zeylanica, for thirty years did all he could to improve and carry out the purpose of this garden in a manner worthy of its advantages of climate and position. When he retired, a year or two before his death, Dr. Henry Tryman was appointed director, and from him, immediately on my arrival, I received a most friendly invitation. I accepted it all the more gladly, because in Europe I had already read and heard much of the marvels of plant life at Peradenia. Nor were my high anticipations disappointed. If Ceylon is a paradise for every botanist and lover of flowers, then Peradenia deserves to be called the very heart of paradise. Peradenia and Kandy are connected with Colombo by a railway, the first made in Ceylon the journey occupying from first to last between four and five hours. I started from Colombo at seven in the morning of the 4th of December and reached Peradenia at about eleven. Like all Europeans in Ceylon, I found I must travel in the first class, not noblesse, but whiteness oblige. The second class is used only by the yellow and tawny burghers and half-breeds, the descendants of the Portuguese and Dutch, the third class, of course, carries the natives, the dark Singhalese and the nearly black Tamils. The only wonder to me is that there is not a fourth for these last, and a fifth for the despised low-caste Hindus. The natives are always great patrons of railway travelling. It is the only pleasure on which they are prepared to spend money, all the more so as it is a cheap one. Directly after the railway was opened, the natives began travelling by the wonderful road every day and all day long for the mere pleasure of it. The carriages are airy and light, the first class well provided with protection against the heat, with wide eaves and Venetian blinds. The engine drivers and the guards, in their white clothes with solar helmets, are Englishmen. The line is worked with order and punctuality, like all the English railways. The first two hours' ride from Colombo to Peradenia lies across a level country, most of it covered with marshy jungle, varied by rice fields and water meadows. In these, herds of black buffaloes lie half in the water, while graceful white herons pick the insects off their backs. Farther on, the line gradually approaches the hills, and after Rampukana station begins to work upwards. For an hour, between this and the next station, Kaduganaba, the line is in point of scenery one of the most beautiful I have ever seen. The road winds with many zigzags up the steep northern face of a vast basin or cirque. At first the eye is fascinated by the changing aspect of the immediate foreground. Immense blocks of gneiss stand up amid the luxuriant masses of dense forest which fill the ravines on each side. Creepers of the loveliest species fling themselves from one tree-top to the next, 
as they tower above the undergrowth. Enchanting little cascades tumble down the cliffs, and close by the railroad we often come upon the old high road from Colombo to Candy, formerly so busy a scene, which was constructed by the English government to enable them to keep possession of the ancient capital. Further on we command wider views, now of the vast park-like valley which grows below us as we mount higher, and now of the lofty blue mountain range which stands up calm and proud beyond its southern wall. Although the forms of the higher hills are monotonous and not particularly picturesque, for the most part low, undulating shoulders of granite and gneiss, still a few more prominent peaks rise conspicuous, as for instance the curious table rock known as the Bible Rock. Sensation Rock, as it is called, is one of the most striking and impressive features of the scenery. The railway, after passing through several tunnels, here runs under overhanging rocks along the very edge of a cliff, with a fall of from twelve to fourteen hundred feet, almost perpendicular, into the verdurous abyss below. Dashing waterfalls come foaming down from the mountain wall on the left, rush under the bridges over which the line is carried, and throwing themselves with a mighty leap into mid-air, are lost in mist before they reach the bottom of the gorge, making floating rainbows where the sun falls upon them. The green depths below and the valley at our feet are covered partly with jungle and partly with cultivation. Scattered huts, gardens and terraced rice fields can be discerned. The lofty head of the Talipot palm, the proud queen of the tribe in Ceylon, towers above the scrub on every side. Its trunk is perfectly straight and white, like a slender marble column, and often more than a hundred feet high. Each of the fans that compose its crown of leaves covers a semicircle of from twelve to sixteen feet radius, a surface of one hundred and fifty to two hundred square feet, and they, like every part of the plant, have their uses, particularly for thatching roofs. But they are more famous because they were formerly used exclusively instead of paper by the Singhalese, and even now often serve this purpose. The ancient Puskola manuscripts in the Buddhist monasteries are all written with an iron stylus on this Ola paper, made of narrow strips of talipod leaves boiled and then dried. The proud talipod palm flowers but once in its life, usually between its fiftieth and eightieth year. The tall pyramidal spike of bloom rises immediately above the sheaf of leaves to a height of thirty or forty feet, and is composed of myriads of small, yellowish-white blossoms. As soon as the nuts are ripe, the tree dies. By a happy accident, an unusual number of talipod palms were in flower at the time of my visit. I counted sixty between Rambukana and Kaduganawa, and above a hundred in my whole journey. Excursions are frequently made to this point from Colombo to see the strange and magnificent scene. The railroad, like the old high road, is at its highest level above the sea at the Kaduganawa Pass, and a lighthouse-shaped column stands here in memory of the engineer of the carriage road, Captain Dawson. We are here on the dividing ridge of two watersheds. All the hundred little streams which we have hitherto passed, threading their silver way through the velvet verdure of the valley, flow either to the Kelani Ganga or to the Maha Oya, both reaching the sea on the western coast. The brooks which tumble from the eastern shoulder of Kaduganawa all join the Mahaveli Ganga, which flows southward not far below. This is the largest river in the island, being about 134 miles long, and it enters the sea on the east coast near Trincomali. The railway runs along its banks, which are crowded with plantations of sugar cane, and in a quarter of an hour from the pass we reach Peradenia, the last station before Kandy. The entrance to the garden is through a fine avenue of old India rubber trees. This is the same as the Indian species, of which the milky juice, when inspissated, becomes caoutchouc, and of which young plants are frequently grown in sitting-rooms in our cold northern climate, 
for the sake of the bright polished green of its oval leathery leaves but while with us these india rubber plants are greatly admired when their inch thick stems reach the ceiling and their rare branches bear fifty leaves more or less in the hot moisture of their native land they attain the size of a noble forest tree worthy to compare with our oaks an enormous crown of thousands of leaves growing on horizontal boughs spreading forty to fifty feet on every side covers a surface as wide as a good-sized mansion and the base of the trunk throws out a circle of roots often from one hundred to two hundred feet in diameter more than the whole height of the tree these very remarkable roots generally consist of twenty or thirty main roots thrown out from strongly marked ribs in the lower part of the trunk and spreading like huge creeping snakes over the surface of the soil the india rubber tree is indeed called the snake tree by the natives and has been compared by poets to laocoon entwined by serpents very often however the roots grow up from the ground like strong upright poles and so form stout props enabling the parent tree to defy all storms unmoved the spaces between these props form perfect little rooms or sentry boxes in which a man can stand upright and be hidden these pillar roots are developed here in many other gigantic trees of very different families i had scarcely exhausted my surprise at this avenue of snake trees when exactly in the middle beyond the entrance of the gate my eye was caught by another wonderful sight an immense bouquet there greets the visitor a clump of all the palms indigenous to the island together with many foreign members of this noblest growth of the tropics all wreathed with flowering creepers and their trunks covered with graceful parasitical ferns another but even larger and finer group of palms stood further on at the end of the entrance avenue and was moreover surrounded by a splendid parterre of flowering plants the path here divided that to the left leading to the director's bungalow situated on a slight rise this inviting home is like most of the villa residences in ceylon a low one-storied building surrounded by an airy veranda with a projecting roof supported on light white columns both pillars and roof are covered with garlands of the loveliest climbers large flowered orchids fragrant vanilla splendid fuchsias and other brilliant blossoms and a choice collection of flowering plants and ferns decorate the beds which lie near the house above it weigh the shadowy boughs of the finest indian trees and numbers of butterflies and chafers lizards and birds animate the beautiful spot i was especially delighted with the small barred squirrels which looked particularly pretty here though they are common and very tame in all the gardens of ceylon as the bungalow stands on the highest point of the gardens and a broad velvet lawn slopes down from it the open hall of the veranda commands a view of a large portion of the garden with a few of the finest groups as well as the belt of tall trees which enclose the planted land beyond this park-like ground rise the wooded heads of the mountains which guard the basin of peradenia the beautiful mahaveli river flows round the garden in a wide reach and divides it from the hill country thus it lies in a horseshoe shaped peninsula on the landward side where it opens into the valley of kandi it is effectually protected by a high and impenetrable thicket of bamboo mixed with a chevaux de frise of thorny rattan palms and other creepers the climate too is extraordinarily favourable to vegetation at a height of fifteen hundred feet above the sea the tropical heat of the mountain basin combined with the heavy rainfall on the neighbouring mountains make of peradenia an admirable natural forcing house and it can easily be conceived how lavishly the tropical flora here displays its wonderful productive powers my first walk through the garden in the company of the accomplished director convinced me that this was in fact the case and although i had heard and read much of the charms of the prodigal vegetation of the tropics and longed and dreamed of seeing them still 
the actual enjoyment of the fabulous reality far exceeded my highest expectations even after i had already made acquaintance with the more conspicuous forms of this southern flora at and near colombo and bombay during the four days i was so happy as to spend at peradenia i made greater strides in my purview of life and nature in the vegetable world than i could have made at home by the most diligent study in so many months indeed when two months later i visited peradenia for the second and alas for the last time and spent three more happy days in that paradise it enchanted me to the full as much when i quitted it as it had at the first glance only i saw it with wider understanding and increased knowledge i cannot sufficiently thank my excellent friend dr tryman for his kind hospitality and valuable instruction the seven days i spent in his delightful bungalow were indeed to me seven days of creation translation of clara bell color and form in the ceylon coral banks from a visit to ceylon nine years since in eighteen seventy three when i made an excursion among the coral reefs of the sinai coast and for the first time had a glimpse of the wonderful forms of life in their submarine gardens of marvels they had excited my utmost interest and in a popular series of lectures on arabian corals published with five coloured plates i had endeavoured to sketch these wonderful creatures and their communities with various other animals the corals of ceylon which i first became acquainted with here at galle and subsequently studied more closely at bellingham reminded me vividly of that delightful experience and at the same time afforded me a multitude of new ones for though the marine fauna of the indian seas is on the whole nearly allied to the arabian fauna of the red sea many genera and species being common to both yet the number and variety of forms of life is considerably greater in the vast basin of the indian ocean with its diversified coast than in the pent-up waters of the arabian gulf with its uniform conditions of existence thus i found the general physiognomy of the coral reefs in the two situations different in spite of many features in common while the reefs at tour are for the most part conspicuous for warm colouring yellow orange red and brown in the coral gardens of ceylon green predominates in a great variety of shades and tones yellow-green alcyonia growing with sea-green heteropora and malachite-like anthophylla side by side with olive-green millepora madrepora and astrea of emerald hue with brown-green montipora and meandrina ransonette had already pointed out how singularly and universally green prevails in the colouring of ceylon not only is the greater portion of this evergreen isle clothed with an unfading tapestry of rich verdure but the animals of the most widely dissimilar classes which live in its woods are conspicuous for their green colouring this is seen in all the commonest birds and lizards butterflies and beetles which are of every shade of brilliant green in the same way the innumerable inhabitants of the sea of all classes are coloured green such as many fishes and crustacea worms and sea anemones indeed creatures which elsewhere seldom or never appear in green livery wear it here for instance several starfish sea urchins sea cucumbers also some enormous bivalves and brachiopoda and others an explanation of this phenomenon is to be found in darwin's principles particularly in the law of adaptation by selection of similar colouring or sympathetic affinity of colour as i have elucidated in my history of creation the less the predominant colouring of any creature varies from that of its surroundings the less will it be seen by its foes the more easily can it steal upon its prey and the more it is protected and fitted for the struggle for existence natural selection will at the same time constantly confirm the similarity between the prevailing colour of the animal and of its surroundings because it is beneficial to the animal 
the green coral banks of ceylon with their preponderance of green inhabitants are as instructive in their bearing on this theory as are the green land animals which people the evergreen forests and thickets of the island but in purity and splendor of coloring the sea creatures are even more remarkable than the fauna of the forests it would however be a mistake to suppose that this prevailing green hue produces a monotonous uniformity of coloring on the contrary it is impossible to weary of admiring it for on the one hand the most wonderful gradations and modifications may be traced through it and on the other numbers of vividly and gaudily coloured forms are scattered among them and just as the gorgeous red yellow violet or blue colours of many birds and insects look doubly splendid in the dark green forest of ceylon so do the no less brilliant hues of some marine creatures on the coral banks many small fishes and crustaceans are particularly distinguished by such gaudy colouring with very elegant and extremely singular markings as they seek their food among the ramifications of the coral trees some few large corals are also conspicuously and strikingly coloured thus for instance many posiloporae are rose-coloured many of the astraeidae are red and yellow and many of the heteroporae and madreporae are violet and brown etc but unfortunately these gorgeous colours are for the most part very evanescent and disappear as soon as the coral is taken out of the water often at a mere touch the sensitive creatures which have displayed their open cups of tentacles in the greatest beauty then suddenly close and become inconspicuous dull and colourless but if the eye is enchanted merely by the lovely hues of the coral reef and its crowded population it is still more delighted by the beauty and variety of form displayed by these creatures just as the radiated structure of one individual coral polyp resembles a true flower so the whole structure of the branded coral stock resembles the growth of plants trees and shrubs it was for this reason that corals were universally supposed to be really plants and it was long before their true nature as animals was generally believed in these coral gardens display indeed a lovely and truly fairy-like scene as we row over them in a boat at low tide and on a calm sea close under the fort of galle the sea is so shallow that the keel of the boat grates on the points of the stony structure and from the wall of the fort above the separate coral growths can be distinguished through the crystal water a great variety of most beautiful and singular species here grow close together on so narrow a space that in a very few days i had made a splendid collection mr scott's garden in which my kind host allowed me to place them to dry looked strange indeed during these days the splendid tropical plants seemed to vie with the strange marine creatures who had intruded on their domain for the prize for beauty and splendour and the enchanted naturalist whose gladdened eye wandered from one to the other could not decide whether the fauna or the flora best deserved to take it the coral animals imitated the forms of the loveliest flowers in astonishing variety and the orchids on the other hand mimicked the forms of insects the two great kingdoms of the organized world seemed here to have exchanged aspects most of the corals which i collected in galle and bellingham i procured by the help of divers these i found here to be quite as clever and capable of endurance as the arabs of tur nine years before armed with a strong crowbar they uprooted the limestone structure of even very large coral stocks from their attachment to the rocky base and raised them most skilfully up to the boat these masses often weighed from fifty to eighty pounds and it cost no small toil and care to lift them uninjured into the boat some kinds of coral are so fragile that in taking them out of the water they break by their own weight and so unfortunately it is impossible to convey many of the most delicate kinds uninjured to land this is the case for instance with certain frail turbinariae whose foliaceous stalk grows in the shape of an inverted spiral cone 
and of the many-branched heteropora, which resembles an enormous stag's antler with hundreds of twigs. It is not from above, however, that a coral reef displays its full beauty, even when we row close over it, and when the ebb tide has left the water so shallow that its projections grind against the boat. On the contrary, it is essential to take a plunge into the sea. In the absence of a diving bell, I tried to dive to the bottom and keep my eyes open under water, and after a little practice I found this easy. Nothing could be more wonderful than the mysterious green sheen which pervades this submarine world. The enchanted eye is startled by the wonderful effects of light, which are so different from those of the upper world with its warm and rosy colouring, and they lend a double interest and strangeness to the forms and movements of the myriads of creatures that swarm among the corals. The diver is in all reality in a new world. There is, in fact, a whole multitude of singular fishes, crustacea, mollusca, radiator, worms, etc., whose food consists solely of the coral polyps among which they live, and these coral eaters, which may be regarded as parasites in the true sense of the word, have acquired, by adaptation to their peculiar mode of life, the most extraordinary forms. More especially are they provided with weapons of offence and defence in the most remarkable character. But just as it is well known that no man may walk unpunished under the palms, so the naturalist cannot swim with impunity among the coral banks. The oceanites, under whose protection these coral fairy bowers of the sea flourish, threaten the intruding mortal with a thousand perils. The millepora, as well as the medusae which float among them, burn him wherever they touch like the most venomous nettles. The sting of the fish known as cynacea is as painful and dangerous as that of the scorpion. Numbers of crabs nip his tender flesh with their powerful claws. Black sea urchins thrust their foot-long spines, covered with fine prickles set the wrong way, into the sole of his foot, where they break off and remain, causing very serious wounds. But worst of all is the injury to the skin in trying to secure the coral itself. The numberless points and angles with which their limestone skeleton is armed inflict a thousand little wounds at every attempt to detach and remove a portion. Never in my life have I been so gashed and mangled as after a few days of diving and coral fishing at Gale, and I suffered from the consequences for several weeks after. But what are these transient sufferings to a naturalist, when set in the scale against the fairy-like scenes of delight with which a plunge among these marvellous coral groves enriches his memory for life. Translation of Clara Bell End of section 13「Section 14 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 17. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 17. Selected Poems by Hyphis, 14th Century A.D., by A. V. Williams Jackson. Hyphis, the famous lyric poet of Persia in the 14th century, is sometimes called the Persian Anacreon. Hyphis sang the praises of the rose and of the springtide, and chanted the glories of spiritual beauty and love, or fluted in plaintive strains the sad note of the bulbul, or nightingale in Persia, at a time not far distant, from that in which England listened to the rhythmical conflict and minstrelly between the owl and the nightingale, or was entranced by the dulcet measures of the Chaucerian Romant of the Rose. Hyphites, the tender and sensitive poet, was born about the opening of the 14th century. His full name was Kawaja Shamsadin Muhammad Hyphites. We are told that he was of good family, and we know that he must have had an excellent education. His nom de plume, Hyphites, retainer, 
i.e., one who remembers, or who knows the Quran by heart, is significant, and his native city of Shiraz, whose praises he sounds has become synonymous with poetic inspiration. Hafiz stands almost as the last and greatest in the line of Persian poesy, which can boast of Perdusi, Nizami, Omar Khayyam, Jala Adin, Rumi, Sadi, and Jami. The charm of his style, the beauty of his language, the pure flow of his verse, and the passionate depth of his thought and feeling, whether it be in a lyrical outpouring of his own soul, or in the veiled mystic ecstasy of spiritual devotion concealed under the guise of material images, rightly render Hafiz a poet's poet. His life seems not to have been very eventful, and it is only surmise that presumes that his youth may have been anacreontic. A tradition, however, is preserved which shows that his verse early won him worldwide fame. His name reached India and came to the ears of the Deccan prince, Sultan Muhammad Shah Bamani. His majesty invited the gifted bard to visit his court and sent him a handsome present to defray the expenses of his journey. Ifeats, like Horace, if the story be true, seems to have been a poor sailor. In terror of shipwreck, he turned back before he had fairly started on his voyage and sent to the generous literary patron a poem or panegyric instead of presenting himself. He apologized for his absence on the ground of dread of the dangers of the deep and his expressed preference for the quiet life and charming beauty of Shiraz does not seem to have displeased the liberal-minded potentate. A pretty story is also told regarding one of Hyphesus' odes that became known to the Scythian conqueror Timur Lang, Tamerlane. This was the castle beginning. Agaran Turk is Shirazi, but dost arid dul imara, which is below translated in the lines opening with, if that beauty of Shiraz would take my heart in hand. In this sonnet, the passionate poet offers to give the cities of Samarkand and Bukhara for the dark mole on his favorite's cheek. When the great Tamerlane subdued Faristan, he is said to have summoned Hafiz to his presence and to have sternly rebuked him for his lavish recklessness in giving away cities that were not a poet's to bestow. The brilliancy of the minstrel's wit was equal to the occasion. Kissing the ground at the conqueror's feet, he replied, Sultan of the world, it is through such generosity that I am come to this disastrous or joyous day. It is needless to add the happy result, and one wishes that the truth of the story were less uncertain. Like Pindar and other famous poets, stories are also not wanting as to how Hyphes received the gift of song. Fanciful as they may be, they all show the esteem in which he was held, not in Persia alone, but abroad. A feast was married, if we rightly interpret the pathetic lines that lament a home left desolate by the departure of a being for whom his soul breathed a divine awe. His own death occurred about 1389. It is said that the Muslim priests at first declined to perform the last solemn rites over his body, as exceptions were taken to the orthodoxy of some of his poetical compositions. It was determined to decide the matter by lot. A number of verses chosen at random from Hyphesis' own poems were tossed into an urn, and a child was appointed to draw one out. The verse read, From the beer of Hyphes, keep not back thy foot, for though he be immersed in sin, he goeth to paradise. The body was at once accorded proper burial, and his grave in a fair shaded garden near Shiraz, with its beautifully inscribed alabaster slab, still forms a living monument, if one were needed besides the lovely odes that we have of this passionate poet. Afis was a prolific writer. The manuscript and printed editions of his works comprised more than 500 gazelles or odes, a gazelle, ode, or perhaps rather sonnet, 
is a poem not exceeding 16 or 17 couplets. The last two words of the first couplet rhyme together, and with these also rhymes the second line of every couplet in the poem. All the odd lines are entirely independent of rhyme. The signature of the poet, as a rule, is woven into the last verse of the ghazal. Parallels for signatures, thus inserted, are not far to seek in the Greek anthology or in English, or even in Anglo-Saxon poetry. A series of ghazals, moreover, when gathered into a collection, is called a divan. The poems or odes in a divan are regularly arranged alphabetically according to the initial letter of the Persian word with which the poem begins. A parallel might be imagined if our hymn books were arranged according to the table of first lines. Hafiz also wrote quatrains and a number of other short poetical compositions. So popular was his divan that he came to be consulted as an oracle by opening the book and putting the finger on any chance verse. As to the poetic merit of Hythes's work, there is no question. His title to fame is acknowledged. As to the interpretation of his poems, however, there is much question and debate whether they are to be taken in a literal or in a spiritual sense. Some readers see in his praises of love and of wine, of musky tresses and slender cypress forms, merely the passion of an Ovid or an Anacreon. Other admirers of Hafiz, however, and especially his Oriental worshippers, read spiritual thoughts of divine love, of the soul and God, behind the physical imagery. Wine is the spirit, it is not the juice of the grape, and the draught from the tavern is but quaffing the cup of self-oblivion. There is undoubted truth in this interpretation, which is in accordance with the mystic doctrines of Sufism. The idea is oriental, and the analogous interpretation of the Song of Solomon is familiar. In the Occident, moreover, medieval poets employed similar physical images for religious awe and adoration. Parallels even of English poets in the 17th century, like the Fletchers, Dunn, and Crashaw, might be cited. But as in the latter instances also, there can be little doubt that numerous odes of high peace perhaps those of his earlier youth, hardly allow of anything but a material and passionate interpretation. In any case, the grace, charm, beauty, and delicate feeling is never absent in Hafiz's poetry. The most complete edition of Hafiz in translation is the English prose rendering by H. Wilberforce Clark, the Divan e Hafiz, translated, Three Volumes, London, 1891. It also contains extensive biographical, bibliographical, and critical matter, and should certainly be consulted. Selections from Hafiz have been translated into many languages. Sir William Jones, who himself was a poet, made Hafiz familiar in English as early as 1795. Among other names might be mentioned H. Bicknell, Selections from Hafiz, London, 1875, and S. Robinson, Persian Poetry for English Readers, Privately Printed, Glasgow, 1883. Robinson's work has evidently been drawn upon by J. H. McCarthy, Gazelles from the Divan of Hafiz, London and New York, 1893. The best German translation, complete, is by V. Nong Reisenzweig, three volumes, 1856-64. Selected Ghazals or Odes If that beauty of Shiraz should take my heart in hand, I would give for her dark mole Samarkand and Bukhara. Boy, bring me the wine that remaineth, for in paradise thou wilt not see the banks of the water of Rocknagbad, nor the rose bower of Armosella. Alas, those saucy lovely ones, those charming disturbers of our city, bear away patience from my heart as Turkomans their repast of plunder. Yet the beauty of our maidens is independent of our imperfect love. To a lovely face, what need is there of paint or dyes, of mole or down? 
Speak to me of the musician and of wine, and search less into the secrets of futurity. For no one in his wisdom ever hath discovered or ever will discover that mystery. I can understand how the beauty of Joseph, which added no luster to the day, withdrew Zuleika from the veil of her modesty. Thou hast spoken evil of me, and I am contented. God forgive thee. Thou hast spoken well, for even a bitter word is beseeming when it cometh from a ruby-sugared dropping lip. Give ear, O my soul, to good counsel, for better than their own souls love youths of a happy disposition the admonition of the aged wise. Thou hast composed thy gazelle, thou hast strung thy pearls. Come and sing it sweetly, O Hafiz, for heaven has shed upon the poetry the harmony of the Pleiades. The heart is the veil behind which is hidden his love. His eye is the mirror holder which reflected his countenance. I, who would not bow my head to both worlds, submit my neck to the burthen of his mercies. Thou is joyous, the tulba tree, I, the image of my beloved one. Everyone's thoughts are fashioned to the measure of his aims. What should I be within that holy place in which the morning breeze is the veil holder who guardeth the sanctuary of his honor? If I have soiled the skirts of my raiment, what is the damage which I can do? The universe is the pledge for his purity. Benjamin is long departed. Now it is our turn. To each one is allowed a five days sojourning. The kingdom of love and the wealth of enjoyment, all that I possess is bestowed by the hand of his destination. If we have offered for a ransom ourselves and our hearts, why need we fear? The goal towards which we strive is the purpose of his salvation. Never cease to make his image the object of thine eye, for its cell is the peculiar chamber of his privacy. Every new rose which adorneth the meadow is a mark of the color and perfume of his benevolence. Look not on his external poverty, for the bosom of Hythes is a rich treasury in the exuberance of his benevolence. Is there aught sweeter than the delights of the garden and companionship of the spring? But where is the cupbearer? Say, what is the cause of his lingering? Every pleasant moment that cometh to your hand, score up as an invaluable prize. Let no one hesitate, for who knoweth the conclusion of the matter? The tie of life is but a hair. Use thine intelligence, be thyself thine own comrade in sorrow, and what then is the sorrow which fate can deal thee? The meaning of the fountain of life in the gardens of Verem, what is it? but the enjoyment of a running stream and a delicious wine. The temperate man and the intemperate are both of one tribe. What choice is there between them, that we should surrender our souls to dubious reasonings? What reveal the silent heavens of that which is behind the veil? O litigant, why dispute with the keeper of the veil? If to him who is bound up in error or sin, there is no room for warning or amendment, what meaning is there in the words, cancelling, and the mercy of the forgiving one? The devotee longs for drafts from the right of Luther, and I fees from a goblet of wine. Between these, the will of the Creator, what would that be? In the hour of dawn, the bird of the garden thus spoke to a freshly blown rose. Be less disdainful, for in this garden hath bloomed many a one like thee. The rose smiled and said, We have never grieved at hearing the truth, but no lover would speak so harshly to his beloved. To all eternity, the odor of love will never reach the brain of that man who hath never swept with his brow the dust from the sill of the wine house. Dost thou desire to drink the ruby tinted wine from that gold begemmed goblet? How many a pearl must thou first pierce with the point of thine eyelashes? Yesterday, when in the rose garden of a rim, the morning breeze with its gentle breath began to disturb the hair of the spikeheart, I exclaimed, O throne of Jimshid, where is thy magic world-reflecting mirror? And it replied, Alas, 
that that watchful fortune should be slumbering. The words of love are not those that come to the tongue. O cupbearer, cut short this asking and answering. The tears of Hafiz have cast patience and wisdom into the sea. How could it be otherwise? The burning pangs of love, how could he conceal? The fast is over, the festival is come, and hearts are lifted up, and the wine is sparkling in the wine house, and wine we must drink. The turn of the heavy dealer in abstinence is past. The season of joy is arrived, and of joyous revelers. Why should reproach be heaped upon him, who, like me, quaffeth wine? This is neither sin nor fault in the jovial lover. The drinker of wine, in whom is no false show and no dissimulation, is better than he who is a traitor in semblances. We are neither dissembling revelers nor the comrades of hypocrites. He who is the knower of all secrets knoweth this. We discharge all our divine obligations and do evil to no man, and whatever we are told is not right. We say not that it is right. What mattereth it that thou and I should quaff a few goblets of wine? Wine is the blood of the vine. It is not thy blood. This is not a fault which throweth all into confusion, and were it fault, where is the man to be found who is free from faults? I fees, leave thou the how and the wherefore, and drink for a moment thy wine. His wisdom hath withholden from us, what is the force of the words, how and wherefore? Hail, Shiraz, incomparable sight. O Lord, preserve it from every disaster. God forgive a hundred times that our Rokabat be dimmed, to which the life of Kizar hath given its brightness. For between Jephirabad and Mosala cometh his north wind perfumed with amber. O come to Shiraz, and the overflow of the Holy Spirit implore for it from the man who is the possessor of all perfection. Let no one boast here the sugar candy of Egypt, for our sweet ones have no reason for the blush of shame. O morning breeze, what news bringest thou of thy tipsy lovely one? What information canst thou give me of her condition? Awaken me, not from my dream, O God that I may sweeten my solitude with that fair vision. Yea, if that sweet one should desire me to pour out my blood, yield it up, my heart, as freely as mother's milk. Wherefore, O Hyphiz, if thou wouldst be terrified by the thought of separation, wast thou not grateful for the days of her presence? O Lord, that smiling rose which thou gavest me in charge, I return to thy charge, to preserve her from the envious eye of her meadow. Although she be removed a hundred stages from the village of faithfulness, far be the mischiefs of the revolutions of the moon from her soul and body. Whithersoever she goeth, the heart of her friend shall be companion of her journey, the kindness of the benevolent, the shield of her soul and body. If, morning wind, thou passest by the bounds of Salima's station, I shall look that thou carry a salutation from me to Sulima. Scatter thy musky fragrance gently upon those black tresses. They are the abode of dear hearts. Do not disturb them. Say to her, My heart preserveth its vow of fidelity to the mole and down of your cheek. Wherefore, hold sacred those amber-plated ringlets. In the place where they drink to the memory of her lip, Base would be the intoxicated one who should remain conscious of himself. Merchandise and money expect not to gain at the door of the wine house. Whoever partaketh of this beverage will cast his pack into the sea. Whoever is in dread of the restlessness of anxiety, not genuine in his love, either be her foot upon my head or be my lip upon her mouth. The poetry of Hafiz is the primary couplet of wisdom, praise beyond her soul attracting and grace-inspiring breath. I have made a compact with the mistress of my soul, that so long as I have a soul within my body, I will hold as mine own soul the well-wishes of her village. 
in the privacy of my breast, I see light from that taper of Shagil, splendor to mine eye and brightness to my heart from that moon of Goten. Since in accordance with my wishes and yearnings I have gained the privacy of my breast, why need I care for the slander of evil speakers in the midst of the crowd? If a hundred armies of lovely ones should be lying in ambush to assault my heart, I have, by the mercy and to the praise of heaven, an idol which will shatter armies to pieces. Would to heaven, my rival, that this night thou wouldst close thine eye for a while, that I might whisper a hundred words to her silent ruby lips. No inclination have I for tulip or white rose, or the leaf of the narcissus, so long as by heaven's grace I walk proudly in the rose garden of her favor. O oh, mine ancient wise one, lie not thy prohibition on the wine house, for abandoning the wine cup, I should break a pledge to mine own heart. My beverage is easy of digestion, and my love is beautiful as a picture. No one hath a love, such a love as I have. I have a cypress in my dwelling, under the shade of whose tall stature I can dispense with the cypress of the grove and the box tree of the meadow. I can boast that the seal of her ruby lip is a potent, as was that of Solomon. In possession of the great name, why should I dread the evil one? After long abstinence, Hafiz is become a notorious reveler. But why grieve, so long as there is in the world an Emin Adin Hassan? Spring has come again, and the joy exciting and vow breaking rose, and the delight of gazing on the cheek of the rose, tear up the root of sorrow from thy heart. The soft east wind has arrived, the rosebud in its passion hath burst forth and torn its own garment. Learn, O oh my heart, the way of sincerity from the clear water. In uprightness seek freedom from the cypress of the meadow. The bride of the rosebud, with her jewels and sweet smile, hath stolen away with her black eye my heart and my religion. The warbling of the enamored nightingale and the piping of the bird at the thousand notes come to enjoy the meeting with the rose from her house of mourning, i.e. her pond. See how the gentle breeze hath entwined with his hand the ringlets of the rose. Look how the plaited locks of the hyacinth bend over the face of the jessamine. The story of the revolving sphere seek to learn from the cup, O Hyphes, as the voice of the minstrel and the judgment of the wise advise thee. The bird of my heart is a sacred bird whose nest is the throne of God. Seek of its cage of the body it is satiated with the things of the world. If once the bird of the spirit winketh its flight from this pit of mire, it findeth its resting place once more only at the door of that palace. And when the bird of my heart flieth upward, its place in the sitter tree. For know that our falcon reposeth only on the pinnacle of the throne. The shadow of good fortune falleth upon the world, whenever our bird spreadeth its pinions and feathers over the earth. In both worlds, its station is only in the loftiest sphere. Its body is from the quarry, but its soul is confined to no dwelling. Only the highest heaven is the secret bower of our bird. Its drinking place is in the rose arbors of the garden of paradise. O oh, Hafiz, thou perplexed it one, when thou breathest a word about unity, Inscribe unity with thy reed on the page of man and spirit. If at the voice of the turtle dove and the nightingale, thou wilt not quaff wine, how can I cure thee, save by the last remedy, burning? When the rose hath cast her veil, and the bird is reciting his who, who, put not the cup from thy hand, what meaneth thine, O, oh, O? Oh. Whilst the water of life is in thy hand, Die not a thirst. Water giveth life to all things. Lay up treasures for thyself from the hues and odors of springtide. Will follow quickly on its heels the autumn and the winter. Fate bestoweth no gift, which it taketh not back. Ask not aught of sordid humanity. The trifle it bestoweth is a nothing. The grandeur of sovereignty and power, how should it be stable? 
of the throne of Jim and the diadem of Kai. What is left save a fable? Whoso heapeth up riches to be the heritage of the mean is an infidel. So say the minstrel and the cupbearer. Such is the decree of the symbol and the fife. It is written on the portico of the mansion of paradise. Woe to him who hath purchased the smiles of the world. Generosity is departed. I fold up my words. Where is the wine that I may give may the soul of Hatim Kai dwell in bliss forever? The miser will never breathe the fragrance of heaven. Come, Hafiz, take the cup and practice liberality, and I will be thy surety. Translation by S. Robinson Three Gazals or Odes From the Garden of Union with Thee Even the gardens of Rizvan, Paradise, gained luster of joy From the torment of separation from Thee Even hell's flame hath torment In the beauty of Thy cheek and stature Shelter hath taken Paradise and the Tuba tree For them it the shelter is good and a good place of returning from this world. All night, even as my eye seeth, so the stream of paradise seeth in sleep the image of thy intoxicated eye of mercy. In every season, spring giveth description of thy beauty. In every book, paradise maketh mention of thy grace. This heart consumed, and my soul attained not to the heart's desire, if it had attained to its desire, it would not have poured forth blood of grief. Oh, many the salt rites of thy lip and mouth, which they have against rent livers and roast hearts. Think not that in thy circle only lovers are intoxicated with love for thee. Of the state of Sahids, distraught with love, no news hath thou. By the circle of thy ruddy lip in thy face resplendent as the sun, I knew that the jewel luster of the ruby was produced by the sun, world illuminating. Open the veil. This modesty, how long wilt thou practice? With this veil, what hast thou bound save modesty? The rose beheld thy face and fell into the fire of love, perceived thy fragrance, and through shame became soft and fragrant like rose water. In love for thy face, Hafiz is immersed in the sea of calamity. Behold, he dieth. Come once, help. Hafiz, that love should pass in folly, permit not. Strive and understand the value of dear life. When the rose is in the bosom, wine in the hand, and the beloved to my desire, on such a day the world's sultan is my slave. Say, into this assembly bring ye no candle for tonight. In our assembly the moon of the friend's face is full. In our order of profligates the wine cup is lawful. But, O Cyprus, rose of body, without thy face, presence, unlawful. In our assembly of lovers mix not itter perfume. For our soul every moment receiveth perfume from the fragrance of the tip of thy tress. My ear is all intent on the voice of the reed and the melody of the harp, the instruction of the murshid. My eye is all intent on thy ruby lip and on the circulation of the cup, the manifestations of glories of God in the night season. Say ye not of the sweetness of candy and sugar, the delights of the world, for my desire is for thy sweet lip, the sweet dream of divine grace, the source of endless delight. From the time when the treasure of grief for thee was dweller in my ruined heart, the corner of the tavern is ever my abode. Of shame, why speakest thou? For from shame is my name, renown. Of name, renown, why actest thou? For from name, renown, is my shame. Wine drinker, distraught of head, profligate and glance player, I am. In this city, who is that one who is not like this? To the Matushib, utter not my crime, for he also is ever like me in desire of the drinkers of wine. Hafiz, sit not a moment without wine, and the beloved, tis the season of the rose and of the jessamine, 
and of the Inn of Siam. Without the beloved's face, the rose is not pleasant. Without wine, spring is not pleasant. The border of the sward and the air of the garden without the beloved of tulip cheek is not pleasant. With the beloved, sugar of lip, rose of body, to be without kiss and embrace is not pleasant. The dancing of the cypress and the rapture of the rose without the song of the hussar is not pleasant. Every picture that reason's hand depicteth save the picture of the living beauteous idol, is not pleasant. The garden and the rose and wine, all is pleasant, but without the beloved society, is not pleasant. A fees, the soul is but a despicable coin, but scattering on the true beloved it, is not pleasant. That friend by whom I housed the happy dwelling of the priory, was, head to foot, free from defect, a parf was acceptable to all the wise of mine is that moon for his with beauty of manner the way of one endowed with vision was my heart said in hope of her in this city i will sojourn helpless i knew not that its friend a traveler was out from my grasp a malignant star plucked her yes what can i do the calamity of the revolution of the moon, it was. Not only from my heart's mystery fell the screen, since the sky time was, screen rending its habit, was. Sweet was the merge of the water, and the rose and the verdure, but, alas, that moving treasure a wayfarer, was. Happy were those times which passed with the friend, all without result and without knowledge, the rest was. The bulbul, the true lover, slew himself through jealousy of this, that to the rose the true beloved, at morning time, the last breath of life with the morning breeze, the angel of death, splendor of heavenly messages, was. O heart, establish an excuse, for thou art a beggar, and here, in the kingdom of beauty, the head of a crowned one, was. Every treasure of happiness that God gave to Hafiz, from the auspiciousness of the evening prayer and of the morning supplication, was. Translations of Lieutenant Colonel H. Wilberforce Clark. Three gazelles or odes. O cupbearer, bring the joy of youth, bring cup after cup of red wine, Bring medicine for the disease of love. Bring wine, which is the balm of old and young. Do not grieve for the revolution of time, that it wheel thus and not thus. Touch the lute in peace. Wisdom is very wearisome. Bring for its neck the noose of wine. When the rose goes, say, go gladly and drink wine, red like the rose. If the moan of the turtle does not remain, what matter? Bring music in the jug of wine. The sun is wine and the moon the cup. Pour the sun into the moon. To drink wine is either good or bad. Drink, if it be bad or if it be good. Her face cannot be seen except in a dream. Bring, then, the medicine of sleep. Give cup after cup to Hafiz. Pour, whether it be sin or sanctity. The east wind at the dawn of day brought a perfume from the tresses of my beloved, which immediately cast my foolish heart into fresh agitation. I imagined that I had uprooted the flower from the garden of my heart, for every blossom which sprang up from its suffering bore only the fruits of pain. From fear of the attacks of her love, I set my heart free with bloody strife. My heart dropped gouts of blood, which marked my footsteps. I beheld from her terrors how the glory of the moon veiled itself in confusion before the face of that dazzling sun. At the voice of the singer and the cupbearer, I go to the door in and out of season, for the messenger cometh with trouble from a weary road. Any gift of my beloved I take as a courteous and kind, whether it be Mohammedan, Christian, or Jewish. Heaven protect her eyebrows from harm, for though they brought me to despair, 
yet with a gracious greeting they have given consolation to the sick heart. Joy to the time and the hour when I freed myself from the snare of her braided tresses and gained a victory which even my foe admitted. From envy of the tresses of my beloved, the breeze lavished all the musk which she had carried from Tartary. I was amazed when I discovered last night cup and jug beside Hafiz, but I said no word, for used them in Sufi manner. Yesterday morning I chanced to drink a cup or two, from the lip of the cupbearer wine had fallen into my heart. From the joy of intoxication I was longing to call back the beloved of my youth, but divorce had befallen. I dreamed that I might kiss those divine eyes. I had lost strength and patience on account of her arched eyebrow. O oh, Saki, give the cup frequently, because in the journey on the path, where is the lover who has not fallen into hypocrisy? O oh, interpreter of dreams, give good tidings, because last night the sun seemed to be my ally in the joy of the morning sleep. At the hour when Hafiz was writing this troubled verse, the bird of his heart had fallen into the snare of love. Translations of Justin Huntley McCarthy End of section 14